Thank you, sir, everyone. We'll have the mayor call the meeting to order. Hey everyone, welcome to tonight's council meeting of Tuesday, June the 1st, 2021. And as we usually do, we start our meeting off with the singing of O Canada. And I'd like to first read the bio of our singer for tonight and then ask you if you'd like to stand for the singing of O Canada. Lila Sharp. Lila is 10 years old. She goes to Prince Philip and is in French immersion. She's also a member of the Stan Stanford United Choir, and her hobbies include dancing and, of course, singing. So, folks, if you would join me to stand and welcome Lila to the video recorded stage as she will sing O Canada. Lila, thank you very much. That was well done. And uh, in case you're watching in with your family on behalf of City Council and all the residents of Niagara Falls, we want to say you did a great job, especially it takes a lot of courage to, to sing. And when you're 10, I know it's not easy. So on behalf of the city, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. How's that for your French immersion? Not so good? All right, we'll move along. Okay, Council, uh, we are looking for an adoption of the Council Minutes from the May 11th meeting. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Thompson. If we don't have any disclosures, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Now we're looking for- Yeah, your worship. Yes. Your worship. I wanted to talk, oh. and I know Councillor Thompson wanted to talk as well, but he's muted, so maybe I'll let him go first. <laughs> he just has to unmute. His lips are moving. Okay, Sean's going to go in and help him. Oh, hang on, Wayne. Uh, Sean's going to come in there and unmute you. Just don't throw the computer again. See, he'll be right there. I wasn't there. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you fine, Wayne. Okay, at the last meeting, um, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo uh, was speaking about affordable housing and uh, the city should be taking uh, aggressive uh, movement to handle this. And uh, I listened to him for a long time and uh, Certainly, he has that interest, and I made a motion that uh, he be the chairman of the committee and uh, the city uh, put up this committee. So um, I was it wasn't in the minutes. Could I have that um, also included in the minutes? Uh, Victor, maybe you could make some comments about 
you're, uh, and you have four people who have said they want to be on the committee now. Go ahead. Uh, Councilor Peter uh, Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, th there was a lot of discussion that really wasn't included in the minutes. I thought council had uh, made the motion and approved the motion to, to have a committee uh, that was going to uh, head up a affordable housing. Um, and I was, very, uh, I was very pleased to be named as the head of that committee. Um, the other thing, Your Worship, is I, I know that I've had interest from, from other people who have told me that, that they would like to be part of the committee. Part of the discussion that, that uh, that 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 happened was just simply that that I was the chairman, um, but I just wanted to bring it to the council floor now to see whether or not you know council would consider having other people on that committee. Um, I know Councilor Campbell, uh, who's who's who expressed an interest in me. Councilor Cario expressed an interest in me, and and also it'd be nice to have the mayor there. Um, Your Worship, we have a real opportunity with. Uh, um, with the property that I brought forward. And at some point I would really like to, you know, be able to speak publicly about this. I wanted council to, to kind of uh, identify the fact that there was going to be an affordable housing committee first uh, before I started to talk about it. So maybe once that vote is taken, then I can, uh, you know, sort of disclose well, what my ideas would be around that. But uh, I just wanted the minutes to reflect that, that that was the motion was to, um, was to appoint myself as as the head of the affordable housing committee your worship so um that was the motion and it was passed absolutely okay. yeah and i appreciate the support of council on that your worship i just want to check with the clerk mr clerk did we not uh, capture that in uh, in the minutes that uh, formation of that committee uh through you, Your Worship, it looks like that was missed, but that's one of the reasons why we do this adoption of minutes. Uh, so if uh, everyone's in agreement, we could certainly add that. Okay, I saw we had some hands up. We've got Councillor Lococo and Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought that we were going to be doing all of council, not just a committee. So that's why I did not express interest to Councillor Peter Angelo. I I thought it was all of council. So I would like to be on the committee as part of council. Okay, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And we had a fulsome discussion in camera about that. And the motion that was moved was it was a committee of council with Councillor Peter Angelo as chair. Not single councillors. I'm, I'm pretty sure the conversation was very clear. Actually, well, I think I made the motion. Okay, well, it's not reflected in the minutes, so that's why we're well, trying to it is re it is reflected on the tape. So before you move these minutes, maybe we could defer this vote to the clerk listens to it. Well, regardless of what the minutes say, this council makes the decision. So whatever we talked about, we can decide here. So we don't need to look at what was said. I, we can say I have no problem with the, I, in fact, we should all be involved. That's right. Okay. And that was the conversation in camera. Yeah. I have, well, make the motion again that it's the total council. I'll move that. I'll, I'll repeat the motion made downstairs that the whole council be well, part of this second. committee. We already have a motion on the table right now. Well, so we, your motion we on the, you're saying the motion on the table reflects the conversation downstairs and it does not. No, that's not what I said. I never said that. Those are your Okay, words. so then I'm I'm telling you, let me remind you then, that was not the conversation that was had. The okay. conversation was it be the entire council with Councillor Peter Angelo as the chair. And that was voted and passed. Okay. So I went to the clerk. We don't have anything reflected in the minutes. So now Councillor Thompson and Peter Angelo made a motion. So now we're having discussion to that motion. So you're, I understand what you're suggesting, you and Council the Coco. So we're having a discussion so we can figure out what direction we're going to go. I think the part that we all agree on is Councillor Peter Angel is going to chair this. He's going to be the head of this, uh, this direction. And then uh, the debate is whether it's a committee or all of councils, what I'm hearing right now. Oh, Mr. Mayor, can I just tell you again <laughs> that Councillor Peter Angelo despite the conversation we had downstairs, which was a lengthy conversation, 
just picked out four men out of this council and refuted everything that happened downstairs. Well, there was a reason. There was a reason I made the motion downstairs. We all expressed interest, and now the motion's being changed up here. So, if one of the two movers could amend it, that it be the entire council with Councillor Peter Angelo as chair, I'm a hundred percent behind that. I have no problem with that either. Hey, I've got the uh, Councillor Peter Angelo's got the floor. Well, Your Worship, no one's trying to change a motion. The only thing that I said was that. I've had an expression of interest from other people, that's all. And I also did say in my comments that I understand the decision was made that it be a committee of all the council. I mean, I fully understand that, Your Worship, but I have that expression from other people. I just want to know, Your Worship, what my role on this is, because the motion uh, of, that's in the minutes right now is that it gets sent back to staff, which really doesn't give me a role. And, and, and that's not what I thought the discussion was around. So um, I mean, the if motion. someone wants to clarify that, that would be great, Your Worship. Okay, the I made Thank the you. motion for uh, Councillor Peter Angelo to be the chair, period. And it was passed by council. So, yeah. so that, that's, that's what it. I thought. Yes. That's what I thought. Well, I so so what does... About, so what does debate. that mean? as a role of chair. Exactly, that's what I'm asking. I right? was so assuming, is, okay, I was folks, assuming you would be bringing back- The clerk speak now. So Mr. Clerk, could you please weigh in and help us uh, sort through this? So just to backtrack a little bit and give the rest of the people that are listening to this uh, at home or online, uh, we're talking about a ratification of an in-camera discussion uh, that was brought forward in the open session at our last council meeting. And the section that we're talking about specifically is where the minutes currently for the open meeting uh, state that a direction be given to staff to report back on options to repurpose the lands owned by the city along the hydro corridor from Taylor Road through to Charnwood Avenue. And I believe when that report comes back from staff, we will reflect the discussion that was talked about in camera where Councillor Peter Angelo uh, was discussed to be the chair of that and that all of council uh, would be part of that committee. In fact, I could go a step further to just say, you know, um, we may have put some overkill on this because if it's all of council, it'll just be part of the regular agenda. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be a separate committee that meets at a different time in a different place. Uh, but we can certainly reflect all of that in, in the report that comes back to council. And it's at that point that uh, further discussion could take place Unless, of course, the council wants to have that discussion now. Sorry, Councilor Peter Anderson. Yeah, Your Worship, and that's why I kind of wanted to clarify the minutes because I'm really unclear right now as to what my role is. Um, I mean, am I supposed to be making suggestions to staff uh, as the chair? And do I? leave it with staff and simply chair the meeting when it comes back. That really wasn't my intention. Um, you know, my intention was to, uh, you know, approach other levels of government, other agencies, as I talked about, uh, you know, to council uh, to kind of lead this through the process. So, um, you know, the motion really was simply uh, that the way that it was recorded in the minutes was simply to pass it back to staff. And that's really wasn't, and, and that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for more of a working committee, something that would uh, help to bring this to fruition. So, um, I mean, if I can just be, I guess, given some clear direction, Your Worship, then I'm happy to go off and do it. Um, but I want that direction of council. Okay, I, and just before we go, because I've got Councillor Inoni and Thompson that want to speak. So Councillor Pierangelo, since this is your idea, you found this idea, this land and this concept, what's your thoughts on what you'd like to see happen? Why don't we start like that? Because obviously staff are going to help you. Obviously, council is going to be a part of making any decisions of any expenditures. So that goes without saying. How do you want to get to that stage? How do you see it? You working with staff at this point and bringing recommendations back to council of, of the whole, uh, how, how do you see this? 
I'll do whatever council wants, to be honest with you, Your Worship. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to be able to have the ability to try to bring it to fruition. As I talked to council about at our last meeting, I mean, I believe it's a, it's a real great opportunity to uh, make an impact in our affordable housing. And, you know, not just, um, I mean, affordable housing has a lot of different facets to it. There's, you know, there's subsidized housing and then there's the ability to be able to afford your own home. And with the opportunity that's in front of us, um, the one that I brought forward, I, I, I think we have the ability to make a real impact in both of those areas. So, I mean, I'd like to be a part of that coming to fruition. That's what I asked council for. Um, and that's what I thought council directed to happen, but I didn't see it that reflected in the minutes. That's the only thing. So, I mean, uh, like, and, and that's why I, 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 I said that I was approached by other people because they read the minutes as well. And they recognize that the minutes don't really talk about a working committee. So, I mean, if I'm just simply passing this back to staff every time and then staff are coming back with recommendations and all I'm doing is chairing a meeting, I really don't have any input. And that's really not the way that it should be working. I mean, uh, I'd like to be able to have the ability to try to take this through the process, like I said, and implement the best thing that we can for affordable housing. So just a I, suggestion, do you have a suggestion? Why don't you just make the motion the way you want to see it? Beck? Like, like, honestly, just say the way you want it and, and um, you're going to get support of council. We like what you're trying to do. It's a great idea. I got you, Wayne. I'm just trying to let Vic just, just say it. Say it. Yeah, I, I, he's the chairman, and whatever he wants to do to uh, bring uh, opportunities uh, and to the committee, I, well, what's the matter with that? I, I, I think you worship any decisions that are going to be made are going to be made by the council as a whole. Oh, but, sure. but, and, but any ideas to get to those decisions, I was hoping to be a uh, part of. Um, in whether it's, you know, being able to set up meetings and discussions with, like I said, other levels of governments, different nonprofit agencies, uh, even, you know, uh, private people who might be interested. Um, the goal is all around, you know, uh, making a very significant dent in, in the affordable housing crisis that, uh, that pretty much is in every municipality. So, um, it's a great idea. It, 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 it's it's going to be of great benefit to Niagara Falls. So um, I just want to be able to be part of that uh, and bring my ideas forward. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Iononi and then Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Lococo, Councillor Campbell, and myself have been working to do that with our different committees for years, Councillor Peter Angelo. Um, we are great resources. All those committees that you're talking about, those charities, those agencies, we have connections and have already made relationships with them. Um, from running shelters to establishing shelters to working with, with um, the street support workers, everything, we've done all that. Um, so it, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine why you would not include all of us into that. Um, any committee that I've chaired for council, I know the committee Councillor Campbell's chairing, uh, Councillor Lococo and Campbell are both chairing diversity and or racism, if, if the two separate committees, you have a terms of reference, you have an agenda, you have um, a, a point of reference where a staff liaison. We did that with the transit, bringing improved transit to the city. Um, that's how the homeless committee works. That's how the diversity committee works. That's how I saw this working with all of us having a role. I understand you want to create, do those meetings, but Every single one of us wants something um, to happen with affordable housing. And some of us have been actually working on that for years. So I'm hoping that your motion will include that it be a working committee of council because we have a lot of information we can impart to you rather than being you know, pushed to the side and then following as an afterthought. So, I mean, create a committee, create the terms of reference, your agenda, the outlook, everything that you want done and let us work with you. Councilor Peter Angel, you want to comment on that? Yeah, Your Worship, I already said, I don't mind it being a committee of council. There was nothing identified in the minutes. That's all. Um, so, I mean, I want the ability to work through uh, some of my ideas and be able to bring them to council. That's 
that's what I want to be able to do. So if council wants to grant that, then then that's great. I'll uh, I'll I'll take the ball and roll with it. Okay, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I think uh, go ahead and do what you have to do and report to council. Uh, the council has to be involved anyway. So what's the problem? Go ahead and do it. You're the chairman. Council's going to end up making the decisions. So, Pardon me? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, so do what? we need a formal motion uh, appointing Councillor Peter Angelo as the as chair of this uh, affordable housing initiative? Uh, I, I just want to point out, uh, Your Worship, that the Everything that was just discussed in the last few minutes was captured in the minutes of the in-camera meeting. It just wasn't read out that specifically in the ratification of in-camera. And, you know, my apologies if, if you were looking for that uh, explicit detail. Typically, the ratification of in-camera doesn't go to that length. Uh, but in this case, you know, maybe now is the time where we just make that reflection uh, where we can update and amend our minutes of the last meeting under ratification of in-camera to uh, go ahead and appoint uh, or make sure we reflect that Councillor Peter Angel is going to be appointed as the chair of this committee and that it will be a committee of all of council. I'll so move again. Back in. Okay, That's motion fine, by Councillor Thompson. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Iannone, by Councillor Peter Angelo be appointed the committee uh, chair of this uh, of this movement, this direction, this initiative, whatever word you pick the word, Council Peter Angelo, whatever one you want. Is that good? You're comfortable with that? Is that covered? Yeah, and I thank Council for the support, Your Worship. Okay, great. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Okay, great. Got that sorted out. Mr. Mayor, can I just ask a question on that? Yes. So, Councillor Peter Angelo, as chair of that with all of us, um, are you going to come up with the terms of reference and and can we send you ideas on that, having the experience we've had working with all of the local agencies, both provincial and regional? Your Worship, I'll take any ideas that anybody has, to be honest with you. Um, I really didn't want this to be a one-man show. Uh, I mean, I was happy to include all of council. Uh, the only thing I said is that, you know, I had other people say things to me because there was really nothing in the minutes that reflected that that's what was going to happen. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, creating a terms of reference, I don't know that, that, that that's really the way that, that this would go. I, I would think that a terms of reference would be something more for a committee where you're appointing people from the public. So I guess what I would compare it to is uh, being the chair of finance, there's really no terms of reference for that. Um, yet part of my duties would be to, you know, meet with staff, uh, on a semi-regular basis anyway, and, you know, provide them with whatever input I can into the budget. Um, there's no terms of reference for finance. So I don't know whether or not, uh, there would be terms of reference for this, but really that's up to council, your worship. It's not up to me. Okay. So we've got the. We've got the, the motion, that's done. Did we pass the uh, the minutes? Uh, so do we have to do that now, I guess, with that update? Yep, okay. Motion to approve the minutes. Again, uh, Councillor Thompson and Dabrowski, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Okay, minutes put to bed, perfect. Um, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Do you have any disclosures? Okay, oh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, I, I just have a conflict on um, item 8.3, the gateway feature policy. Um, I have a family member just purchased a, a place right on one of these on the map there, so. Okay, that's noted by the clerk. Anyone else have a disclosure? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to mayor's reports and announcements. First off, we start off with obituaries. Um, Antonio Vallejo passed away, the father of Sam Vallejo, of our directing, uh, director of building, our chief building official. Josephine Morrison, the mother of Jim Morrison, retired city employee. And Brian Sinclair, father-in-law of Dean Irafita, former city clerk. 
the residential schools tragedy, tragedy I don't need to uh, mention anyone, we're all well aware of it. Our flags have been at half staff at city facilities and the falls were illuminated orange May 30th and 31st to acknowledge the 215 indigenous children. This is our way, our small way of honoring their lives and their spirits. There was an Italian apology recently. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Prime Minister Trudeau's formal apology to Italian Canadians last week. I hope that all of those who suffered the injustices of the past treatment to Italian Canadians in Canada in the 1940s find peace and a path toward healing. The Prime Minister's apology signified an opportunity to look ahead in hope, fairness, and one we will honour as a day when justice was served. Italian Heritage Month, Club Italia is hosting a community gnocchi night in support of Project Share. Curbside pickup is Wednesday, June the 16th from 4 until 6 p.m. All you have to do is phone Club Italia, 905-374-7388 to order, and you can support Italian heritage. And I can tell you, I try to order at least once a week on Wednesdays and Fridays, and the food is great. The sausage is outstanding, and it's a lot better than having to cook it. Accessibility Week, during Accessibility Week, which is May 30th through June the 4th, we'd like to thank all of our Accessibility Committee for their efforts and ongoing advocacy for accessibility in our community. Pride flag in support of the 2SLGBTQQIA plus community. Today marks the beginning of Pride Month. We raised the rainbow flag at Rosberg Park today and per council's approval at our last meeting, supporting the cause. Many groups throughout Niagara have advocated and are working toward more inclusivity and support. We're pleased to collectively show our support of, again, our 2SLGBTQQIA plus community. We'd like to congratulate Carla Stout, the general manager of transit. She's just recently been elected to the OPTA, which is the Ontario Public Transportation Association Board of Directors. Congratulations, Carla, we're proud of you. June Movement, that's Recreation and Parks Month. Recreation and Parks Month is June. You can participate in June Movement all month long. That's a community challenge across Ontario organized by the Niagara Falls Recreation Committee. You get points for getting outside and getting active. You can use the free Goose Chase app, download it, and track your participation. If you want any details, just go on the city's website at niagarafalls.ca. City staff were very proud of them donating to the soup kitchen. This year, it's the second year, they had annual sales of ferns and hydrangeas. Through their efforts, they were able to raise $400, and the staff brought that over to the soup kitchen. So Great staff we have here at the city. We're very proud of you and thank you for all of you making your purchase for your beautiful ferns and hydrangeas. Now I'd like to talk about Ken Todd uh, for a moment. So Ken Todd has been at the city of Niagara Falls for more than the last 10 years. And tonight is his official last council meeting. So I'm not really sure where to start. It's a very long and windy story. And we all know the kind of person that Ken was and is. And first off, I want to say he's a, commit, a community first person. He's an active volunteer. One of the first times I met Ken, even before he started, he was working, uh, volunteering for Project Share with his wife, Judy. We're very proud of Ken as our leader at the city for the last, I think, close to 12 years, actually. He was heavily involved in Project Share and the soup kitchen. And that's a guy that just bleeds Niagara Falls, very engaged. His career highlights, he was instrumental, he was supportive, and he helped to implement so many things in this city that's changed the future forever, including helping to renegotiate the OLG hosting agreement for having casinos, where we went from getting $3 million a year to more than $25 million a year. No small feat and a lot of heavy lifting to get that done. Fireman's Park, we were able to take over ownership of more than 100 acres, including Carolinian forests, that will now forever be preserved in the city's control, along with our partnership of the SCVFA. 
Playgrounds, more than 42 around the city and our trails have been upgraded already so far. So that increases the quality of life for all the residents in Niagara Falls. Transportation, he's been heavily involved in the GO train, intermunicipal transit, our airport, and of course, building of the new transit facility on Heartland Forest Boulevard. Ken's always been actively engaged in improving customer service at City Hall and also bringing City Hall to the people by opening up an outlet at the McVean Center so that people can access City Hall from the southwest end of the city, including on weekends. Ken was involved and spearheaded the renovation of City Hall, and that was our commitment to staying downtown. As well, the acquisition of the old police building, which is now the Wayne Thompson building, and having the two buildings look alike so it has a campus feel to it as Niagara Falls City Hall has made the commitment to stay in its downtown. With the downtown, he's been actively engaged with his team to create and support a CIP, a community, Impro community improvement program to incentivize development in the downtown, to bring a university so we'd have post-secondary in our downtown to help encourage and retain youth, to help bring the GO train downtown. And we've been told in the past it would never happen. Not only did it happen, it's been wildly successful. Chain, doing the zoning amendment for downtown so that we can save years of effort for development opportunities as we develop our downtown. And you can see already they've started building the roundabout at the corner of Bridge and Victoria. And of course, Ken's help prepares for the future. We've got a billion dollar Niagara South Hospital that's gonna be built. We expect to break ground next year. And that included getting land, lots of planning, lots of lobbying. We've got a new wastewater treatment plant that's gonna be built in Niagara Falls, $325 million, so that we don't have to worry about leaky basements. We don't have to be concerned about not having the capacity. The new farmer's market and culture hub, and of course, planning for a new service center. And of course, Ken admits he didn't do anything alone. He did it along with council, along with the initiatives of the public, and of course, our city staff. But Ken was the one that would always run with the ball to make sure things got done, and he took the direction. And Ken's leadership style, well, it's quiet leadership. He encourages others to bring their skills forward and to lead. And the, the good thing is, as Ken leaves, he leaves us with strong bench strength. We've got a lot of talented people here that Ken's mentored, not just in the city, but other CAOs around the region and beyond. And we've all learned a lot working with Ken. He's a real talent, really grateful. And the nice thing is legacy will live on with all the staff that we have here at the city right now. So I'd like to now draw your attention to the screen. And our clerk is going to put up on the screen, uh, or our IT department is going to put up on the screen a gift that council has brought forward for our CAO, Ken Todd. This is a handcrafted wooden map. And as you can see, it's Southern Ontario, Western New York, specifically the Niagara area in the center, sandwiched between Lake Ontario to the top and Lake Erie to the south. And this highlights the places in Niagara where Ken has lived and served and I don't know, you can't quite see it on this map, but you'll see it when he's in person. There's a little tiny dot for the city of Niagara Falls, for the town of Thorold, and the city of St. Catharines to remind Ken of the places that he's worked. So we're proud to present this to Ken on behalf of council, on behalf of a grateful city of Niagara Falls for his more than 40 years of dedication to community and to municipal services. So. Ken, also, I do want to point out that the Niagara Falls Illumination Board, in your honor, and you sat on and continue to serve on many boards uh, throughout your years, dedicated an illumination of the falls one night for any colors that you choose on the night that you choose. So um, I'm going to ask Ken now just to say a few words, if he would, uh, to council or maybe to address this, but, but Ken... On behalf of the city, we want to say thank you very much. And of course, Ken, you know, I was joking when I suggested that they give you the time slot of two o'clock in the afternoon to light up the falls, <laughs> for whatever colors you wanted. Of course, you knew I was joking. So, so uh, Ken, uh, I'd like to pass the floor to you and uh, anything that you may want to share with all of your viewers, your fans, your council, and all the city staff that are tuning in right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
You know, when I started uh, 40 years ago, I never thought I would be attending my last council meeting, sitting at home on a Zoom meeting like this. And it's been really, really unusual and different over the last year. And I do miss that connection uh, in the council chamber. So this is a little different, but uh, just bear with me. But I have to say, Mr. Mayor, it's just been a tremendous honor for me to be able to finish out my career uh, in my hometown, uh, a job that I've held for the last 12 years. And, you know, serving the citizens of Niagara Falls has really been uh, a dream of mine. Uh, as a younger kid, it was one of the jobs and one of the things I really wanted to do in my career and to be able to reach that accomplishment and, you know, finish out in your hometown in a job that you dreamed about is uh, really, really an exceptional uh, feeling. I do have to say, though, that when I took the job in Niagara Falls, it was a little bit um, a little bit of pressure because you really wanted to be able to ensure that you didn't fail uh, all the people that helped get you there. And whether it be all of your family, your friends, all of the teachers, coaches, fellow employees that, you know, help you get there. Uh, you know, you don't get there by yourself. Uh, you get there with all of those people uh, behind you and, and helping you. And, you know, it was a little bit of fear of failing. And, uh, you know, I just hope, you know, over the last 12 years, I haven't, uh, haven't let anybody down. Um, eight mayors, uh, 13 councils, 145 councillors. Uh, over those 40 years in three different municipalities. And I have to say, I've, uh, you know, there have been moments, uh, but I can tell you that for the most part, uh, the experiences around those 40 years have been very, very, very rewarding. I can tell you, I still enjoy the work, um, but, you know, I, I just turned 65 recently and 40 years, and I, I really in my sports vernacular, it's really time to hang up the sneakers and, and move on to other parts of, of life. Uh, I do have to say the most enjoyable part, uh, though, of my job the last number of years uh, have been working with all of the wonderful employees. And, and I've been blessed with having great employees in all three municipalities that I've, I've dealt with, uh, whether it be Thorold, St. Catharines, and, and now finishing it off in, in Niagara Falls. And I know that I could not have possibly done this job uh, without them. They really, the employees, the groups that we work with every day are really the people, uh, the wonderful dedicated staff, the people that make the city of Niagara Falls, uh, a great community to live in. And I'd really like to thank council. Uh, I, I just wanna tell council too, that over the last couple of weeks, uh, we have been meeting with your new CAO, Jason Burgess, uh, with our senior management team. And we have been conducting transition meetings so that you know the transition for council and Jason is going to be very smooth and seamless. Uh, just wanted to assure council that those meetings are going very well and we will have that transition uh, wrapped up in the next week or so. Mr. Mayor, I, I can't uh, miss the opportunity to thank you personally uh, for all of your support. You'll be my last mayor uh, that I've served with. Um, I can't tell you how enjoyable. Uh, it's really enjoyable when you can build uh, not only a, a very strong working relationship, but um, a friendship. Uh, I don't think that happens very often in the municipal CAO uh, political world. Uh, and I got to tell you, that's something I'll, I'll cherish forever. So thank you for that. Um, to all the staff, um, it's really you that have made this a great community. I, I really can't thank you enough. All I would ask you that you make uh, Mr. Burgess, uh, when he arrives, you just show him the same respect and dedication that you've shown me over the years. And uh, you're going to have a great relationship and continue to do great things for the city of Niagara Falls. So, Mr. Mayor, 
uh, on behalf of myself, Judy, uh, all my family, uh, thank you so much uh, to you and council. Uh, you've really given me the opportunity to uh, be your CAO for the last 12 years and really fulfill a, a lifetime dream of mine. So, Mr. Mayor, to you and council, thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful gift uh, that you've given me. Uh, it'll hang proudly in our home uh, and be a reminder of the great 40 years of municipal work that I've had. So thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much, Ken. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely get that to you. And I know you've got a lot of things going on. You've got your son got it getting married in, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, you, you've got so many things going on and, uh, I, we're going to continue this on. So, uh, this isn't goodbye for sure. This is just flipping the page. So, uh, so on behalf of council, I just want to say thanks again, Ken. Uh, we really appreciate what you've done and we appreciate, uh, the friendship and, uh, the city is going to benefit from a lot of the things you did for many, many years to come. Uh, yes. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just chime in for a couple of seconds. I mean, Ken should be very proud of the accomplishments that he's had in the city of Niagara Falls. You know, there's been countless meetings where uh, a question will come up and, you know, all the heads will kind of turn towards Ken to give the answer because, you know, I think a lot of us look at him as though he's the sage, he's the wisdom, right? Which he is. And uh, he does it in a style where, you know, he's very humble. And he's very diplomatic, yet at the same time, he's a very strong leader. So um, to Ken, I just want to say, you know, that we really do appreciate your service and you certainly will be missed. But in the same breath, Ken, we really wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you very much, Councillor Peter Angelo. So, yes, Councillor Cario. Just one quick one, Your Worship, is um, Ken is one of the guys that you could always count on when you needed to answer a question that wasn't looking at his shoes. <laughs> Good point. And he's got a still trap of a memory. He never forgets anything. All right, folks. Well, listen, I, this is uh, we'll, we'll, we don't want to get this too sappy here. Uh, and I know there's going to be a lot of things planned for Ken over the next little while. Uh, a lot of people wanting to say their goodbyes and reach out to him and whatnot. So, and, and, and I should say, we were going to do uh, more of a formal event, but Ken, as Ken, you know, in Ken style, he uh, likes things a little low key. And so we we're going to keep it low key and he'll have a, a little memory to put on his wall uh, that he can uh, always remember us by. So Ken, thank you very much. So having yeah, said let's, that, let's ahead. move on, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say, you. Uh, you still have a uh, full meeting to get through, so you may not like us later. So uh, let's get going. Yeah. <laughs> So Tuesday, June 22nd, will be the, the next council meeting. And Ken is happy to say he won't be here. So uh, moving on to item 6.1, I do have one more uh, brief presentation. Um, this is a presentation uh, to Bill Ashcroft. Now, is Bill present on the Zoom? Um, can we tell uh, IT, is he there? Okay, so John Greer is there. So hopefully Bill is with John Greer. John, are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, you're still muted, John. I don't know if you can hear us. Sorry about that, Your Worship. Yes, Bill is actually here with me. We're at oh, the office. Fant fantastic. Okay, do you guys have a camera too or no? Or is it just audio? Yeah, our, well, our camera just, yeah, we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty, the same as you guys did at the beginning. So we do have a camera, so just give me one quick second here. Sure. Well, we built... Well, there we go. There we there are. go. <laughs> Great. We can see, guys. All right, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. So, so to council, what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to take a moment to recognize something really special. So, Bill, can you just give us a wave so we can see where, where you are so everyone knows? There's, there's Bill. So I want to take this moment to recognize a heroic action that Bill, one of our SPCA officers in Niagara Falls, did recently. So during a tragic car accident on the parkway 
in May. Bill stepped in. He was on his way to a call. He was leaving the shelter and he saw a car in flames. He acted quickly and he called the fire department, then heroically intervened to pull the passenger to safety. While the driver of the vehicle did not survive, thanks to Bill's bravery and decisive selfless action, the passenger was saved. Bill Ashcroft is a longtime dedicated SPCA employee. His service to his community will not soon be forgotten. And on behalf of City Council, Bill, I'd like to present to you a certificate and uh, you can kind of see this and you're gonna get this and I'll just read it to you. On behalf of the members of City Council, it gives me great pleasure to recognize you, Bill Ashcroft, for your active bravery by taking action to save a car passenger's life. You are a hero. A true hero isn't measured by the size of his strength, but by the strength of his heart. That's a quote from Hercules. Signed by yours truly, Bill, and also, Bill, on behalf of the City of Niagara Falls and the City Council, have a uh, a little token of our appreciation, and uh, this pales in comparison to the magnitude of what you did by saving this individual's life and being so quick to respond. And I'd like to say on behalf of Niagara Falls, thank you for what you did, and it's people like you that Niagara Falls makes Niagara Falls the great place that it is. And maybe I just give you an opportunity. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, and from all of council, we give you a hand, and. I would ask you, Bill, is there any comment you want to share with council? Is there anything you want to tell us maybe about, about that day or, or anything? It's up to you, whatever you'd like to share with us. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for the acknowledgement. Um, the incident itself is, uh, has been a difficult thing for me to deal with mentally. Um, having a hard time getting over it. Um, so I had trouble talking about what, what occurred there. Um, but I do appreciate the acknowledgement and it does help. Well, Bill, I can say on behalf of the city, that's a awesome thing that you did. And nobody can really truly appreciate psychologically, psychologically what goes through someone's head at the moment. And then afterwards, as you continue to re relive it over and over again. But what we know is you did all that you could do and you put yourself in harm's way to help somebody else. And obviously working at SPCA, that's the kind of person you are that you like to help and you like to give. So I just want to say this is a very small token of our appreciation for what you did, but I, we're really grateful it was brought to our attention. And we're grateful that we get to work together with you and you're in our community. So thank you very much. Appreciate uh, uh, John uh, making this possible that we could sort of see each other face to face and have this opportunity to recognize Bill in front of council, in front of the residents of Niagara Falls. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank council. you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll get this, we'll get these goodies over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council, we're going to go to item 6.2. We have an update from regional councillors. And I understand, I'm not sure which ones that we have all together, but I see councillor, regional councillor Bob Gale. So, Bob, welcome to the council meeting tonight. Are you going solo tonight, or do you have? I'm going council? solo. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, council. I understand you did reach out to the other regional councillors, yep. but uh, it didn't work into their schedules. Yeah, Peter Nicholson sends his regrets. He had another Zoom meeting, and uh, Barb Greenwood had a scheduling uh, problem a problem with this. So I'm going solo, as you as you mentioned. Yep. And first off, if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, I, I want to first of all congratulate Bill Ashcroft. That was a job well done. And Ken Todd, all the best as in, on his retirement. I hope to see him at the soup kitchen, where his wife will put him to good use. I hope. <laughs> Uh, so, I, uh, Mr. Mayor, I have six updates. Uh, I sent this, this to the clerk, and maybe he shared it with councillors. I'm not, I'm not sure on this. I just sent it in the last hour, well, hour and a half ago uh, now, I guess it is. So I'll go these, through these fairly quickly, if you don't mind, if there's any questions or any further information. Now, Mr. Mayor, you were in most of these meetings I was at, so you can critique this or correct me if I make any mistakes, please. It's all yours. It's all yours. So my first one is on the May 20, uh, May 28th report that came out on the NRPS number one division project. In Mar on March 25th, the police moved into the new number one division on Welland Avenue in St. Catharines. 
will be informed by staff in the near future on options for the old 68 Church Street building and the property. Uh, number one division costs, the original contract was 14.8 million with a 3% contingency on top of it. The approved change orders were 270, so it's in budget. Uh, the forecast cost is $15.1 million. Uh, there was $47,000 COVID related costs that were added on to it. That's time loss, site work inefficiencies, and new Ministry of Labor protocols related to COVID. And there's only minor items left to do at that station. Number two, uh, council voted to re regional council voted to reinstate the exchange of damaged green box and recycle containers, which had been eliminated by the region in the 2021 budget. So citizens can contact the region to replace these damaged containers. The region feels a big part uh, as a result of people doing more recycling. Number three. I ask you to please keep a close watch on the Lions Creek Road at Willowdell Road, where the MTO is enhancing, enhancing the QAW cutoff. Carolyn Ryle, Director of Transportation Services at the region, is meeting with stakeholders out there, re there being a medium proposed in the middle of Lions Creek Road, blocking access from westbound Lions Creek to Willowdell Road. I think most of you are aware of this. And she is discussing alternatives, et cetera, and I have a lot of faith in Carolyn, as Mayor Jim has also been involved in this conversation and has discussed it with you. But I fear the decisions by the MTO staff and people not understanding that businesses like Willowdell Golf Course, which has been there for over 60 years, will be hurt considerably and we could have major safety issues if the members and staff there, as well as citizens, are forced to drive to Montrose Road and pull a U-turn or somehow turn around to come back to get into Willowdell or vice versa when you're coming out of Willowdale and you won't be able to go east uh, westbound on it. I've experienced dealing with the MTO bureaucracy at the QEW and Thorlson Road 22 years ago, and it seems the citizens could lose here unless councillors speak up. I'll be watching this, you know I will be, but we should all be watching this carefully and hoping for uh, traffic lights or a roundabout out there. Uh, for these people. I just had another call last night from another property owner out there hoping that we could get on the case. And Mayor Jim, I know you've gone out of your way to meet these people too. So I, I hope that this council will watch what's going on out there because I have, I have trust in the city and trust in the region. Uh, I'm a little bit questionable on what's happened with the MTO in, in the past and in staff out there. So uh, fourth, Councillor Peter Nicholson was going to bring this up. He's asked for more info on the Vision Zero traffic program being instituted on Lundy's Lane between Montrose Road and Kaler. This involves speed checks, cameras, et cetera, in high traffic and density areas. You've seen them throughout the region that goes down to 40 kilometers an hour at some of these sites and they have the traffic radar cameras and that. Carolyn Ryle again said this will be discussed in the next phase of Vision Zero and a report to the municipalities will be provided. So you will be provided before this is instituted but we just wanted you to know because we do have get a number of complaints of that area out there. Fifth, I made a motion to get a report regarding the Niagara and Lake Waste Treatment Plant, re the reasons for the project delays and over budget costs, re lawsuits, et cetera, so we can determine the best practices for the new South Niagara Falls Waste Treatment Plant. This won't delay the construction of the new Niagara Falls plant. I also asked for a list of the consultants for wastewater plants and info on the tenders for these to further understand the cost, et cetera, because this was late opening and uh, cost us a pretty penny. My last update is on our audit report that came out. If you recall in 2020, during a pandemic that has devastated jobs in Niagara region, your regional government increased property taxes by 5.92%. At audit committee, we received the 2020 audited financial statements. Overall, this is what I learned. For our operations, we had negative impacts on our revenue due to the pandemic, naturally. Overall, we saw a decrease in revenue from user charges, development charges, court revenues, and investment income for a total of $28 million. Uh, the, however, we also received $39 million from the provincial government to mitigate these revenue losses due to COVID. And although we saw increased costs in our long-term care, public health and pa paramedic programs for a total of 11 million, we saw reduced operational costs in many of our other departments totaling $61 million. Overall, for operations only, 
the region had a levy surplus of $37.3 million. We also had a surplus in our rate programs of water and sewer charges uh, or services of $4.2 million. For our capital programs, we deferred our capital budget surplus for construction in other years. So what did we do with all this levy surplus of $37.3 million? Well, we deferred some capital uh, budgets. We transferred $6.6 .6 million to fund the committed contribution to the new West Link or to the West Lincoln Hospital. We also transferred $30.6 million to the taxpayer relief reserve at the region. From my perspective, we shouldn't be taxing more than we spend, creating significant multi-million dollar surpluses during a pandemic. With the levy surplus, we should be working with local businesses and creating a strategy on recovering our econ economy and creating jobs. At the last regional council meeting where this was ratified, I asked for information on an economic task force made up of business members from the community on how we can help them in the future to recover from this pandemic's effects and the CAO of the region is supposed to get back to me. Mr. Uh, Mayor, I was gonna say Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, uh, th that's my update for now. I'm certain there's a lot of other things there, but if anybody has any questions. Do we have any uh, questions or comments of council for, uh, for Councillor uh, Gale? Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks your worship. Uh, welcome Councillor Gale. It's always nice uh, that we have someone that brings us an update uh, from the region. Um, I know it's not your first time here. I, I, I don't want to blindside you, but I do want to ask you if you have a comment in regards to uh, the region supporting CIPs. And I'll tell you the reason why I asked. I sit on the Lundy's Lane BIA, and I know that there's um, a CIP that they're really hoping will move is somewhat whether or not they're going to support CIPs moving forward. Uh, they can be a great tool in terms of economic development. Um, but uh, I, 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 I just wanted to actually pick your brain a little bit and see whether or not, um, you know, see what the flavor of supporting CIPs was at the region. Uh, and thank you for that question. I, I support it naturally. Um, my question is always when these come up, the checks and balances to make sure it's not wasted and things like this, the money's going to good causes. I don't know the flavor of the region, or regional councillors on this. I don't know which way they're swaying on it. I was hoping that the, us three councillors would be there because the mayor brought this to my attention a while back. And I said I was in favor of these things again with checks and balances on everything. So, uh, I, I, I would take it, Mr. Mayor, this is coming up in planning at the region of which I'm not on the committee. So it could be a great you. tool, like especially when you're looking to redevelop an area, which is what Lundy's Lane is doing right now. I think there's even there's already some examples there where, uh, you know, an older motel has been taken down, repurposed, whether it's a brand new commercial uh, unit or whether it's uh, some type of residential. So it's a great tool if you're looking at you know, redeveloping a place in your city. And, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I know the Lundy's Lane BIA is very keen on seeing the support of the CIP go forward, not only from the city's perspective, but also from the region. It really doesn't make it worth it if it's only uh, one half of the equation that supports the CIP, but not the other half. So um, hopefully the region can, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, in the end, support all CIPs because they're a great tool in terms of economic development. So um, I appreciate your thoughts and, and, and I thank you for giving your update and, and hope that you can take that back with you. So Vic, I, I thank you for this. If you want, if you haven't already done this, do you want to send a letter to me or an email to me on it and I'll make sure it gets the region so the counselors know in advance with your feelings that you just expressed I can certainly give it to some people on planning, or you, maybe you've already done that. Um, Mayor Diodati, when is this coming up on the agenda at the region, at the next planning? I understand August the 5th is going to be the next, and I think, I'm not sure that, I think that's a planning meeting. And, and yeah, we're going to decide if we're moving forward on CIPs. So obviously in the municipality, and I think all municipalities, as far as I know, uh, very much like CIPs because it allows you to direct development to areas that wouldn't be otherwise. Sometimes it's a brownfield area being redeveloped. Sometimes it's a downtown or a council Peter Angel mentioned Lundy's Lane. They need a little bit of a kickstart, uh, a little bit of a catalyst. And sometimes, you know, it's funny when you do the comparison between 
what they're bringing in in tax revenue today versus after the development, you end up making much more money back uh, and you beautify an area and it's a catalyst for more development. So targeted CIPs identified by the municipalities, I think are wise investments. I've heard some people mistakenly refer to it as corporate welfare, but I can suggest that's probably someone doesn't really understand what's going on. That's not it at all. You get much more back than you allow them to, to receive. You incentivize them to do areas that they wouldn't do otherwise. So I understand August the 5th is when it's coming to the region. Uh, hopefully uh, it's going to see its way clear to continue on the program for targeted areas. And uh, we'll see where it goes. But obviously I know Councillor Gale's on board and this council is very much in favor of it for certain areas, not everywhere, for certain areas that need it. And uh, you also have BIAs involved in this. So they take some ownership in their areas when this happens. I know I've had meetings before with Absolutely. BIAs, Lundy's Lane and that about these things. So uh, however you want to handle this, I, I support it. And I think other councillors should be. There's some new councillors there that don't understand it. And I'm always just checks and balances on these type of things. Make sure we get okay. a return on it. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'd like to thank Councillor Gale. Thank you for joining us. Don't make it too long before you return. <laughs> All the best. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, we're going to move on to 7.2. Um, Mr. Clerk, do I? Um, I'm sorry, 7. Point, yeah, I jumped ahead. Look at that. 7.1. So are we, um, are we using this, Mr. Clerk? No. Okay. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hurlovich if he'd like to introduce his guest. I understand we have Susan McDonald from SGL and maybe introduce the report and what we're about to look at. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, tonight we have Suzanne McDonald from SGL Planning and Design. They were contacted by council to undertake a cannabis growing facility and land use study. Suzanne is here tonight to present the uh, firm's recommendations uh, on the phase two report. And uh, following her presentation uh, and questions, staff do recommend that council receive the presentation from SGL planning and design, adopt the cannabis growing facilities land use review recommendation report and direct the consultants to prepare the amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw and the site plan control bylaw and to be presented at a future public meeting under the Planning Act. So I will turn this over to Suzanne and I know that she has a PowerPoint prepared. Hey, thank you. Welcome to the meeting, Suzanne. Thank you very much. And I'm also wondering if Paul Lowe's of my office can also be added uh, so that he may uh, uh, assist with answering some questions and jump in on the presentation as well, if that's possible. Okay, we're gonna work on that right now. Our IT are working on adding Paul Lowe's. Thank you. I'll get started then. Can I just confirm that uh, everyone can see my screen now? Yeah, we're, we're good to go. We can see it. Thank you. And is Paul in the meeting now? I yep, am. Looks like he's in. Yep, okay, Andrew, good. Well, Thank you. welcome. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just start with a recap of, of our study purpose and what we set out to do. Really from the start of the study, our purpose was to examine opportunities for the city to regulate uh, cannabis activities as permitted under the Cannabis Act. And we were, we were looking to assess and recommend any changes to the official plan or zoning bylaws needed in order to regulate cannabis production as a land use within the city. The scope of our project includes the land uses specifically related to the commercial cultivation and processing of recreational cannabis, as well as medical cannabis. And two things that are outside the scope of our project include the personal growth of cannabis or rec personal growth of recreational cannabis, since up to four plants can be grown within any household, as well as uh, a retail sale of cannabis as a recreational, uh, sorry, the retail sale of recreational cannabis as a standalone use. So for example, we aren't looking at retail sales in a commercial area. 
Uh, this is a three-phase study. As part of phase one, we undertook a lot of background uh, and undertook a lot of background work. And as part of phase two, we formulated a number of policy options for consideration and weighed pros and cons of the different policy options. And then from that, we've come up with recommendations, which I'll be summarizing for you this evening. Uh, and then phase three would be the next step, which includes uh, any implementation of those recommendations, recommendations, such as through an official plan amendment or a zoning bylaw amendment. So some of the previous work that we've done includes a uh, review of the legal framework within Canada, as well as review of different policy documents, such as the PPS, uh, or sorry, or provincial documents, sorry, including the PPS or the Farming and Food Pr Production Protection Act. And I will note that the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks recently released uh, land use compatibility guidelines. These are draft for review and comment, but they are an update to the previous guidelines and they were just recently released uh, within the last month or so um, as a draft. Uh, and they do address cannabis as well as separation distances between sensitive land uses and uh, a large number of uh, industrial facilities. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that we are aware of those and are looking at those as well. Um, some of our other previous work included a review of the Niagara Falls planning tools, including Niagara Falls is uh, official plan and zoning bylaws. We also undertook a best practice review of how other municipalities were addressing uh, cannabis related uses within their documents. As I mentioned earlier, we came up with a number of options for regulating the use, and we also undertook some public engagement as part of the study, uh, including an online survey and an online open so just a little bit of recap of the cannabis industry um, Health Canada is a long term licenses per or research license Suzanne we lost you for the last minute we, we couldn't hear you it was breaking up so I don't know you, we just lost that last minute of what you were okay. saying Oh, my apologies. Let me stop my video. Sometimes that helps. Uh, and should I go back to the previous slide or just start on this slide? Uh, you know what? I couldn't tell because I couldn't hear you. I think you're good. I mean, we only lost maybe 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, well, just kind of to quickly sum up, there's a, there's a, a few different licenses that can be um, uh, sought from Health Canada. And uh, these can be combined as shown on the slide here. Uh, and I'll, I'll just note that you won't see sale in terms of retail sale to the general public on this list here because that's done through the province. So while Health Canada does the licenses for production, it's the province who actually licenses retail sales. And as I mentioned, retail sales isn't really the focus of our study, although uh, I will mention a little bit later on in my presentation, we'll be looking at where retail sales is actually occurring on the same site as production. Oops. Um, and I'll also mention that uh, when we started the study, the focus of our, our work was really about the licensed facilities. So the facilities for which uh, commercial growth um, for, for the purpose of selling the product is, is was the intent. Uh, but as we were working through the study, we, we became aware that um, there were some nuisance potential related to medical growth uh, in the in the instances where someone was growing for their own medical purposes. So separate from the licensing facility, um, an individual is able to uh, register with Health Canada in order to uh, grow uh, um, a pro cannabis product uh, in accordance with a medical prescription. Uh, and the way the rules work for nuisances related to that, um, we're also considering that as part of our study. All right, I'm having some trouble with the slide here. There we go. Uh, so we looked at the city's official plan. Uh, currently, the official plan has no direct reference to cannabis. Uh, and as part of the study, we're considering opportunities to consider operations within the good general agricultural de designation, as well as the industrial designation. We also re reviewed the, the four existing zoning bylaws, and I note that we know that there's a new comprehensive zoning bylaw in progress. Um, 
Only zoning bylaw 79200 currently discusses medical marijuana facilities uh, and sensitive land uses. And, and this permission relates to legislation that was in effect prior to the Cannabis Act. Um, so that's that is no longer sort of accurate to, to what's currently permitted within uh, overall within under the Cannabis Act. Uh, and I'll note that the zoning bylaw um, currently addresses medical marijuana facilities, but does not currently permit it in any of the zones. So for someone to come forward uh, to, to, to start a new medical marijuana facilities, they would have to go through a zoning bylaw amendment. And lastly, we looked at the site plan control bylaw. Currently, the whole city is subject to site plan control, but there is an exemption for farm operations unless those include agritourism uses, commercial farm markets, permanent or more mobile farm help, help houses, and greenhouses. So those items listed are, in fact, subject to site plan control currently. So at a high level, uh, here are our recommendations. Um, Indoor, first looking at indoor cultivation, we recommend regulating both the licensed facilities, uh, which create product for commercial uh, purposes, as well as the designated medical growth. So uh, instances where you have multiple um, medical prescriptions being grown in one location. Uh, and we recommend that uh, permissions be as of right within industrial zone areas. So these be listed as permitted uses, uh, but go through a site specific application within agricultural and rural areas. Uh, we recommend that outdoor cultivation not be permitted at this time in the city, just because of insufficient data regarding odor. Uh, if the decision was made to permit with this, we would recommend a minimum separation distance of 300 meters between the facility and sensitive land uses. But again, our recommendation is that that this not be permitted at this time. So in order to, rep uh, to implement those recommendations, we would need to make some changes to some of the planning documents. So in terms of the official plan, the recommendation would be to introduce a definition of cannabis uh, that explains that this includes different elements to the to production process. So not only cultivation, but also processing, packaging, testing, etc. Um, we also would recommend policies that require that the use occur wholly within an enclosed building, that it not permit, not emit any odor, and that it oper operate pursuant to all applicable regulations. Um, we would address this use both within the industrial designation and the good uh, general agricultural designation and also update the official plan policies to ensure where it discusses site plan control that site plan control would apply to this use. In terms of the zoning, we recommend defining both licensed cannabis production facilities as well as the designated medical growth of cannabis uh, and updating the current terminology in the zoning bylaws, which addresses medical marijuana. Um, we would want to update those to the new terminology. And we also recommend updating the definition of sensitive land uses. So we'd, not only to, again, update the reference to medical marijuana facilities, but also we'd want to add reference to residential, institutional, and open space zones. So currently a sensitive land use might um, include, for example, a dwelling or a residential use. We'd also want to protect for um, zones that might not yet be developed yet. So even if it's a residential lot that doesn't have a house on it yet, we'd all still want to count that as a sensitive land use. Um, and then we also recommend introducing general provisions for cannabis. Um, these provisions should address the following, a requirement for a separation distance for indoor operations to be 150 meters from um, sensitive land uses, uh, a, prohib a prohibition on outdoor storage, a requirement that the use be wholly enclosed within the building, uh, prohibiting the use within a dwelling, um, and also a requirement that the use not emit any odor. Um, further, we would recommend that any that this use be required to go through a zoning amendment um, in the agricultural and rural zones, so not permitted as a right in, these, in those zones, but it could be listed as a permitted use in the general industrial and heavy industrial zones um, and be permitted as a right there. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about retail um, and association or as an accessory use to industrial uses. Currently, the zoning does permit um, for industrial facilities, to, for the zoning permits um, sale of a product that's made within that facility. A small portion of the building area can be dedicated to actually selling that product. Um, so one of the things we'd be open for direction on is whether to also continue forward that permission as it relates to cannabis products. So if a facility were to be licensed um, by the federal government and then also get um, uh, 
uh, the required the meet the requirements of the province if they'd be able to sell accessory to their production. So just a, a quick summary here on, on what our recommendations are. So again, updating the official plan uh, to address uh, indoor um, cultivation and, and uh, processing of, uh, of cannabis within both the agricultural and industrial designations and updating uh, the policies to make sure that the use is subject to site plan control. Within the zoning in agricultural and rural areas, we would want to permit indoor cannabis uh, uses only through zoning uh, through a zoning bylaw amendment, uh, whereas they could be permitted as of right in the general industrial and heavy industrial zones. Um, and lastly, we'd want to go ahead and update the site plan control bylaw to make it clear that these uses all be subject to site plan control as well. So that's it for my presentation, but if there's any questions, uh, we're open to that. Do we have any questions of council? Okay, I just can't see the whole screen because it's, there we go. And yes, Councilor Lococo and then Councilor Carrier. Councilor Lococo and Councilor Carrier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have one question for our consultant uh, through the mayor to Suzanne. The maps that were included in the report had industrial in yellow. I did speak with Mr. Hurlovich. Um, the recommendation is that industrial is general and heavy. The yellow is all industrial. Do we have maps that you can show where the heavy and general industrial is? Because if we're looking at those maps, it's not recommended for all of those yellow. I would really like to see maps of just the general and the heavy where it is, where you're recommending. Ms. McDonald. Um, yes, yeah, so the we don't currently have maps that show that distinction. The maps were were more done just for illustrative purposes to under to, to kind of show um, what impact the different separation distances would have. Uh, but that's that's something that probably could be prepared if that was desired. Thank you, through the mayor. I would really appreciate that because when we're looking at the yellow zones, we, we could be thinking that that's where those facilities could be placed. And if it's only in industry, if it's only in heavy in general, those could be severely reduced. And I think it's important that we know where they could be in our city. And then I do have a lot of comments for later, but that was my first question. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Carrio. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. That was a, a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, where you suggest site-specific applications for agricultural and rural, is that something that we have to do? Or can we make it so that it cannot be put in agricultural or rural? Well, why, what was the reason why we, we give a kind of a, a crack in the door to let them into agricultural and rural, considering that Every time that one comes up or anyone talks about it, our community seems to go off the deep end. Yep, you're muted, uh, Ms. McDonald. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, so, um, the practice right now, so currently the, the zoning bylaw does uh, have uh, provisions for medical marijuana facilities, which would then um, perm permits them, but through a zoning site specific zoning bylaw amendment. And that is the same, um, is essentially what we're suggesting carrying forward with just broadening it to the full range of um, facilities that, um, oh, sorry, I've got sorry, I'm having some issues in my computer here, but um, broadening the permission to the full range of facilities that are now permitted under the Cannabis Act. So not only medical, but also commercial. Um, so that that is, it's the same strategy, it's just broadening the, uh, to, ma to align with, which is now permitted. Um, we didn't see a reason to pro prohibit them right across the board in agricultural areas. I don't know if Paul, you wanted to add to that in any way? Certainly, uh, through you, Mr. Worship, through your Worship. Um, we think it's important to provide some criteria for the municipality. Of course, anybody, if you don't permit them through your fish plan, anybody can come forward with an official plan amendment and rezoning. 
with an application. We think it's important to provide some criteria and some considerations in your official plan that says, if you're coming forward, we need you to go through a site-specific application, but these are the things you have to consider. So you have to do odor studies. You have to do lighting studies. You have to do transportation studies. Uh, and, and you have to have a minimum distance separation in the sense of land uses. If you don't do that, then you have no control. In other words, any application come forward for the OP zoning, you don't have anything to study them on. Yes, you can make the studies, but there's no, there's no basis for, for those studies. So we think it's important to set the, the, the standards that required, set the bar that they need to go over to make sure that they, they've covered off those base studies. Still then up to this council uh, through public, public uh, opinion, public input, uh, to determine whether you're going to permit it site specifically. I hope that helps. What helps, Paul? And the other question I had was um, on uh, not to emit odor. So not to emit odor is, um, I, I think, something that everybody's worried about because we say not to emit odor and everywhere where there's a facility, uh, we hear of the complaints about odor. So I don't know, you know, what type of teeth we can put into the not to emit odor. I can, yeah. I can try that, Your Worship. Um, so that's why we're recommending a couple of things. Uh, number one, we're recommending um, that they do studies. There, there is ability to have facilities not emit any odor through proper, uh, th proper air control, through proper carbon filtering. They can, they can be designed not to emit odor. Now, they have to maintain that. They, they need to make sure it's a proper facility and they need to make sure they maintain it. That's why we're recommending you, they have, they're required to do studies for you and that you do a site plan control and then a site plan agreement. So then you have a legally binding agreement with the facility that says you shall, uh, you shall use this type of uh, odor filtration and that you shall maintain it. That gives you the teeth in which to go after them if they're an odor that is emitted. So that's why, well, that's why we're recommending both site plan and the background studies to look at that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Campbell, then Peter Angelo. Yes, thank you. Um, appreciate your presentation. Uh, during the entire presentation, no mention was uh, made to the uh, uh, marijuana businesses that are importing marijuana and extracting the uh, product out of the marijuana. And I, I think that that should be included in this whole process because it, it, some, if we don't mention that, it could go into a residential area. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, so the way, I, the way we would look at it in terms of the zoning, that would constitute the processing component. So uh, it, that would be uh, a, 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 your typical that would count as an industrial use that would only be permitted and within an industrial area, uh, unless they were doing it accessory to growth if it were permitted in the agricultural area. But uh, to simplify how, to, how we think about it is if, if they're taking the, the product and processing it into something else within an industrial area, that becomes a cannabis production or processing use and it would be subject to the same requirements uh, that I discussed in terms of the setbacks and the no odor and all of those things would equally be equally apply, even if the cultivation port wasn't happening. Paul, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't see the, uh, the second uh, uh, thing you put up. Uh, there was nothing mentioned. This was the uh, government of Canada in that document there was nothing mentioned about extraction uh, producers. I think that all, that would, oh, sorry, my apologies. It was all focused on, on people who are growing and then making something or selling something. But there was no reference made to the, uh, uh, the simple extraction of the cannabis. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, to uh, Councillor Campbell. It is addressed in our report as processing. We can make that a little bit more clear that 
processing and yeah. extraction and, and make that clear that that is covered. I, uh, I would appreciate that. Industrial area. So we can, we can clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Are you good, Councillor Campbell? Yep. Okay, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just wanted to touch on site specific as well. Um, just because I, I, I think it sounds great to say that we have, you know, site specific zoning and that council has control. Um, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but I, I, I don't really believe that that would give council the ability to arbitrarily turn down an application if they didn't like it. Um, I would imagine that if whatever requirements we had in place uh, were fulfilled, whether that be through uh, certain studies or setback requirements, that even if the council were to turn down an application, that uh, they would receive approval from LPAT, provided that they met the requirements and fulfilled the studies that uh, that council had set out in the official plan. And um, that's the part of site specific that I think sounds really good. But in reality, all we're doing is, uh, in my opinion, is we're putting a few extra requirements in place that, that once fulfilled will allow for approval of the facilities. Um, and again, either, either Paul or Suzanne can correct me if I'm wrong. Paul or Suzanne? Uh, through your worship uh, to Councillor Peter uh, Angelo. Um, there's no doubt if you uh, do not, if you do not permit it in the fish plan in the zoning, it's a, it's a higher test for the applicant to meet because they have to do an official plan amendment as well as a rezoning. So that is true. Um, you, you, those that don't have any control over, um, over separation or anything to say, well, we think it should be a certain separation distance. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, you don't have the control in terms of what you want setbacks or requiring certain studies, but they have to go through a higher test. Uh, so for instance, they could submit an OPA and, and zoning bylaw amendment with a, re, a, a separation from sense of land uses of 50 meters, 25 meters. There's nothing in your official plan or zoning bylaw that says it should be a minimum. Uh, unless you say, uh, unless you put a policy in the official plan uh, that says uh, we're not going to permit them as a right in our official plan, we may consider them uh, through a site specific official plan and zoning bylaw, and these are the tests they've made. So you could do that uh, to give them a higher uh, bar with, with when, which they have to meet. So I think you say that we run into a challenge when we um, don't have it identified in our official plan. I think council is fully committed to identifying it in our official plan. I think the issue really is whether or not we uh, go down the road where we allow it in the agricultural zone. Um, I think that's where we get the biggest pushback from. So um, your, your answers are more along the line of if we didn't identify it in our official plan, and I'm suggesting that we do identify it, we just restrict it to uh, certain zones. So uh, how do you, I just want feedback from either uh, Mr. Lowe's or Ms. McDonald to what Councilor Peter Angelo just said. So what's your, your take on what are you suggesting? Through your worship, certainly you could just restrict it in the official plan and zoning bylaw to your industrial zones and not permit it in your uh, agricultural zones. Uh, you, uh, I, would still, I would still caution you that even if you don't permit it in the agricultural zones, you have some type of tests in case you do have an application come forward. Uh, Cause you're going to want the, you're going to want, you're going to get an application to come forward in the rural area. You're going to need the tests. Otherwise it's open season for them. They can provide, they can submit whatever they want without any tests. And it's up to you then to be on the defensive against that. You need to be on the offensive, set out what the tests are, even if you're not going to permit it as a right in the, in the agricultural zone, in the fish plan or zoning. The word you're using is tests? Requirements. Okay. Re re requirements, uh, yeah. uh, Your Worship. Uh, so the requirements would be you have to <clears throat> not admit an odor. You have to do an odor study. You have to deal with lighting. You have to have a minimum separation. 
those are the tests uh, that you should have, in, in my opinion. Okay, good. Good to know. Okay, I've got Councillor Coco Iannone, Cario. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When I read the report, I was looking for four factors that I think we really need to address. The first one is protecting the residents. The second one is finding our legal obligation because cannabis is legal. And the, the third one is preserving the rights and um, privacy of medical growers. And the fourth one is enforcement. I sort of broke it down into those four. Um, I know that the consultants don't recommend permitting it outdoors, and I do understand why. However, it is legal, and I think we do have to look at that in the sense that um, if, if someone wants to grow it outdoors and they take us to LPAT, we are going to look at high legal costs, we're going to look at a lot of time, and we're going to be in limbo that we're in an appeal just as we are with the vacation rental unit. So I think it's really important. A, it is legal, so I think we should do it and we should try to find the, um, the best place in, within our community with the least amount of nuisances to our residents. If we do go the site specific, we can control some of the, the, the concerns such as odor, noise, lighting, that sort of thing. I like that. But every t if every, we do that, every single time somebody puts an application in, we're going to be going through this every single time. And we're going to have the residents um, and a public meeting coming through. So we have to realize that if we do go site specific, there will be a public meeting and we have to go through that every single time. I can see the benefit of the site plan conditions for odor, but will our bylaw and our enforcement be able to enforce it? We, we've seen from many other municipalities that there are bylaws, that there are federal and provincial, but nothing is being enforced. So I don't want something just on a piece of paper that's saying, yes, we're going to enforce odor. We need to have something in place that we are going to enforce the odor if that's what we're going to do. Um, if the site plan uh, control, we can ask for studies, um, and I think that's great, the tests that Paul was speaking about. Um, and it, in, in the report, it says that it's not normal um, to, to ask, but we could use for fencing and security, so there's another level for us. Throughout the presentation, we talked about industrial, and I did bring that up earlier about the general and the heavy. I think it's really important that we understand before we make a decision how much industrial land we have that could be used for this. Um, for the crime enforcement, will we be enforcing the illegal grows that are in our community? Because sometimes um, that's not happening either either because of federal or provincial laws or because we don't have enough manpower. I think we have to look at the industrial zones. Um, we talked about having retail there. Is that any different than it would be at a winery? If a winery was growing grapes that they're selling wine, is that the same thing, whether it's in industrial and you have retail, them selling it there, or if it's outdoor and they're selling it? Um, the planning tools to enforce the odor, that's the same, could be the same as a regular farm. It touched in that in the report. For the indoor, we really have to enforce the odor. It's nice to say that our federal government has all of these lists of things that they're supposed to do, but that's not happening. And that's what is really problematic for the residents. We have to make sure that those mechanisms are in place. So what kind of budget are we going to be looking at to, to do that, to enforce that. Um, we talked about the retail, the environmental impacts. I wanted to touch on that. If someone can answer this, um, when water is required, it said that they would have to have a permit to take water from the Minister of Environment. Do other industries such as wineries, do they have to provide permits as well? Or is this specifically just for cannabis? Can someone answer that for me, please? So have you guys been writing these questions down? The, the other sure. ones were more of my comments. This one's more of a question. Okay. So on the water. So I don't know. It uh, looks like Mr. Lowe's, you can answer this. Certainly, Your Worship, uh, through you to uh, Councillor Loco. Um, you're only required to take a permit to take water over a certain amount, which I think is uh, 10,000 liters a day. So wineries uh, do that as well. Uh, any industry that does over that certain amount, and I may have the wrong, number wrong, but 
any industry that takes water over a certain amount out of the ground requires a permit to take water. Okay, thank you. The other thing I did like about um, a comment from the fire department, I think it really is important that our fire department goes in and they'd be able to see how they would be able to fight the uh, fire, specifically because this industry has a lot of locked doors with other industries that don't. So I thought that was really good. The other thing that I did want to touch on was the designated grower for medicinal. Um, I was speaking with Mr. Hurlovich earlier and there's legalities when we're, we're talking about people who are growing for medical purposes, they have a prescription. It's not, we could be infringing on their rights and their privacy of having them uh, put in a zoning bylaw for where they are. So my suggestion would be that the people who are growing for medicinal with the license from the government are exempt from the zoning bylaw. However, that they have to follow a, a specific list of items, like you were saying, tests about odor and those sort of things. Um, because if we start saying to um, medicinal growers, those are their prescriptions. I'm, no one else has to um, get a zoning bylaw if they're doing, if they're taking antidepressants or um, different types of um, medicine. But if we expect that, there is an infringement. And I, I think we would be setting ourselves up for some legal battles if we do that. So maybe around a way around that is that they do not have to do the zoning bylaw for their medicinal, but they do have to do the other things like the odors and the setbacks or, or whatever we decide. I just wanted to put that out there for, for some considerations. Um, the, the big thing for me is it is legal and I don't know how we can get away from not allowing it in agricultural. So the best thing that we can do rather than tying it up forever in LPAT is make sure that we have the proper things that they need in place and that we're protecting our residents through um, setbacks, odors, whether that be through the planning control or, or whatever. Um, my, my last point is that um, It said on page 17 of the report that w there was not recommendation for policy for a second grower. So my understanding is um, someone who's growing for medicinal purposes can grow their prescription amount of, of plants, uh, indoor or outdoor. Then they can also grow for another designate. And those um, can be nuisances as well through smell, lights. Um, so we have, we have to look into that. But when you get into a second one, now you can have four people. So um, it said that we weren't recommending the policies on that, but maybe that's something that we should look at. And then my last one is um, the setbacks. Are we going from property line, buildings, or houses? I, when I was speaking to Mr. Hurlovich, his suggestion was to go from property lines because it's nice and clean that way. You're not going from building to building because buildings can move and that sort of thing. So um, I, I'd like some comments about the property lines on that or building. Okay, Mr. Lowe's. Through you, uh, your worship. Uh, yes, we would recommend property line to property line for the sensitive land uses. Of course, you can use your outdoor, you can use your backyard, your front, your front yard, and uh, you can smell odor. Uh, and for businesses, they could expand. So property line to property line. <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify one thing on the designated growers. So uh, we're not saying to uh, require anybody that's uh, looking for growing for medicinal purposes to have a zoning but rather for designated growers. So designated grower could be a, somebody who grows for two people mm -hmm. with a medicinal license and another person could in the same property grow for two more. So you could be having to grow for four people for medicinal purposes. Those are the ones that are getting the most complaints in other municipalities from, from odor. So it's important to have some type of control on those that are smaller operations, but they are getting more of the complaints than the larger commercial operations just so you're aware of that. Okay, so my response to, to that would be that maybe we could look at the designated grower but not have the medicinal person, individual person have to apply for a zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. that, that was where I was going. Thank you so much.
you worship can i just touch on that point yes of course um was this the item that was brought up by is it mayor Steele in port colburn uh, about a month ago and he was talking about sort of the uh, medicinal prescriptions coming together um and and being grown collectively um and maybe I won't be able to get the answer for that, but I'm pretty sure it was the mayor of Park Holbrook who I heard on the radio talking about this. Um, but I guess my question was more around the fact of what's the maximum number that anyone can grow on, on a, like a medical prescription? Do we know that at all? And then would you multiply that by four to get the maximum number of plants that someone can, can grow? Your Worship, I can speak to that. It's my impression, and I'm talking uh, on a, uh, a meeting I had with uh, Mike Abbott, who has a medical license facility up in uh, uh, just outside of Guelph. Um, I'm under the impression that I can grow four plants without a prescription. But if I get a prescription from uh, a doctor, and there are apparently doctors traveling all over North America, writing prescriptions for 30, anywhere from 15 to 30 grams a day. When I grew up, we knew a uh, ounce was 28 grams. Do you know how long it took to smoke 28 grams? Well, they can- Can you tell us? Then, <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a lot longer than uh, my point is, uh, that's where the problem is coming. It's because of the prescriptions and we're not, and we're saying we're going to let these people grow it outdoors without any c complications. You know, you'd have uh, the right to have about 30 plants per person if you've got a prescription. And those could be grown outdoors, or we're saying we'll let them grow outdoors in an agricultural situation. Well, maybe four or five people can get together, and that's where we're going to have problems. So, Your Worship, could I have um, either yep. Paul or Suzanne comment on whether or not there is a maximum number of plants under a medical prescription? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have an exact number of, of the number of plants in terms of a maximum. What was said is correct in that the the number of maximum plants is based on the specific prescription. So as you alluded to, would be correct. It, you could have four prescriptions grown together. So essentially those could be as large as whatever the largest prescription that's issued by a medical professional times four if those four were grown together. But I don't have a specific number, whether that's seven plants or 25 or Etc. Do you know what the highest number you've heard is? Because the number that I've heard is is well above what Councillor Campbell mentioned. I don't have a specific number. Sorry, no. Paul, would you know? No, no, we don't. Uh, through your worship, we don't have. All we've heard is that it's dependent on the the doctor's uh, prescription, uh, and it whatever the doctor prescribes is what it would be, and there's no restrictions by uh, the feds on that. Uh, and is the suggestion to exclude them from the from the requirements of the official plan? To your, that, no, absolutely not. Uh, that's why uh, Suzanne presented about the designated growers. So the designated growers and our recommendations would be subject to the to the zoning by the requirements. So be permitted industrial areas, uh, subject to the test, but require a site specific rezoning in agriculture areas and not permit outdoor growing for designated growers, only indoor growing for designated growers. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm moving on to Councillor Iannone and then Cario. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Lowe's or Ms. McDonald, I think it was Mr. Lowe's who said that we are going to have at some point an application for agricultural. And my concern in not adding site-specific is the fact that it is legally designated an agricultural crop. And in your own, and I, and I think somebody who comes before this council without us having that ability to set site 
setbacks and odors and and having it site specific is the fact that your own report says that you have there's insufficient data regarding odor. So somebody's going to come back and fight us with your own words. Um, if the complaint is odor, it will be you paid a consultant and even the consultant ha did not have sufficient data to be able to comment on odor. And, and I've been Googling while everybody's been talking, and that's really the common consensus everywhere. There's not sufficient data to talk about odor. So I think hmm. given that it's legal and that it's an, it is an agricultural crop, for us to say that we will not allow it site-specific indoors in an agricultural area, are we kind of setting ourselves up to uh, for an LPAT uh, appeal on grounds we don't have? It is an agricultural crop. Are we tying our own hands to either of the consultants? Yeah, Mr. Your Worship. Um, I don't know. I don't think so because the the federal government it, it's legal. You have to get uh, you have to get a permit to grow it. But under the permit requirements, the, per the permit holder has to guarantee and has to identify that it meets with the zoning. So any growing of agriculture, to, any growing of cannabis to get a permit has to say that it's permitted by this, the municipality zoning. So if your municipality doesn't permit it in the zoning, they don't get a license. So it, it is not an open season for the, anybody can get a license anywhere. Uh, and it's legal anywhere. That is one of the requirements. Uh, so, so I, I, I don't. It, with that, that gives you the strength, and provided you have the rationale and the reasoning behind it, uh, I think you've got strong requirements at the LPAT. And if you put the test in no odor, they have to guarantee there's no odor. They have to prove it. And what's the interesting change in the last couple of weeks, as uh, Ms. McDonald has indicated, is the MOECP coming out with the D6 guidelines, which now mention uh, cannabis operations and are, are setting out a minimum uh, distance separation uh, that you still need to look at mitigation measures. And that's draft, of course, but you know they're recognizing that there is an issue. Um, so it's, I don't think any more that they can, it's a fait accompli if they go to the LPAT. I think you can, you can set out the requirements strong enough uh, and give yourself some, uh, some good strength when you have to go to LPAT. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Councillor Cario. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul or Suzanne. The setbacks, um, you could probably get the feeling around the table that this is really not an industry that we care if they come to Niagara Falls. <clears throat> we don't really, no one in our city seems to want it. Um, the fact that the feds made it legal, they don't, that doesn't give our residents any comfort. So, we're trying to put together a, a bylaw or a rules and regulations that really don't encourage people to come to Niagara Falls. It's not hard to buy uh, marijuana products. You know, go and grow them somewhere else. We don't want them anywhere that anywhere that um, uh, they've been proposed in Niagara has been the biggest outcry of anything that we've ever seen. So um, the setbacks, 150. Can it be 500? Can it be a thousand? Can, can we make it whatever? I mean, let, let's make it so that we give uh, some real teeth to protect our residents if they happen to win and get one somewhere. Uh, I don't want to short, short, um, uh, short change us on that. Make it as absolutely as tough as you can. And we're looking for you to tell us how to make it, uh, uh, you know, as tough as we can make it for them to come to Niagara. Uh, and we don't really want it in agricultural or rural. No one that lives around it. None of the farmers want it. None of the properties that are even close to agriculture want it. The smell carries for miles. So um, that's what we really want from you. We want you to tell us how do we make it as tough as we can make it in all aspects. Because as you can see, I don't think this is an industry that we're opening our doors for. And we don't want it. I don't want it. No one that I talk to wants it. So. So Mr. Lowe's or Ms. McDonald, whoever wants to answer that one. So what is the maximum setback? Because I see in the summary table one, 600 meters is the farthest one here. Um, has that been tested? And can you go, how far can you go? You say you can put any number you want until it gets tested. What, what advice would you give Councillor Cario for his answer? 
Your Worship, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and none of them have been tested yet. Um, so there are, there are some matters that uh, are going to LPAT, but none, none of, there's been no LPAT decision yet on what's appropriate separation distance. We've looked at it, and most of the municipalities have addressed 150. Um, if, 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 you, if it's done properly and it's, and it's uh, got the proper odor controls and it's indoor, 150, in our opinion, is sufficient. But it's got the, the, the key issue here is odor. That's 100% the key issue. And the key issue is making sure that odor is mitigated through proper ventilation filtration systems. So if, if they can prove that they can do it, uh, in our opinion, 150 is appropriate. Now, other municipalities are going higher. Uh, and the minimum distance separation, the draft out uh, right now is, is for 500 meters. Um, that's, that's unmitigated, 500 meters. So, that's assuming no odor control, but that's what the province is saying now is 500 meters. So the, the question is, what's the maximum? What's been tested? There, there's nothing out there that's been tested yet. So I can't, I can't give you advice on, on what other municipalities have done that's been tested and uh, stood up at the OPA yet. Uh, thanks, Paul. And the, the, the thing is, is that odor is not the only reason that, that we hear from uh, residents or uh, taxpayers why they don't want it that's one of the reasons they don't want it so we're just looking for uh mechanisms to make it actually as difficult as we can for someone to want to come and put it here so it's not just odor it's all the other things that they tell us or they call us or they email us or they march around and they don't want it so uh anyway thank you thank you for that councillor uh, peter angelo yeah thanks your worship um for me i don't know if it's so much as uh, finding the most difficult way that they can um, come to the city. For me, I, I like I find it to be more black and white in the sense that it's finding the appropriate place for them. Um, and there is more to it, as Councillor Cario said, than, than just odor. And I know there's been a couple things that have been mentioned. Um, I, I, I thought it was Councillor Campbell that sent us an email maybe a couple months ago in regards to a municipality that had put a, a lighting bylaw in. Sorry, um, I think I might have lost you there for a second, uh, but a municipality that put a lighting bylaw in uh, so that the facility could not emit any lighting um, or, or any light pollution, if you would call it. Um, there's, there's other factors as well, though, for why people in the agricultural area don't want it. One would be the fortification of it. Another would be the security of it. I know Councillor Lococo um, spoke about the water usage. And I also remember uh, reading an article. I thought it was from the Haldeman area where they had um, denied, uh, I thought, a facility the right to, to draw water out of the, out of the Grand River. Um, it was kind of a give and take because the, the flip side to not allowing them to draw water would be that there was a lot of water trucks that were going to be going down, you know, country roads every single day. So there's the <clears throat> infrastructure part of it as well. Um, I guess to me, it's, it, it, it's, it's more about taking what I see as uh, a full-on commercial operation and dropping it in the middle of the rural area. And, you know, is the city is the city equipped for that? And are the surroundings equipped for that? And that's why I've always suggested that perhaps the industrial areas are a better fit for, for everything. I mean, our roads are, our roads are very uh, built up. They're able to handle, you know, multi-ton trucks. Um, there's city water in industrial areas. You know, no one has to worry about secure uh, security. No one has to worry about fortification. Uh, lighting does not become an issue to neighboring properties and odor can be mitigated, um, you know, with distance separation. So those would be my reasons, Your Worship, for uh, for wanting it in the industrial area as opposed to the agricultural area. And I really appreciate hearing Mr. Lowe say that, um, you know, the municipality really has the right to, uh, I guess, pass its own bylaw without worrying whether or not you know it is permitted in the agricultural zone even though it's a it's a crop that's identified um so 
uh, that's the path that I would like to see us go down in your worship. And those are my reasons for it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions of, of council at this point? Okay. All right. Seen. Oh, yeah. Councilor Strange. Sorry, your worship. I just had a quick question and, and, you know, to this whole cannabis issue. And I think Canada got rushed, rushed into it with, uh, you know, making it just uh, agriculture and, and basically cannabis was just like growing something on crop like corn or whatever it may be. And um, there wasn't a lot of uh, detail into going into provincially, federally. Um, the only question I have is, do we leave ourselves open for any liability as far as if somebody has a medical marijuana license that they can grow, say, 20 plants in their backyard? And now because of our bylaw, they can't. Do we open ourselves liable because they do have a license from the federal government to grow? So Mr. Lowe's. Do your worship to Councillor Strange. If, if, you're if you're growing just for yourself, just your own personal for medical purposes, th this zoning would not apply. You would have to go. Oh, even if you, you, you got, say, I know there's a maximum of 150 plants, I guess, for some medical in residential and they can grow that. If it's only, it's only, we're only talking about if it's a designated grower. Yeah. So designated yeah. Grower is two or more. If it's only one, we're not suggesting any zoning or site plan requirements for them. Okay. Thank you. Is that because it's federal uh, higher jurisdiction? Uh, that, that's true. Yes, that's, that's true, Mr. Uh, Your Worship. Uh, and, and also it, it is for that personal health reasons. Um, so we're giving them that. Um, aspect, although, as we've heard, there's no limit on how many. It's that's all up to the doctor. Got it. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Uh, that having been said, uh, can we create as, as part of our bylaws that those individuals be open to in, uh, regular checkups uh, with bylaw enforcement? Good question. Either. I mean, it, yeah. through, you, through you, your worship, the, the difficulty is knowing who they are. Well, can we make them register so uh, that it becomes legal? You, uh, through your worship, you could look at that as a licensing, so they'd have to get a license from the municipality. And uh, I think that we should consider that. Can, can we, Thank Mr. You. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Lowe, so can, can we force that uh, or, or how would that work? Because I know with upper tier, uh, just wondering if it's, if it can happen, if it's been done. Your Worship, um, you, you could do a license and require people to, to get a license for it. The, the gain, the whole issue is uh, enforcement and trying to find those that don't bother to get a license, right? Because they're already permitted under the federal government to grow. Um, uh, and so they could automatically start growing. You could put a re license requirement on, but then you would have to try and enforce that and figure out who they are. Got it. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Coco, then Strange. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if we could have um, some discussion with our city solicitor about LPAT. If, if it is um, a legal crop and it is legal to grow, and we don't allow it into our city. I know that Mr. Lowe's was just speaking on this um, and there hasn't been anything tested yet. There are some cases at LPAP, but we don't have the, the results. I was wondering what, what opinion our city solicitor has um, about LPAT. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time and it leaves, it leaves us in limbo. Does Mr. Lustig have any opinion on this? Mr. Lustig. You have your ears on, and might you weigh in on this discussion? I really don't have too much to add. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, LPAT, of course, the procedure um, requires that uh, filings take place and witnesses um, become uh, available, and a hearing is held. And and you know, it's done virtually now, but it does definitely take time and it costs money and you know we do as you know i don't do the litigation for the city um uh it goes outside so it's at, at the present time at some point in the future i'm sure you're going to have an in-house uh full-time 
city solicitor or two solicitors here, and that'll be done in-house. In but now it is expensive and it goes outside. So um, that consideration, there's there's no doubt, no doubt there's, there's costs. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I was just I was just going back to like digging in about bylaw, uh, getting you know looking over uh, people with who have medical licenses because you know a lot of these people have uh, you know different illnesses, whether it be mental or glaucoma, arthritis, cancer, autism, whatever they do that they need this product. So I don't know digging in and and, and trying to find out if digging bylaw in and finding out exactly what why they have that i just want to make sure that that's private and that's kept to themselves because there's no it's no business of ours if they have some kind of illness and need this for their illness okay so if there are no further questions or comments of council then we're going to look to the we've got two recommendations here uh, the first one is that we receive the presentation and adopt the Cannabis Grow Facilities Land Use Review. And secondly, that we direct the consultants to prepare the amendments to the OP, the zoning bylaws and the site plan control. So what is the will of council? Councilor Carrio. Thank you, Worship. I'd be happy to move the recommendations, but now when the consultants come back with their um, uh, amendments, uh, will it reflect uh, the comments that they've heard from our counselors or will it be? Good, good question. Uh, so we'll ask uh, Ms. McDonald, then we seem to have lost uh, Mr. Lowe's. Oh, there he is. So he is. Uh, yeah, just want to uh, ensure that you've been taking uh, copious notes and uh, that'll be reflected. Yes. Okay. I got a thumbs up or a pen up from uh, Ms. McDonald. Then I, I would move recommendation, Your Worship. Okay, that's great. Motion by Councillor Cario. Councillor Peter Angelo, are you seconding it? Yeah, I'll second it, Your Worship. And I wanted to ask as well um, for some type of confirmation. So uh, when the recommendations do come back, are they going to be the way that they're spelled out in the report? Or are they going to reflect uh, some of the comments, or I should say the majority of comments that, um, that that both Paul and Suzanne have heard from council tonight. I, I, I guess I just want to know what it is that we're adopting because I know myself I'm not 100% comfortable um, with the recommendations that are in the report. So uh, maybe we'll let them uh, answer that. I, I saw the uh, affirmative thumbs up, pen up, but maybe you could just verbalize for the councillor's uh, comfort, uh, Mr. Lowe's. Certainly, Your Worship. Uh, we've heard uh, strongly from Council some of the some of the thoughts. Uh, we'll work with uh, Mr. Ilovich, come back with a bylaw and uh, an OPA that uh, addresses some of the concerns. Of course, uh, that would be uh, contingent on ha having us being able to defend it, um, but we'll provide our best recommendations based on what we've heard from Council and discussions with Mr. Ilovich. So, Your Worship, would it be possible just to um, just to ask for uh, a quick little Coles Notes version of what you understand, I guess, the, the majority of council to want. Okay, we could do that. Well, Tim, why don't we, we'll get to that. We'll give uh, uh, Ms. McDonald a chance. I see she's writing feverishly to kind of encapsulate her thoughts because I know Councillor Lacoco wants to comment as well. So I'm buying you a couple more minutes, Ms. McDonald, to put your notes together. And then uh, you and Mr. Lowe's can maybe kind of encapsulate what you heard here tonight to make sure you get the essence. And I know you can always replay the video. I'm sure you'll want to do that. They're very exciting videos. But uh, then I'll go to uh, Ms. Lacoco, uh, Councillor Lacoco, rather, for uh, the next comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I agree. I'm not 100% satisfied with the recommendations, and I think we've had a lot of comments. So the only um, change to the motion that I would put is that they're draft amendments. So when the draft amendments come back to us that we can can change them, that we haven't decided on those specifics mm -hmm. that they're draft. Well, I think they will be because it'll be a, it'll be a public meeting uh, that we're gonna debate again, but I'll get Mr. Herlovich, if you could just weigh in if you're handy, just to confirm that next step when they, the consultants bring it back to us, um, how, what it will be. Will it be a draft version 
uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it would be a draft version. And I think uh, because it is a public meeting, as you know, the way that our council works, we bring the rec the uh, policies and bylaw forward in draft for the council to consider. And then the bylaws come to a subsequent meeting before they're actually passed and adopted. So they would be in a draft form. Uh, Councillor Coco, is that good? That covers what you're looking for? Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back now to uh, Ms. McDonald. If maybe you want to just give us a little bit of an overview of how, how you see this playing out. We know this isn't detailed, but general uh, consensus of what you heard. Okay. <clears throat> I'll, sorry, did you want to, or did you want me to summarize? Okay. Um, so, oops, sorry. Uh, in terms of we've, we've heard a lot of comments about the industrial permissions and the industrial zones, so we'll be considering those. Um, we'll be discussing internally uh, about the discussions related to permissions within the agricultural areas specifically. I know that there were some concerns raised with those, so we will be looking at those in further detail and considering those comments and also clarifying. I think there's a lot of discussion about the designated growers, so clarifying exactly um, what what would be captured under the zoning bylaw and what how how many growers are specifically capturing that it's the designated growers and not the personal medical growers that uh, we would want to capture okay uh, yeah councillor Pierangelo and then Dabrowski yeah thanks your worship I guess just through you to Suzanne when you say you'll be considering comments um, do you want specific direction from council tonight like, would that not be better, Your Worship? I feel like I'm uh, once again passing it back for um, for someone else to come back to us with a recommendation that we might look at that we don't like. Uh, should we not be deciding um, where we would like to see uh, where we would like to see cannabis grown, uh, things of that nature, or do we just simply pass it all back? for once again to have a look at draft amendments. I guess it's the will of council. Um, I know uh, Mr. Hulovich is, is weighing in too. So are you suggesting, so for example, in essence, the, the report saying that you don't wanna grow it in the city. Uh, we only wanna have it grown indoors in industrial with uh, minimum setbacks and minimum um, filtration systems. Uh, are like, is that your suggestion that we're, we're not a doors wide open, red carpet rolled out for come and grow it. It's only in certain areas under circum, certain circumstances. Is that what you're, is that where you're going with that counselor? Well, well, I know that's what I'd like to see, but I don't know what the majority of council feels, your worship. So, I mean, I, I thought this would have been our opportunity to kind of get it on the floor and give direction to the consultants and to staff to uh, simply prepare the bylaw. Um, but it seems like we're passing them back or it seems like we're passing it back again, just to come back with draft recommendations. I thought tonight would have been the time to give actual direction to our consultants and staff to prepare exactly what we wanted to see in the bylaw. That's all. Okay. Well, you know what? We're, I think we're getting there. So I've got, uh, Councillor Dabrowski, Iannone and Lococo, uh, to, to weigh in next. So let's see where this goes. So Councillor Dabrowski. <laughs> Yeah, through you, um, and, and I'm liking where uh, Councillor Peter Angelo is going. I, I think, um, or I know a lot of the concerns that we've heard tonight are, are around older. Um, Councillor Cario mentioned setback, uh, maybe a 500 meter setback. So I, I think it would be nice to give a definitive kind of, um, at least some guidance to um, the consultants to come back with that report. The 150 meter setback, I mean, retail operations have to be 150 meters from any retail store. So I think, you know, you know, we need to look at more of an expansive number in terms of the setback. And again, odor and the lack of testing and evidence relating to, to odor concerns. And I know outdoor is not a, an issue that we're dealing with right now, which is great to hear. I mean, Councillor Perio, to his point again, I, I'm not sure any residents want cannabis grown in, within our municipality, but, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of testing that, that we didn't hear about or, or issues relating to odor in terms of uh, indoor cannabis growing. So I, I like to see some more details about the setback. Um, and basically on, on the uh, looking at the map and the industrial areas, 
um, ironed out. I know it was high level, but I'd like to see that a little more pinpointed and focused as well. But those would be my recommendations on any info coming back in a, an updated report at the next meeting or at a future meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Iannone, uh, then Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is, is my understanding correct that they're going to come back and they, they will be coming back to a public meeting where the residents can comment? This is why I thought they were coming back with draft with the draft approval and not something we're directing them to do right now, because this is just a conversation amongst us. And once it becomes a public meeting, we listen to those comments and then you make the more solid direction. And that's what I thought the purpose of this was for, not to bring them back in a hard and fast rules. I think you're right. I just think, I think Councillor Peter Andrews was just hoping to give them a little more narrow, you know, kind of narrow it down a little bit. But um, especially if we know where we want to go at this well, point. I, I get that, but we, we're, we're always hearing from people that our decisions are made up before they have an opportunity to speak to it. And I'd hate to make that comment, have those comments made here, but send it hard and fast. And, and we're not open to listen. Sorry about that. We're not open to listening to residents come back. We're going to decide what we're going to decide, but I'd hate to see us do it preemptive of listening to them. Okay, thank you for that. I got Councillor Lococo, then Dabrowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think that we do need to come back with more in a public meeting, especially about the industrial zones, because looking at the map, that's all industrial zones. I don't think we can make a decision saying it, it is going to go in industrial if we don't know which industrial zones it's going to go in. So for me, that's a big one. And um, I, I would like to include all of this discussion <laughs> at the public meeting that we could listen to our residents of what they wanted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dabrowski. There was a, just through you, Mayor, maybe to Mr. Hillervich, there was a, a survey done, a public survey, right, relating to cannabis grow operations that, that was taken into consideration, I would imagine, in this report. Just to Councillor Iannone's um, point. Mr. Hillervich? Uh, there was a survey done. I uh, believe those results were passed on, but we can look at those again you know there's certainly <clears throat> excuse me I, I you know i took uh copious <coughs> notes i don't know i have a few pages of notes that i've taken this evening and we can revisit the tape as was suggested uh, you know i i think what i heard from council is they don't necessarily want policies in the agricultural designation but we would want maybe some policies in the official plan that would say you may need an official plan amendment and zoning amendment in the agricultural area, but here are the things that you need to provide to us. So we'd have to put that into a general area rather than under the land use. So, you know, I wouldn't mind taking some time to talk with um, both Mr. Lowe's and Ms. McDonald to really compare notes and say, this is what we heard, you know, how do we accommodate <coughs> that, those back to council as uh, councillors Iannone and Lococo have said, and um, and then give the public the comment and say, you know, yes, I think you got that right, or go back and do a bit more homework. Um, so, um, you know, there, there was a lot said, and I, I think um, I particularly have gleaned a lot from this discussion. I think that it's uh, been very productive personally. <laughs> I would agree with that. Okay, so um, I think we've heard, and, and, and to the comments here too, about the public getting the public involved, absolutely agree. But I can tell you, and I'm sure we all feel the same, uh, when there was that proposal to grow it in the far south end and in the far north end of the city, we all heard loud and clear from the public. I mean, hundreds of people. I got a real good temperature test of where people feel about it. And I can tell you, I think it's, it's safe to say uh, none of them want to live near where it's being grown because they don't want to smell it and they don't want to deal with the lights and the things that go along with it. That I don't, I, I already know I've got a good flavor for where people are at in that regard. Everyone knows it's legal, but they just don't want to be disturbed by it. So I've got Councillor Peter Angelo. Hey, Your Worship, the only comment I was going to make me. is that, yeah, the only comment I was going to make is that we don't have to make it appear as though we're not listening to the public opinion. I mean, we're almost two years into this. We've had a plethora of public meetings and, and you know, been sent emails by everyone that has an opinion on it. I think we know 
really where people stack up. It's a matter of coming back with the recommendations. And some people are going to say, you know what, you got it right. And other people are going to say, oh, no, I'm not happy with that. We already know that. It doesn't matter which way we decide. So, I mean, we've already listened to the public. I think it's a matter of coming back with the recommendations. Councillor Iannone? You're muted. I'm sorry. Um, then one more meeting is not going to make a difference. Um, we've all heard for and against. Um, I think I think in order to appear that we're listening to everybody, there should not be hard and fast things coming back. Bring us back a report based on the discussion. I like the comments from Mr. Herlovich and from our consultants. And I think one more meeting isn't going to kill us to make sure that we can say we were open, transparent and accountable on this issue. Well, that's always been the plan. There is going to be another, there has to be another meeting. So we've got a motion by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we um, move the recommendations. Again, that we receive the report, we adopt the report, and direct the consultants to prepare the amendments to the OP zoning bylaw and the site plan control bylaw, uh, taking into effect the comments they heard tonight, and they'll bring it forward to a public meeting in the future where we'll make the final decision. So if there's no further discussion, because there's been this many comments on it, can we see? So if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Awesome. Thank you for that. So thank you, uh, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Lowe. Appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you. All right. So we're moving along to item 7.2 and I would ask the city clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda, please. Thank you, your worship. A public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit a proposed hybrid in providing satellite accommodation in conjunction with the inn and the vacation rental unit at the properties of 5359 River Road, 4465 Eastwood Crescent, and 5411 River Road. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on April the 30th, 2021, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I now ask our director of planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed amendments. Th thank you, uh, your worship. This application involves three properties at 5359 River Road. That's the Grandview Inn. It's pictured on your screen as well as 4465 Eastwood Crescent and 4, uh, 5411 River Road. Uh, the intention is to um, create a hybrid inn by connecting Grandview Inn with uh, the property on Eastwood Crescent and then separately have a vacation rental unit at 5411 River Road. The uh, three properties are uh, pictured on the screen. So the inn is on the uh, property at the corner of Eastwood Crescent and River Road. They're hoping to connect with uh, the property on uh, Eastwood uh, Crescent um, immediately to the west of the property on the opposite side of River Lane. And then the third property is the application 5411 River Road uh, for a vacation rental unit um, independent of the inn itself. The, uh, <coughs> The drawings for the, uh, these properties, so on your screen, is um, um, the Grandview Inn. It's labeled as 5359, and the parking is shown at the rear of this property. The current zoning provide, uh, requires that there be uh, 12 parking spaces or 12 spaces, uh, surface lot uh, parking spaces, and the space in the garage off River Lane, and then Eastwood. Crescent property at 4465. There are two parking spaces in front of the building off Eastwood and two parking spaces proposed next to the garage uh, <coughs> River Lane. The other property 
at 5411 River Road is uh, a store and a half house. Uh, there's a parking space off River, River Road, and then there are four parking spaces in a, a gravel lot off River Lane. And that property would be the vacation rental unit. So the owner had previously requested that the council consider an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment to connect Grandview in with five other properties uh, for satellite accommodation. At the request of the applicant in February, council granted a deferral so that they could make revisions to the application. The application has been revised to that that I just uh, outlined, which is that Grandview Inn be linked to uh, 4465 Eastwood Crescent to provide satellite accommodation. That would be an official plan amendment as well as to change the zoning bylaw from R2-1010, uh, which is the Grandview Inn, and R2-2, which is the Eastwood Crescent property, and to permit 12 guest rooms plus an innkeeper seat <coughs> for guest rooms in the Eastwood Crescent property. The revised application is also for an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for 5411 River Road. Um, this would allow that property to be a standalone vacation rental unit. And the three other properties that were previously part of this application uh, are intended to be used in accordance with the existing zoning and are no longer part of this application. The uh, ownership of uh, River Road, uh, which is a Grandview, sorry, 5359 River Road, which is a Grandview Inn, is zoned for 12 rooms uh, for guests plus a room for a manager and a dining room. Uh, the property was sold by 1907782 Ontario Inc. to 11409433 Canada Inc. Uh, in March of this year. The property has a detached garage in addition to the inn, as well as landscaped areas. <coughs> the building is currently under construction under a building permit. 5465 Eastwood Crescent is occupied by a two-story dwelling, um, and um, this property is owned by 1190-7782 Ontario uh, Inc. I think you have a letter from Mr. Vaca, who's the uh, representative for this application, stating that the owner um, of the Grandview Inn, which is 190 Ontario Inc., I'll just reduce the name, um, oh, sorry, 114, uh, Canada Inc. has a uh, offer to purchase the Eastwood property. Um, the, um, and then the last property, 5411 River Road, is actually owned by Alfred and Colette de Souza. The, um, in the past, there were 29 letters received on the original proposal. Uh, those are included in your package. There were 10 letters of objection, 19 letters of support. Since that time, we've received additional letters uh, in opposition to this revised application. Those are also on your agenda tonight. At a virtual open house uh, held in December, uh, there were 19 interested parties. They raised various uh, concerns. They disagreed with the applicant's assertion that the satellite accommodation was a residential use. They cited that properties were used illegally. They had concerns about traffic they were concerned about profit, property standards <coughs> related to ongoing construction. Uh, they were concerned there were more rooms advertised than zoning allowed. Uh, they uh, also expressed concern that the Inn and Eastwood Crescent are not licensed uh, facilities. So in looking at the revised applications, we did have to have regard to the provincial place to, gr place to grow plan and the provincial policy statements. Uh, these are general in nature, and they do um, um, comply with the provincial policies. Um, Niagara Falls is a identified gateway, gateway economic zone and increased tourist opportunities and <laughs> tourism are supported. Uh, we did note that CMHC statistics show the vacancy rate in the city has risen from 0.7% in October of 2019 to 2.3% in October of 2020. Those are the most recent figures that we have. The uh, also had comments from the region and they found that the sites are located within the built up area of the urban boundary 
and that they are adjacent to the parkway. They are within the gateway economic zone. So they uh, found that the proposal does comply with their policies. We looked at our official plan policies. The lands are designated residential in our official plan. Bed and breakfast are permitted as an accessory use. And the Grandview Inn itself is to a special policy area number 32, which permits the development of the inn to 12, in the words of the amendment, 12 rentable bedrooms and a room for an ensuite manager. When the property was zoned for this purpose, the purpose of the inn the floor plan did show a mix of 12 guest rooms consi consisting of either um, bedrooms with a bathroom or suites with more than one bedroom. Uh, and there was to be a room for the manager. The uh, current plans filed with the building department show 19 individual rooms, four suites with two bedrooms and a room for the manager. In essence, there are 17 bedrooms, uh, which seem to align, uh, align with the alleged advertising. And then there are two <coughs> rooms and there is that room for a resident manager. The lands are also in the River Road Satellite Tourist District. And the official plan permits alternative forms of accommodation that are compatible with the residential area. The policies do state that no commercial uses shall be permitted in the River Road District. The intent of the official plan is also to ensure that tourism development does not impact on the quality of life of the city's residents. Staff uh, did not recommend the previous um, application for the five properties. Um, and uh, although they had supported linking uh, the Eastwood Crescent property with Grandview since they were uh, owned by the same uh, company. However, staff are now not able to give a positive recommendation uh, on the official plan amendment to allow Eastwood Crescent to be used in conjunction with Grandview uh, in due to the recent sale. And we cite the uh, difficulties of enforcement um, in terms of if one property is operating out of conformity with the zoning and they're owned by separate people um, as well the uh, license could be an issue as well as site plan control we already have had complaints that the property um, has been altered from the site plan agreement that's currently in place uh, which has replaced landscaping with turf stone and interlocking paving the um, if the uh, 17 room inn with meeting rooms and a dining room would be further expanded with a four, um, four offsite bedrooms from Eastwood, this property would be akin to a com commercial operation like a hotel, um, which would be contrary to the policies which provide that the residential character is to be maintained and no commercial uses permitted to win within the River Road District. Uh, with the history of complaints, cannot be assured that the operation of the inn will not adversely affect the quality of life and enjoyment of the surrounding neighborhood. Special policy area number 32 permits 12 rentable rooms, while the site-specific zoning provides for 12 guest rooms. Rooms, bedrooms, guest rooms have been used interchangeably. This has created ambiguity, has resulted in conflict in the language between the official plan and zoning. Um, and thus uh, should be rectified. Um, with respect to 5411 River Road, uh, this is the application for a vacation rental unit. Council adopted official plan amendment number 127. Uh, that was appealed to the Ontario Minister, or, uh, sorry, to LPAT. Um, the hearing occurred last December. We don't yet have a decision, but we do believe that the um, policy does reflect council's uh, intent. Uh, we looked at 5411 then with respect to the those policies in official plan amendment 127. And um, we noted that previously the application says that there are four bedrooms. Uh, one bedroom would have to be removed from rental potential, perhaps converted to storage or some other use in order to meet the policy, which limits VR use to three bedrooms. The property is sufficiently sized for the required parking. I illustrated that on a plan earlier. The property is la located uh, for small scale tourist accommodation. That is, it's close to Queen Victoria Park and the tourist core. And the closest uh, approved VRU is 300 meters away 
from this proposal, so it's not creating an undue concentration. The vacancy rate has increased to 2.3% in the city and the BRU licensing that council passed uh, at the last meeting would be uh, applied to this property uh, issued to the D'Souza's. And uh, if there were uh, more than three violations, the license would be suspended. Um, with respect to the zoning bylaw, Grandview Inn is zoned R21010, with site-specific regulations. It limits the maximum number of guest rooms to 12. Uh, Eastwood Crescent, or 4465 Eastwood Crescent and 5411 River Road are both zoned R2-2, which does permit uh, bed and breakfast operations up to four rooms for tourists. Uh, the application uh, seeks to amend the R2-1010 zone and to allow it to be linked to 4465 as a satellite property. The requested zoning seeks to also uh, allow the inn to provide breakfast to any guests of the inn and a satellite property. The zoning amendment would also incorporate minor variances granted for building height uh, and an increase in parking area and a reduction in landscape uh, area. Required parking is to be provided on the respective properties. So with respect to Grandview Inn, uh, by linking the Grandview Inn to Eastwood Crescent, they would result in 21 bedrooms for tourists, which is an akin to a hotel. The official plan does not support commercial development in the River Road neighborhood. Two properties under one shared zoning will create uh, enforcement issues in the future. And therefore, um, the requested offsite parking or offsite building uh, should not be approved. Um, the chart in front of you illustrates the uh, zoning regulations that were granted by the Committee of Adjustment. We recommend incorporating that into a zoning amendment. So that we're dealing with just uh, all the um, regulations in one uh, planning document. Um, the Grandview Inn continued. So council can consider uh, approval of the following requested changes. The building height increase is acceptable, increase in the percentage lot area, which equates to about 50 square meters and corresponds to the existing turf stone. This could be used to provide tandem parking for staff and alleviate some offsite <coughs> parking <coughs> impacts. The official plan and zoning should be amended to recognize the floor plans that are filed with the building department. That is nine individual bedrooms, four suites having two bedrooms each and one bedroom for a manager together with two meeting rooms and a breakfast room to be exclusively used for guests of the inn. These changes will refine the current zoning approvals and recognize meeting rooms, which are currently not addressed in the zoning bylaw. With respect to 4465 Eastwood Crescent, the property is zoned R2-2, um, uh, connecting that to the Grandview Inn is not supported. Um, there are certain changes requested with respect to lot frontage, exterior lot uh, side yard, um, exterior side yard uh, for parking, and the setback for accessory building. Since River Lane uh, does not constitute a street, is not a uh, corner lot, and so therefore uh, the amending bylaw uh, does not need to address the uh, what they're calling the exterior side yard. The current zoning permits the property to be used. By, the, by an owner occupied bed and breakfast up to four guest rooms and would require five parking spaces. Uh, an increase in the parking area can be supported if a bed and breakfast license is obtained. <coughs> 54 uh, 11 River Road um, could be used as a vacation rental unit with up to three bedrooms. This is a uh, dwelling unit which serves an entire group of travelers uh, without the owner being present. The requested regulations to limit the property to one VU, VRU can be sub, uh, approved since it actually meets the policies of official plan amendment 127. The applicant has requested that unit be permitted to have three guest rooms that would require one of the guest rooms to be uh, converted to storage or some other use. A license from the clerk's office would be required and at that time they would need to submit floor plans uh, showing that only three bedrooms would be used. Um, in addition, they're seeking certain uh, zoning regulations. Uh, those can be supported 
the request to have three parking spaces can be supported. There are five spaces shown on the property. So therefore it's recommended that the parking area off river lane be reduced by converting some of the gravel area to grass. With respect to site planning, the Grand View Inn is already subject to it. The existing registered site plan um, should council support the official plan and zoning amendments. Site plan would need to be altered to recognize the landscaped area, um, the removal of the landscaped area next to River Lane and the additional parking area that's illustrated in the photograph on the picture um, where the brick pavers and turf stone have been added and grass was removed. Um, this area should be modified though with either direct decorative fence or bumper blocks along River Lane to prevent traffic issues um, with vehicles using River Lane and should council support the property at 4465 Eastwood, a site plan agreement would be necessary to address landscaping and parking for that location. Uh, licensing, Grandview Inn was last licensed in um, 2015 as a tourist establishment, the city's licensing bylaw. Um, this license should be obtained again, uh, whether or not council approves the zoning. Uh, should the requested zoning for 4465 Eastwood Crescent as a satellite accommodation be approved, it would also need to be similarly licensed. Should council approve the requested zoning for 5411 River Road as a vacation rental unit, they would need a license which would be <coughs> issued to the property owners. And the licensing bylaw contains regulations that allow the city to suspend a license after three violation notices have been issued. Uh, so in conclusion, the amendment application submitted on behalf of 1140993 Canada Inc. and 1907782 Ontario Inc. and Alfred and Colette D'Souza um, are supported in part. The applications include uh, official plan amendment uh, to link these properties, request to permit um, Eastwood Crescent also to be linked. Um, so, um, where are we going? And so, the, um, okay. anyway, so uh, our recommendation is that council not approve the requested official plan and zoning amendment application in part to permit 4465 Eastwood Crescent as a satellite accommodation associated with Grandview Inn at 5359 River Road. The council approve official plan amendment and zoning amendment changes to the existing site specific uh, policy area designation and the current zoning to recognize the use of the property as an inn with eight individual bedrooms, four suites having two bedrooms each together with two meeting rooms and a breakfast room to uh, exclusively serve guests of the inn and the council approved the requested official plan amendment and zoning amendment for 54 11 River Road as a vacation rental unit having not more than three bedrooms. So those are the highlights of this report. I'll stop the screen share. Thank you for that, Mr. Herlovich. Um, I'm now looking to council for any comments or questions to Mr. Herlovich. Councilor Iannone. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Herlovich. Mr. Herlovich, in Mr. Vaca's letter, he makes the argument that because Mr. He Mr. Is, is it Zhu? Hugh, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, um, is purchasing the Eastwood Crescent property. Um, it would be under the same ownership. But my understanding is that's not your biggest objection. It is the fact that it makes it a commercial business akin to a hotel. And Mr. Vaca doesn't address that in his letter. Um, so am I right? Am I understanding that correctly? Mr. Levich? If you're speaking, we can't hear you. Yeah, I think Mr. Erlovich is fro he's yeah, frozen. Yeah, he's frozen. Mr. Erlovich, you might have to sign out and sign back in because uh, we cannot hear you. You're frozen. Is is he at City Hall? I don't think okay. he's here. Okay. I don't think he's here. Okay, so uh, Mr. Krulovich has signed out. We got to give him a minute to get back in, and then uh, we'll let him answer the question. Then I've got after that. Then we'll have Councillor Thompson. I got you up next. Yep. Yeah. 
joys of technology. There he is. Oh, there we go. Mr. Herlovich, there we go. Sorry, we didn't hear. If you said anything, we didn't hear anything. No, I, uh, Councillor Iannone was just starting a question and uh, I lost service, so I'm now on my iPad. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Councillor Iannone, if you want to repeat. He didn't hear you. Um, Mr. Herlovich, I just made the, the point that in Mr. Back's letter, he states that you were not of the, you didn't have the information that um, his client was going to purchase Eastwood. So the two different ownerships didn't factor in. But my understanding when it is that your opposition of that not, is not just because of the two ownerships, but because it almost creates a hotel, a hotel type business and a commercial business in that zoning. And for that reason, not simply because the ownership is separate, that you're not recommending the Eastwood satellite. Is that That's right? Correct. It's both of those. Yes. Okay, because he doesn't yes. address he doesn't address the hotel issue in his letter, just the ownership. <clears throat> yes. So I wanted we to have, make sure. Yeah, for clarification, Councillor, the um, through the worship through you, your worship, we had recommended previously joining um, Eastwood with Grandview Lodge at the time when we believed Grandview had uh, twelve rooms, but having examined the plans. And discovered that there are actually 17 rooms. And when you add four, four other rooms, we now have 21 rooms. And in is 19 rooms, between five and 19 rooms. Uh, once you get over 20 rooms, we count that as a hotel, or it's defined as a hotel or a motel through zoning. So, Mr. Hurley, they didn't tell you they had 17 rooms? Um, no. Okay. You, know, you, you have to count them up. Yeah, that's the history of this whole project. Councillor Thompson. Yes, thank you. Um, every time I hear from somebody who wants to do something in the city, I say, deal with City Hall staff and follow their direction. Uh, this situation is the most disastrous thing that I've ever seen happened in the city. You have uh, five um, properties connected to um, uh, an inn, which is uh, um, not legal. And uh, why are you recommending here for um, vacations, rentals. Um, we already passed the bylaw saying the vacation rentals, Airbnbs cannot be in residential areas. And you're recommending uh, a vacation rental in that area. And what are you calling the 4465 Eastwood? Um, the whole uh, river road has been really good over the past uh, decades simply because they were bread and bed and breakfast and uh, they were had the family uh, living in there and they controlled everything and now we got Airbnbs, they're driving our uh, bylaw enforcement people crazy tr with the complaints. And I don't know what the rest of you get, but uh, um, I get regularly um, um, vacation rentals, Airbnbs with 20 people in the backyard, uh, dancing and uh, noise and eating and uh, having all kinds of problems. And the people next door in a residential property are trying to put their kids to bed. And, and we're recommending that, uh, that 5411, and what about the other prop? There were five properties that we started out with these, 
Are they going to be vacation rentals too in residential areas? Um, I think this whole thing is a disaster. And uh, I think we got to protect the people, residential, single family properties. And uh, the only thing that could solve this is bed and breakfast with the people living in the properties. Um, I'd like to see how Mr. Herlovich is recommending vacation rentals um, beside um, residential property. In fact, uh, I just got on my phone um, an, an email from Ann Wethews, um, who lives next door to this, and uh, we never got it, and uh, the totally against it. And we're recommending this vacation rentals. Um, I, I can't believe that uh, we're talking about this today. I'd like Let's to get hear. you an answer. Let's get you an answer, Councillor Thompson. So, yeah, uh, Mr. Herlovich, uh, so Councillor Thompson asking for recommendation three, where you're suggesting we approve the um, vacation rental unit at 5411 River Road. So, Councillor Thompson's asking uh, and why the, and also the Also, the, um, the 14465 East, Eastwood. Why is that special? That's yep. that should be a bed and breakfast. Period. Oh, okay, so to you, ahead, your Mr. worship. Yep. Go right ahead. Yep. Yes. The uh, with respect to four four six five Eastwood, staff is not recommending that that property be rezoned. So it would remain zoned R two dash two, which is the same as all the other properties on River Road. So it would be a dwelling occupied by an owner who could have up to four rooms uh, that he could rent to tourists as a bed and breakfast, provided he was licensed. The owner does have to live there, as the councillor pointed out. With respect to uh, 54, uh, 11 River Road, so the policies the council adopted basically said, in a residential zone, you have to apply for an official plan amendment and a zoning amendment. And if you apply for those, then you have to meet certain tests. We just heard from Suzanne McDonald and Paul Lowe speaking about this with respect to cannabis. So the, the test basically said, you know, if you are in a location close to tourist attractions, River Road's not that far from Queen Victoria Park and the tourist core. If you can have sufficient land to accommodate all the parking, they would require three parking spaces. In fact, the zoning requires only two. They're asking for three. They have part five parking spaces shown. The, um, with respect to no undue concentration, the closest uh, VRU to this property is 300 meters away. Um, there are eight altogether within a, a kilometer. Um, that was not seen as an undue concentration. Council might feel differently about that um, as well. Uh, there was that the vacancy rate should not be affected. So the removal of one dwelling unit um, when the vacancy rate has come up to 2.3 was not seen as uh, a significant impact on housing. So it met those criteria or those tests. And uh, so therefore, um, we had to conclude that it since it met the test, it could be supported. And that was the basis of our recommendation. Hey, Councillor Thompson, does that answer your question? Uh, not at all. Um, I can't believe they're coming out and recommending um, after what? What's the LPAT going to do with our bylaw if we start approving uh, vacation rentals uh, in residential areas, and we have a bylaw over there? waiting for a year and a half for them to make a decision. And it says no Airbnbs, no 
um, vacation rentals in single family residential areas. You know, just because um, a quarter of a mile you got the tourist industry, um, I, that doesn't uh, make any sense to me. These people uh, have residential properties and and all you got to do is read the paper once in a while uh, what Airbnbs and vacation rentals are doing. Um, the unknown people being there, there's been murders, there's been parties from, uh, I got one 20 people from Toronto in the backyard uh, partying all night and that doesn't work. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. I've got uh, back to Councillor Iannone. Councillor Thompson, that's taking place with a stay-at-home order. I, I hear from the same neighborhood who has the same Airbnb that's packed every weekend on a stay-at-home order and the parties are happening nonstop. But, but my question through you to Mr. Herlovich is, um, in your report, you stated that there was a public meeting well, I was the one counselor at that public, the Zoom public meeting. And the air, the um, vacation rental that you're recommending on River Road beside the West Hughes, that wasn't even discussed in that public meeting. Like there was, it. I don't believe it was proposed at the time. Am, is, am I correct? To you, Your Worship. Uh, it was one of the properties that was to be connected to the in as a satellite property and they were going to send guests from the inn down to stay in that property but they weren't asking it to be a vacation rental unit that's new to this revised application so were the residents informed and did they have an opportunity to comment since then till now uh, they were informed through a written notice that was sent out and yes they uh, responded and basically voiced opposition to uh, a vacation rental unit, much the same as Councillor Thompson has stated. Well, Councillor Thompson's not wrong. This application has been so long in the tooth and the Grand View Inn, while it might be building now as a permit, at one point was not building with a permit and was allowed to continue. Like the, this, this one application has been a mess from start to finish. And it's affecting people on River Road and the, and the surrounding areas um, who want to live in a quiet residential area. So I, I'm hoping that council turns down this, this uh, both uh, Eastwood and uh, the vacation rental beside it, but I'll wait till the meeting's closed. Okay, um, any other questions of staff at this point? <clears throat> okay, seeing none. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the local appeal planning, uh, the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. <clears throat> failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendment. So, Mr. Clerk, I understand we do have some people that would like to speak to this. Uh, yes, Your Worship, we do have about, uh, I'd say, about 12 to 15 residents who did ask to speak. Uh, you have there in front of you a list of those. We could go through that list. Uh, of course, the preamble that uh, I had given to these residents is that our procedural bylaw does speak about limiting their comments to five minutes or less. And as you usually do, Your Worship, uh, reminding those speakers that uh, if, if possible, that they not repeat anything that had already been discussed by or mentioned by a previous speaker, just to uh, uh, try and save a little bit of time here before council makes their decision. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clerk. So I go to my list here and I see the first speaker is John Garrett. Uh, Mr. Garrett, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. All right, welcome to the call. Um, you've got five minutes, and if you've got any comments or questions, this is your opportunity. 
Okay, um, I'm not going to take five minutes. I submitted a letter to uh, to all of you by via email. I trust you all got it and you've read it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also asked Bill Matson today uh, whether he's included it in your package because I believe I got it in too late. Um, but a couple of comments that I want to comment there, as uh, Mr. Thompson has said, uh, this thing has been crazy right from the get from the get go. Uh, seems like a bit of a shell game to me. And uh, the five properties that were in the original proposal um, doesn't seem to be any uh, guarantee that those won't continue to operate as they currently do uh, illegally. Um, there are currently reviews uh, online of these properties that have had a cease and desist order uh, are still being reviewed by people who have stayed there within the last three months. Uh, I find that uh, kind of hard to believe in this. Um, I'm very concerned with uh, not only the parking in this, this situation, now we've been uh, added 17 rooms to this uh, this operation that seemed to have been slipped in the back door. Uh, again, a bit of a shell game. Uh, is there parking for all of these extra rooms, meeting rooms? Uh, where are they going to, if they can, if they can uh, sleep 40 people or have 40 people in uh, the dining room or in these meeting rooms, uh, where are they all going to park? Um, I believe that the uh, the property on uh, 5411 River Road should be excluded from this uh, application completely. It's a completely different uh, property owned by a completely different person. Uh, I think they should apply if they wish to apply for a license for a bed and breakfast or rezoning for a, a vacation rental unit. It should be done under a separate uh, application, not this one. Um, I, I wonder about uh, some of the things that have happened. The, uh, the excess height on this building, it's an extra three meters high. Um, was that done uh, prior to construction or was that application uh, for the, uh, the zoning or the uh, height bylaw to be changed uh, subsequent to uh, stop work order? And uh, is this just continuing with the the whole mess that this situation has uh, created. Um, as I say in my letter to all of you, I'm totally against this. I live on a street, uh, a number of streets up, but in the same residential area. I believe I have 10 bed and breakfasts on my street, uh, about two or three illegal unlicensed uh, vacation rental units, a couple absentee owners, and if you pass this uh, bylaw and allow uh, satellite units, whatever you call it, a hybrid in, uh, ghost hotels, whatever you'd like to call it, um, it affects my street. Um, I can see a number of uh, hotels or a number of houses here, vacant, vacant houses that are owned by absentee owners renting their rooms to, uh, to the adjacent B&Bs. I think uh, I've had conversations with my neighbors who've uh, all expressed that they're considering leaving uh, leaving the, the area and, and moving elsewhere because it's uh, come to such a condition here. We've had an overdose death on our uh, street by uh, people that have stayed uh, in B&Bs here during this uh, pandemic uh, time. Uh, we've had drug busts on the street because of it. Uh, there's families here with little children that are just abhorred by what's going on. Uh, um, I, I just pray that you uh, vote this down and uh, let's get back to normal. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Garrett. Appreciate it. Okay, next we have uh, Ken Westhues. Mr. Westhues, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, yes we do, yes we do. Well, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councilors. In your agenda and the associated Dropbox file, planning staff have provided you and the public with lots of information on the 
Niagara Grandview Manor application. I want to highlight an important piece of information that is obscure on the city's website and that the public is mostly in the dark about. Planning staff and many residents have given you many compelling reasons why the, yes, this application should be denied. Most basic reason, however, is that the official revised application submitted to the city on April 22nd gave false information about the ownership of the main property, the large inn at 5359 River Road. It gave the impression that John Pinter still owns it. Having obtained true information from public, provincial, and federal records, I emailed Mr. Herlovich on May 7th, saying that so far as I could tell, the inn is no longer owned by John Pinter, but by a Markham resident named Richard Shuey, who was not identified as owner by name or signature on the application form. Mr. Herlovich promptly replied that he was consulting the city's legal department. He replied again a few hours later saying he, quote, wished to confirm that I am now in possession of title and mortgage information associated, end of quote, with the file and that he had asked for corrections and revisions to the application. The result is that the city's Dropbox file now includes, anybody can go see, the revised application dated April 22nd, plus a revised, revised application dated May 20th that gives the true information on ownership, including Mr. Shuey's signature as owner. The now corrected false information on ownership has two main implications. Mr. Herlovich cites one of them in his recommendation against joining the little house that Mr. Pinter still owns and the big house that Mr. Shuey now owns into a single inn. More basic implication of the false information on ownership is that it tends to discredit the entire application. Falsifying ownership is serious business. The licensing bylaw this council passed at last month's meeting states in section 7.1.g that one ground for refusing a B&B or a vacation rental license is that the applicant, quote, has submitted an application or other documents to the city containing false statements, incorrect, incomplete, or misleading information. As I read the bylaw, by falsifying ownership of the main property in the application on April 22nd, Mr. Pinter disqualified himself from holding a license to operate a B&B or vacation rental in this city. Similarly, disqualified are the tag-along owners who signed the April 22nd application, Alfred and Colette de Souza, owners of the house at 5411 River Road. The de Souza's ignored the cease and desist order sent to them by the city on September 14th, 2017, and have continued ever since to lease this property to John Pinter as an illegal vacation rental unit an extension of Grandview Manor. Thereby, they put themselves on the wrong side of the licensing bylaw, where section 7.1.B states as a ground for denying a license that the applicant has passed breaches or contraventions of any law or bylaw associated with carrying on such a business. That the staff report recommends approval of the D'Souza's house as a vacation rental is a further example of city officials being hoodwinked. The application says this would be an independently operated vacation rental. The new bylaws proposed make no mention of Grandview Manor or John Pinter. The staff report accepts all this at face value, asserting that the D'Souza's house would be a quote, standalone vacation rental unit with no association with the Grandview Inn. Somebody in planning must have been having a bad day. John Pinter is Alfred and Colette de Souza's agent in the application at hand. He has been illegally lodging guests in the de Souza's house for the past four years. The house is even now advertised as part of Grandview Manor on its website. And Alfred de Souza has put all this in writing in a letter to the city. 
planning staff should not let themselves be made fools of by a rezoning application that is obviously untruthful. If council were to legalize the D'Souza's house as a vacation rental, it would make a mockery of the official plan amendment it passed in 2018 that directs vacation rentals to commercial districts. What is proposed today would turn the whole River Road neighborhood in this respect into a commercial district. And council could expect one application after another to legalize an existing illegal vacation rental or turn a family home into a new one. I ask you to deny this application unequivocally, no ifs, ands, or buts, no wiggle room, and let the new owner of Niagara Grandview Manor, Richard Chewy, get to work obtaining a license and running the business successfully according to the bylaws council passed for it in 2015, as well as fire health and safety codes. Once he has done that, if he makes a new and truthful rezoning application, council can deal with it then. Thanks to all of you. If any of you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Hey, thank you for that, Mr. Westhus. I do have a question from Councilor Iannone. <clears throat> Through you to Mr. Herlovich. Mr. Herlovich, um, Mr. Westhus is pretty concise in everything that he just read us, including grounds for refusal, which are in our own, that we passed in our own bylaws. How is it that an application that clearly was false, that was clearly submitted to mislead you, that had to be highlighted by a resident, is still before council and automatically Mr. Zui doesn't have to come back to us on his own with an application? Because those lists of, um, I, I don't even know how, past, um, con um, illegal operations, uh, that's the best word I could find for it, I'm sorry. Um, the best predictor of the future is the past. I mean, we haven't had one thing up and up with Grandview since this whole debacle started. So why is this application, and you, we know that they submitted lies, that's the best word you can come, come with there. Why is it before us? Why are you recommending it? Like, I don't understand. If they if they did not comply, if they were, gave us false statements and that and that's an incomplete information and that's grounds for refusal, why are you recommending um, the River Road in Grandview? It makes no sense to me. Mr. Herlovich, did you want to uh, respond to that? Yeah, so you, your worship, the, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate that Mr. West Hughes did uh, uh, find this information passed it on to us. As he outlined, I checked with our legal department. They were able to confirm that for us. Uh, we had the application revised. Um, so Mr. S um, Mr. D'Souza and uh, Colette D'Souza um, did sign the application. That application was, that property was part of the original application. And <laughs> therefore we considered it as part of the revision that was uh, allowed in February. So um, they revised the information, they, the correct people signed the application and that's why it's before you. Okay, go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. To me, that just opens the door for anybody who wants to submit anything, truthful or not. And when you're caught, because they didn't volunteer volunteer the information to you. Mr. Westhues had to point it out. You had to then contact them. They then told you the truth. That sets a really ugly precedent for anybody who wants to apply to the city and thinks, well, it, it really doesn't matter whether I am supplying false statements or incomplete information, because at the end, I'm going to come back to a mea culpa and it's going to be presented to council anyway. And when we were dealing, and Mr. West Hughes's um, comments on the D'Souza's, or on that D'Souza property is absolutely correct. At, we didn't even know Mr. Pinter didn't own all those properties that he was submitting for his satellite until a resident pointed it out. This is not one small um, misleading statement. This is a history of misleading to the city. And this sets a really 
ugly precedent for any development or anybody who wants to come before council in the future. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Iannone. I've got Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, further to uh, Councillor Iannone's comments to Alex. Alex, why, why weren't we informed of this information? Are you working for us or are you working for them? Well, to you, Your Worship, I'm not sure which which information is the counselor. Well, the fact that they were all they were all uh, illegal. The ownership was in the wrong names. Uh, everything that that Mr. <coughs> Westerhoof told us, uh, you used that to correct it. <laughs> so, Mr. Westhues copied that letter where he identified who the correct owners were to all of you as counselors. I responded to Mr. West Hughes in a reply all button and acknowledged that the information he had supplied was correct. So therefore you were informed. Hey, Councillor? Why wasn't that part of the report tonight? Mr. Ulovich? The application was corrected and Mr. West Hughes confirmed that that was so, um, and he identified that that information is available in the drop box provided by the city. So it was a correct application when it's here at council tonight. You know, you have all the information and I'm sure you'll make the decision that is best for um, the community. Well, uh, also in the drop box, uh, I've got this letter that I'm looking at right now that Mr. Pinter sent most recently. And it was sent to all members of council except Councillor Iannone, Councillor Lococo, and myself. And in it, he makes reference to uh, the, the common comment from neighbors is why why did Ken Westerhoos move? Uh, sorry, the danger with Ken Westerhoos and his gang of left wing anarchists. Now, I'm assuming that the three of us were included in that because he didn't send the email to us. And I'm offended by it. And I think it's a further representation of all the dirty, underhand, illegal stuff that's gone on. And I'm not supporting this at all. No way, shape, or form. Okay, hey, thank you, Councillor. Uh, we got back to Councillor Iannone. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I do not mean to be through you to Mr. Hurlerich. Mr. Hurlerich, I do not mean to be, appear to be beating you up tonight. There has been zero answer from Councillor Campbell's question, to Councillor Thompson's question, or mine, if that if this application had false statements, were incomplete, and misdirected um, the truth, how did it end up coming to Council? Because at the end of the day, I'd like to think that you are the stopgap at the ground for refusal and the false statements. There has been zero penalty for a false statement or misleading counsel. You just revised the application and brought it back. So what is the point of having us having passed that bylaw? Because to me, you should, this is me. I'm just my opinion. You should have refused that. You should have said, um, I'm not amending it. You misled us. You supplied false information. It was not complete. I'm not accepting this application. You haven't answered that direct question on how was he allowed to do that from any of the three of us. So I, I, I don't mean to berate this, this point, but it shouldn't be here. So I believe Mr. West Hughes, and I'm afraid I don't have the bylaw in front of me that he was citing, but I believe he was citing from the licensing bylaw, which is not what council is dealing with tonight. But that's, you know, I, I am the first one to say I was shocked to find that the information 
was um, was incorrect. Um, we went to their um, planning representative and had the information corrected. The correct information was put on the, the website. Mr. Pinter's letter, that letter I received through the mayor's office today, it did not come directly to me. It was sent to, and I didn't realize, select select councillors. And I immediately forwarded that to the clerk's office. And that's how it came to be in your package today. You know, if you want full disclosure, our report says that we believe that Mr. Sue owns the Grandview Inn and Mr. Pinter owns the Eastwood property. I didn't learn that they were there was an option to purchase each or Eastwood property by Mr. Sue until um, Mr. Vaca submitted a letter. So, um, <clears throat> and normally we do process applications when there are, um, are offers to purchase, but usually those are accompanied by an offer to uh, to uh, purchase submitted to our office so that we can see there is a legitimate um, um, application. I have not seen that. And I did not change my report, um, despite the fact that Mr. Vaca submitted information saying that there is, I'm not even sure that's an offer to purchase. It's some sort of a, an agreement between them. So that you want full disclosure, there's some more for you. So Mr. Mayor, do I still have the floor? Yes, you do. So Alex, that just makes it 10 times worse. <laughs> it, it, there's, there's absolutely no trust or accountability in this action before us. And let me tell you, I've been called a lot worse than a left wing anarchist in this council chamber. And I wear that badge proudly. I could care less. And, but it, interestingly enough that the three people who have been most vocal against this were not included in the letters. Like, and his letter states, I want to thank the, all you guys for supporting this. I really haven't seen that around this table. I, I, I've pretty much seen a lot of questions, but not, not many answers. But I did just get a message from a resident who asked, then why were the residents not sent the corrected documents? Why is it Mr. Westhues had to let them all know? <clears throat> so there are there are so, so many questions in regards to what we enforce, what we don't enforce, um, the legitimacy of applications, <laughs> um, whether you have to be truthful or not. Pretty much this application shows you don't have to be truthful. When you get caught, it'll just be amended. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of doing that, Mr. Herlovich. I have no doubt you were as surprised as the rest of us, but I don't think this should be in front of council. I think it should have been should have been denied just on the basis that we have been misled from start to finish. Okay, if we don't have any further questions, I'll move down the list. Uh, Linda Manson, Miss Manson, are you are you here? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. My apologies. Deborah Jackson, are you there, Miss Jackson? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you fine. So welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Thompson, first off, for addressing the kinds of activity that happens in these establishments, because I'm going to be talking about that in my presentation. Um, so my name is Deborah Jackson, and I've lived in every corner of this city over my lifetime and I've lived in the River Road neighborhood for 17 years. Those of us living in the River Road neighborhood are used to sharing our neighborhood with tourists as the licensed owner operated bed and breakfast are part of the fabric of our community and we love it. It's always been that way. But our peaceful River Road community along with many other communities that exist within the city of Niagara Falls has been eroded by the advent of agencies such as Airbnb, Niagara Smart Stays, Home Away, etc., where absentee property owners rent out their vacant properties without on site supervision. We have endured countless sleepless nights, made numerous complaints to the police about noise and disturbances, 
complain to our city council about bylaw infractions and neglect of property and garbage to no avail. When I spoke to a councillor last spring during what was supposed to be a provincial lockdown about an out of control house full of drunken people disturbing the neighborhood in one such establishment, I suggested that unless the bylaw officer would evict them to not bother sending them because I didn't want to get shot. I was only half joking. Sadly, but not surprising, that level of violence in the worst case scenario became a reality a few months ago when 20 year old Juli Juliana Panuzio and 18 year old Christina Crooks were shot and killed in a short term rental just a few kilometers upriver. We hear these stories in the news from time to time, but this pr hits pretty close to home. And I think you are all aware of some of the articles that go around in the paper. Um, and there are programs for the hotel operators to be aware of some of the kinds of activities that are happening, such as human trafficking. And so they're aware of these things in these unre unregulated Airbnbs. I can bet you that's not happening. So as a council, you need to consider every possible outcome when you give carte blanche to operators of such accommodation establishments. Mr. Pinter's proposal to run his business out of vacant homes in a residential area is courting trouble. As omnipotent as he may feel he is, those of us who live in the real world understand that nobody can be in two places at once and his operation is no better than any other illegally run short-term rental operation within this city. Inventing a new designation such as the hybrid model or the satellite site doesn't change that fact. The contribution his operation brings to our community by running his business out of vacant residential properties is negligible. I hardly think adding a few chambermaid jobs to our economy can be considered a fair exchange for the trouble that such short-term rental operations bring. And I'm pretty sure that by expecting Mr. Pinter to operate within the existing council approved bylaws that the hotels can, can absorb his overflow. I'm asking this council to not compromise public safety and the quality of life for the law-abiding citizens of Niagara Falls and stop enabling the operators of illegal short-term rentals such as John Pinter's and deny this application. Okay, thank, thank you. you very, sorry, are you finished? I am, That's thank you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, uh, next um, do we have Ken and Janice Crossman. Mr. and Mrs. Crossman, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, you may be muted. We can't hear you if you're speaking. Our techie people are telling us that you're muted to uh, Ken and Janice Crossman. You'll have to unmute. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry, I, I didn't know quite what to do. Okay, uh, no thank problem. you very welcome, much. Welcome to the call. Okay, thank you for thank the opportunity. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say because we we had several requests for accurate diagrams or representation of how many rooms there were and what the square footage was, uh, we had to just guess what it was. And then when we saw he had 17 rooms uh, on his online site, as well as a new owner does, uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed that a building inspector would not know how many rooms he had there. The other thing is that he has all these parking spaces that are proposed, but they don't exist right now. So I, I don't understand why I, I had a dental office. I had to when I built my office, I had to have so many parking spaces available the day that I started my practice, not 
in the future. And it seems like from having his name on this thing and not letting anybody know until Ken found out and the height re restrictions that he changed and having 17 rooms when it, everyone else thought he was having 12, like you can't trust this guy as far as you can throw him. So I, I don't understand why they're giving him the benefit of the doubt and really truly believe he is going to do what he says he will do. He's proven that he does not tell the truth and he, he doesn't respect any of the site plans or laws that you, you have given him to follow. He doesn't do it. Oops, Ollie, like, if I could just ask you not to make the comments personal to the individual. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Please. Yeah, I apologize. You. Okay, so like, and like, to me, it seems like there's been many things that he's put in there, like the extra parking. He didn't ask for permission to do that. They just did it. When I talked to Mr. Hurlovich, he said he wasn't uh, informed that he was doing this paving stone area. And now they're just going to let him have it. Uh, the height restriction, they, he went above and beyond what the height restriction was in the, the variance. And then the 17 rooms instead of 12. And then it seems like anything he wants to do, he just does. And then they say, oh, it's okay, we'll just change this and you can do it. So I don't understand why there's one law for him and another law for the rest of the citizens in, in, in Niagara Falls. And, you know, we were there when the, the city council put to a vote where that they should let him operate that place without a license and council actually voted against their own bylaw. So I don't have much faith in city council. <clears throat> you don't seem to enforce your bylaws. And it really seems like something shady is going on here for this to get this far. The other thing I do not understand, it says that he has 17 rooms. It says 12 rooms, four suites with two bedrooms, plus a bedroom for the uh, person, the manager, and then two guests, two uh, meeting rooms or whatever. But that makes more than 17 bedrooms. That's like, and where, where will all these people park? And, and plus, where will his staff park? Where will the people that cut his lawn or do the constant construction on his building park? So I, I've talked to planning. I've talked to bylaw enforcement. All through COVID, he was renting rooms. You, you can look at your records. I, I've reported that so many times. And I don't know, I don't think he was cited or fined for anything. So what good is a bylaw if you don't enforce it? And, and we're supposed to have, when we make a complaint as a neighbor, they say, well, all you have to do is document it, send it in, and we'll take care of it. It doesn't happen. It's like, okay, you did it, nothing happens. So why should we have any faith in your bylaws or city council to protect us? We elected you, you're supposed to represent us. Well, I'm just going to comment on that, that our bylaw in defense of our bylaw, if they get called, they always inspect. They don't ever not inspect. Okay, so you don't I, have to tell me if he had, was how much the fine was, but was he ever fined for booking I people? Don't, I, don't, I don't know that. That I don't know. Well, I but, don't think he was because he continued I, I, to do it. Well, I truthfully don't know, but I can tell you our bylaw is fantastic. <clears throat> I can, can tell you it is, and I live right beside him. Because if he had an, you had an effective bylaw, would he continue to rent for three months? Well, I don't know the specifics. I just want to say that anyone that calls our bylaw about an, an issue, well, they they investigate all. Okay, of I, I, you can have your opinion about your bylaw, but as a person that lives two doors down from him, your bylaw is not effective or it, it's not enforced. And from where, where I sit, it's not enforced. Okay. And for the council to vote against your own bylaw that you guys enacted so he could operate that place legally for five years or so, I don't understand that. Can you, can you answer that, please? Uh, what's the question? Are you making a statement or are you asking a question? Okay, the question is, I forget when it was a year or so ago, he was told to cease and desist because he didn't have 
a license to operate. And the, you gave him a letter and he kept on operating. But I, I remember, I think when he was, they said, it was another, the time before they said, well, we're gonna let it slide because he's working with the planning department to change things. So we're gonna wait until we change our bylaws and we're not gonna charge him with operating illegally. And you guys voted to let him operate, continue, even though he didn't have a, a license. Well, I can't remember specifically at this point how we rationalized Carol it. Remember. Pardon me? I think Carol remembers and Mr. Campbell remembers and Mrs. Lococo remembers. Okay, well, you know what? Basically today we're dealing with the recommendations in front of us. So are you, uh, I'm assuming you're opposed to two of I them? I think it should be totally rejected. He lied. The only reason that that document got changed was because Mr. West Hughes told Mr. Hurlovich. The only reason Mr. Hurlovich knew there were 17 rooms was because a couple of us found out online. So why are you rewarding someone who falsifies documents and just letting them get away with it? That, that, that's a precedent for anybody in the future can lie and they could say, well, how can you punish me? You let that person get away with it, just amend it, it's okay. I don't know, maybe I'll just ask Mr. Hurlovich if you can help me out here answering this question on, uh, uh, on, on how we were continuing in on with the situation that we've been in with, with this Grandview. Right, so what, what Dr. Crossman is saying is that um, we received complaints from Mr. West Hughes and others and council instructed Mr. Pinter to submit an application and they gave him a date by the end of, I believe it was September. I can't tell you which year. Um, and we did receive an application on October the 1st. Um, the application was incomplete. So we began working with Mr. Pinter to get a completed application. Um, yes, he continued to operate. This is something that, um, the city does with every application. So if they are working through a zoning process, we <clears throat> basically do not take them to court because we're basically trying to get compliance by taking them to court. And one of the ways of getting compliance is getting zoning approval. So we were working, working with Mr. Pinter. I can't tell you how many emails or phone calls I made to his planning consultant to try and bring that application forward. Um, it did take forever. I'm gonna say a year. Uh, so we did have then the application that we began processing, which was the Grandview Inn with the five satellite units. Uh, we brought that to council recommending against it in February, that was deferred. And the uh, revised application came in We've all heard of the misleading information that was supplied in the application. Um, I had inspectors go to the property at the beginning of March because of allegations that rooms were still being rented. And the um, um, I was told that there were only three rooms that were even fit for habitation in the existing uh, or the old part of the property, the, the existing house. Um, Mr. Crossman or Dr. Crossman sent in photographs um, indicating cars parked on the turf stone and the um, brick pavers uh, where landscaping was supposed to be. I had bylaw enforcement officers go out to the property and uh, determine whether or not uh, those people were workmen staying or working on the property or whether they were um, people staying on the property. We were told that there was no one staying there. Um, so we have been investigate, investigating this. We have been following this. Um, you know, we have been trying to get resolution on this. Um, you know, it's not, not been the 
uh, easiest application that we've dealt with, but it's not necessarily the most difficult one that we've had over the years. But certainly, um, you know, the um, you know what we're trying to do is get resolution and bring the property into compliance, set some laws that we actually can enforce, um, so that um, you know the the bylaws actually state what we we intend you know with respect to an inspector going out there a building inspector and why he can't count 17 rooms the rooms are arranged as i described in my report there are four rooms with two two bedrooms each so there is a door and when you open that door you step into a vestibule there are uh, two more doors one door to each bedroom. And so the intent is that that would be operated as a suite. But I cannot say that, you know, if I showed up there and needed one room and they said, go through this first door and your room is the door on the right, that that wouldn't be my room. But that's not how the drawings were laid out. Um, so if the building inspector is going there, he's going to be shown one room with uh, two sleeping chambers. And so um, whether there are doors on there, whether he's able to identify those at the time of the inspection, I can't say for sure. Um, all I can say is that at the beginning of March, when the building inspector went through there, the building was not fit for habitation. Okay, fair enough. But how in the future can someone effectively regulate if he's doing four suites that have two bedrooms or he's renting them all out singly? Well, I guess that's the reason in the report we recommend let's identify what it is that he has and let's say that he has, you know, four suites of two bedrooms. So but how do you regulate if he is telling lies? and he is renting rooms yeah. out legally. Well, you Mr. Pinter no longer owns the building, but okay. I don't know the current operator. Well, I don't know. I, I just, I give up. I thought you guys knew what you're doing. Thank you for your time. Yeah, and, and in fairness, Mr. Crossman, we, our staff are very professional. It's not an easy task, as you can see, but I appreciate your input. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to um, Linda Manson. Uh, Ms. Manson, are you here? Yeah, Ms. Manson, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah now we can hear you. Welcome, welcome to the meeting. Uh, Thank we've you got, so much. We've got, yeah, we've got five minutes for you, so it's all yours. Thank you so much. I'm. First of all, councillors, uh, what you have before you tonight are troubling issues, uh, attempts to relaunch a supposedly scaled down version of the hybrid in idea, as well as legalize a vacation rental unit in a residential neighborhood. The holy grail of taxpayer betrayal. The twist in the hybrid in scheme this time is twofold. Mr. Pinter no longer owns it, but more importantly, the true size of the inn has now been revealed through inspection. It's really important to note that Staff's prior recommendation to approve the Eastwood satellite was based on the end having only what special policy 32 allowed, and that was the maximum of 12 rooms for the tourists. Of course, now we know they have 17. I would, um, I would like to make note on something that was said. Um, the term, Mr. Uh, Herlovich made, made reference to the term of bringing the, the end into compliance. Um, Sorry, it's the other way around. You're about to change bylaws to fit what he has already grown into. Um, we have now, um, staff has advised it violates the official plan and cannot be supported regardless of who owns the inn or Eastwood. Beyond that, several things give cause for concern. If this were truly a site specific satellite proposal, Eastwood only, why is the five satellite planning justification report still in the city drop box? 
the one stating satellite buildings will be located no further than 200 meters from the main building. The whole proposal still smacks of being a 200 meter Trojan horse of more satellites to be unleashed in stages in this neighborhood. That report also states in future the proposal can be applied to other areas of the city, hybrid ends in any neighborhood. This case would set the precedent and it's based on denial of reality. At the public open house online, Mr. Pinter and his reps repeatedly denied these satellites were a commercial use of properties because that would in fact be illegal in this or any residential neighborhood. To get around that, his February quest for amendments to permit a use of residential properties prohibited by our city's official plan and bylaws you put in place to protect the integrity of residential zones. When it became clear that route was doomed, deferral, failure to show now four months later, Mr. Pinter wants you to deny the reality that satellite units are a commercial use and violate the official plan over his plans for the inn he sold in March. Plus now he wants you to change the official plan for a property he leases to make it a legal independent vacation rental unit. It's been running rogue for years as you've heard. <clears throat> If it's truly intended to be independent, no longer a satellite wannabe, why is it still in this package? Why is Mr. Pinter agent for it all? This ongoing mess has made a mockery of Niagara Falls Council gave Mr. Pinter a 30 day de deadline 21 months ago. He's been operating illegally during that time and several years prior imposing creeping commercialization on a residential neighborhood with zero enforcement, zero consequences of breaking laws you put in place operating the inn without a license since 2015, operating in violation of fire code, operating illegal vacation rentals, failing to comply with your order to cease and desist. Removal of the inn's online advertising to, for those off-site properties was part of the cease and desist order. It's still there. When bylaw enforcement was advised three months ago, they replied, just <laughs> because they're advertising doesn't mean they're booking. That kind of non-enforcement is ridiculous, ridiculous as these proposals. This hybrid in model is a clever scheme to unleash a new insidious variant of vacation rental units. Satellites scattered around a residential neighborhood undermining hotels and motels comprising 40% of our tax base, replacing legal B&Bs, removing housing and residential rental units, tearing the fabric of a neighborhood apart at the seams. Hopefully you will not allow any part of it on your watch, now or ever, here or anywhere. The River Road Satellite District definition needs to change. That phrase, alternative accommodations of that nature needs to go before it gives rise to any more ins or wordsmith attempts to bend <clears throat> legal reality. Niagara Falls now has B&Bs and vacation rental units, period. One belongs there, one doesn't. The 11 cot cottage rental dwellings grandfathered in are enough. Finally, kudos to staff for cutting to the core of the multi-property hybrid concept last time and respectfully, I'm sorry, and rightfully rejecting it on solid, solid legal grounds, defensible at LPAT in terms of policy and principles of good planning and for rejecting the Eastwood sat satellite this time now that the inspections have revealed it in its true size. As for staff actually recommending you approve that vacation rental unit, I implore you to reject it loud and clear for all to hear or be prepared to approve one next door to your home next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mason. Next, uh, we've got James Black. Mr. Black, are you there? I changed the one thing because it had to be mentioned. He said he was bringing it into compliance. It's not. It's changing the rules. To Linda, the you're... You're still online. There we go. Uh, James Black, are you there? Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep, yeah, we can hear you now. James, welcome to the council meeting. You, the next five minutes are yours. Awesome. First of all, I'd like to you know kind of say that a lot of these comments kind of more sound like a, a personal attack more than uh, anything in regards to this application. Um, second of all, uh, you know, one person we're really not thinking about is the tourist. Uh, I'm sure. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have been down to that property or not, but it's actually quite beautiful. Um, he takes very good care of all his properties. They're all very manicured. Um, I don't know if you've met, ever met the in, the in care or the chef, but he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And, you know, he really bleeds for that place. So um, the properties are very well maintained. They're very well kept. And it's actually a really cool concept, you know, something that uh, a tourist or a guest would probably appreciate coming down and uh, visiting our city. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, Jay Azri, Jay Azri, Kanan. Jay Azri, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. So welcome to the council meeting. You've got the next five minutes, up to the next five minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor. Actually, my name is Jay Shrikan, and I'm owned, uh, also one of the bed and breakfast across the um, Grand View Manor. Um, so we moved since 2018, uh, you know, the past three years. We never faced any issues or concerns of his operation of any kind. And I don't know those, uh, you know, they have to get the proper licensing on that other that's all the other side. Um, as a person, you know, um, absolutely, he know what he is doing, and also, um, you know, it's never negatively impacted by his operation. And then, you know, if someone was to be negatively impacted, it basically it's us. So, um, yet we have never been faced uh, with any troubles or issues. Um, so. You know, um, yeah, it's, um, he know like, uh, you know, what type of people he is inviting and then never allow the group like uh, partying and stuff like that. So we never face any issues of like violence or any noise and stuff like that. So yeah, um, pretty much uh, that's what I wanted to comment on that. And uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, next up, um, Susan Wall. Susan, are you there? Okay. Hello, Susan, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, I do, yes. Okay, um, Susan Wall. Hi, Susan. Welcome um, to the call. You've got the next up to five minutes. Yeah, Susan. Yep, perfect. I live at 5421 River Lane, right in front of um, or behind 5401 River Lane. And um, I've lived in Niagara Falls most of my life, working in the tourist industry from restaurant to hotels for the last 20 years. I managed the, um, uh, was previously the Travel Lodge on Ferry Street. It's now going to be a Fairfield Marriott for six years as operations manager. So I. I know the industry and I've never had an issue with any of this. Um, we don't really have a, um, a residential area where we live right now, where these places are. There's no real families or anything, they're all individuals living and never had any issues since John's taken over. I um, appreciate the screening he does for the people that stay there we haven't had the wild parties and stuff that uh, were with the previous owners and um, I support his application I the other person said I don't really know the ins and outs of any of the illegal stuff but I certainly um, have never had an issue with any people staying there and um, yeah if it would bother anybody, it would be bothering me because I live, there's only three houses that face River Lane and I'm right in the middle. I'm the middle one. So if it would bother anybody, it would definitely be bothering me and it doesn't. So I just wanted to say that and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, we're looking for Don, Don Herman. Is Don there? Hello, Don, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, we can hear you. That's great. So um, you welcome to the council meeting. You've got up to the next five minutes. My name is Don Herman. I'm retired. I live at 4478 Eastwood Crescent. I speak for myself and for Rupal Dadrawala, who owns two properties, 4478 uh, Eastwood Crescent and 44. 4468 Eastwood Crescent. And we have no issues at all because I've lived here for 10 years. It's a very quiet neighborhood. 
and other than traffic that's picked up on Eastwood Crescent due to people coming through from Victoria Avenue to River Road, there's no difference. It's been the same. So that's about okay. all I have to say. Thank okay, you. that's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Herman. <clears throat> Next up, we are looking for Lorenzo D'Amico. Lorenzo D'Amico, are you there? Lorenzo. Good evening. My name is Lorenzo D'Amico and I've been in the tourist industry for the last 45 years. And I've owned several businesses, Coney Island, the Chalet Motor Inn, and I own 5395 River Road, three houses down from the Grand View Manor. And ever since I've been here, there hasn't been any issues with uh, <clears throat> John Pinter, and he keeps his property uh, meticulously clean. And uh, I just want to give you my feedback that, that I support the application. And I thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. D'Amico. Okay, next, we are looking for Peter Saros. Peter Saros. Yes, I'm here. My name is Peter Chiaras. Chiaras. Okay, sorry about that, sir. Welcome That's to the okay. council meeting, and you've got up to the next five minutes. Thank you, council. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Peter Chiaras. I, uh, I own um, the house at the... Uh, 5389 River Road, which is in the middle of uh, John's satellite properties, right in the middle of everything. And uh, I am here in support of uh, John Pinter's application for his satellite properties. Uh, I've never had an issue with uh, Mr. Pinter or his guests. As far as I'm concerned, he runs a clean operation and uh, that, that's why I'm here uh, today in support of uh, Mr. Pinter's application. And I hope our council sees, sees our view and uh, goes through with uh, the passing of his application. That's all I have to say. Thank you, council. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Next, uh, we're looking, Mr. IT, we're looking for Pete Zabor. Pete Zabor. Hello, Mr. Zabor, are you there? No, he's not here. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And next we're looking for uh, John Pinter. No, I'll be speaking the next time. Okay. Got it. He'll speak at the okay. So now are we now? Rocky Vac is going to be speaking on our behalf. Okay, gotcha. All right, so now, are we done with everyone other than the applicant and Mr. Clerk? Pardon me? He is the applicant, right? Mr. Mayor, so is Rocky, yes. Va is Rocky Vaca also representing Mr. Pinter? I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. He I just is. want to make sure that uh, we've gone through all of the members of the public who had wanted to speak. I know we had a few more on the list, but I've, so far I've been told that they have not come online to uh, to accept the Zoom invite. That is correct. So it looks like we're finished with the public portion and the mayor will then move on to uh, hearing from the applicant or his or her representative. Okay, great. So now, so now council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. And I'm assuming that'll be Mr. Baca. I don't think so. Oh, I don't turn off. He does. Hello. Yeah, we can still hear you talking in the background, folks. <clears throat> you might want to mute out your line. Hello. Oh, there we are. Hello, Mr. Vaca. Welcome to the council meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. <clears throat> Just to clarify, um, I'm here on behalf of the applicant. The applicant is 1907782 Ontario Inc., which is controlled by Mr. and Mrs. Pinter. That is my client. Uh, they have been authorized by the owners of the subject properties to be the authorized applicant. Also on the line, I have Mr. Corey Armfelt from NPG Planning Solutions, 
um, who is available to address any planning questions. Um, I did prepare submissions, but before I get to that, um, I did want to address three particular points. Um, and then we'll go from there in terms of what my submissions will consist of. Um, first issue, and the first two issues actually relate directly to what I deem to be the reasons why your planning department uh, do not recommend in favor of the application linking Eastwood to the Grandview Inn. Um, there's two reasons. Uh, neither of these reasons appeared in the February staff report, but they now appear in the report before you this evening. Uh, the first reason was that there is no common ownership. Um, it's true, as we speak, there is no common ownership. Um, when the application was made in February, Mr. Pinter's company owned both properties. Um, there was uh, an agreement in place for Mr. Uh, Zhu, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, to acquire both properties. Um, the first uh, purchase took place in early March of the Grandview Inn. Um, due to COVID and financing reasons, I understand, uh, he wasn't able to close on the second one at the same time, but is ready to do so now. So uh, the email I sent you on Friday was to basically address the fact that, uh, in all fairness to Mr. Herlovich, he wasn't aware that the intention is for there to be common ownership, uh, but that is a fact. Um, and I've also suggested that if council approves the application, that the bylaw not go to council for passage until there is evidence of common ownership. And that is your safeguard. The second reason um, of the only two reasons in Mr. Herlovich's report against the application is the number of rooms. So again, in the February report, there was reference to 12 rooms. Now there's reference to 17 rooms. Um, again, this was not raised in the February staff report. Uh, the reality of the matter is, and as Alex has uh, explained, there's four suites that have two bedrooms. Mr. Herlovich is counting these as two separate guest rooms. I suggest to you that's improper. If you're gonna start counting suite, two bedroom suites as two separate guest rooms, then I better call every single hotel owner that I have as a client in the city of Niagara Falls to run down here and make a minor variance application to increase the number of approved rooms in their properties. Uh, that's a fallacy, completely incorrect. Uh, never until tonight was a two bedroom suite treated as two separate guest rooms. Last issue, the, uh, the issue, I heard the, the words, a false application, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can't comment too much on that because I've only been on this file for the last few weeks. Um, so that's not something I can answer. Um, I can assure you there was no malfeasance. Um, the owners have signed the application form. They were always ready and willing and able to sign the application form. So, and if you want, we can have them both um, send emails to city staff confirming that Mr. Pinter was always authorized to bring this application. So that, that's a technical um, argument that's being made that I'm hearing the words liar, I'm hearing a whole bunch of improper words in this situation. If you want the truth, have those owners send an email to you. They will confirm that Mr. Pinter was always authorized to make these applications. Now I'm gonna shortcut some of my prepared submissions. Um, so another point that needs to be made is the uh, Eastwood property right now could operate as a four bedroom bed and breakfast. So as of right, so to argue that it shouldn't be allowed as a satellite accommodation with the Grandview Inn, um, I would think the neighbors would prefer for all the guests to show up at the Grandview Inn 
rather than having guests go to the Eastwood property uh, to get their keys. So, you know, again, it's a numbers game. There's, there's not four new rooms being added. It's just instead of four bed and breakfast rooms, it's going to be four satellite accommodation rooms. And I submit to you once again, the total number of rooms legally allowed in the Grandview Inn is 12, four of which are two bedroom suites. The four at Eastwood are already legal as bed and breakfast. So we're not adding any more rooms to this area. That's a complete fallacy. Moving on to the second part of the application being 5411 River Road and the request that it be zoned as a uh, vacation rental unit, VRU. As you're aware, three years ago, council adopted OPA 127, which established for the first time policies relating to VRUs. The policies were that VRUs were, be to, were to be directed to tourist commercial and commercial designated areas as of right, and would be allowed in residential designated areas if certain criteria was met and if an application was made for site-specific zoning. That's what you passed. That's what you've been fighting in front of LPAT for the last year. As well, two years ago, you passed bylaw 2019-92 to regulate the VRUs. You spent a lot of money defending those VRUs, bylaws, and OPAs uh, in front of LPAT. And you're still awaiting a decision. Nevertheless, as Mr. Hurlovich states in his report, and I agree, these approved documents represent this council's intention and have been defended vigorously by you at great cost before LPAT. So in this case, your planning staff has applied the criteria approved by council and has recommended that 5411 River Road be approved as a VRU. Respectfully to now not apply and support the, cr the criteria that you have asked LPAT to approve before LPAT's decision even comes out would be a crucial mistake. It would send a message to LPAT that you do not really support OPA 127, nor do you support bylaw 2019-92, which I'm sure your solicitor, Mr. Helinski, who argued the case, would have real concerns with this approach. The end result, if that's a position you take, is that, in other words, the city is against VRUs, even though they have told LPAT that they are in favor of VRUs and have told the residents of Niagara Falls that council is in favor of VIUs, VCU, sorry, if the criteria is met. Respectfully, you can't suck and blow at the same time. You have to be consistent. I would suggest to you that this VRU application is the perfect first one for council to deal with if it wishes to take a strict approach and set a precedent for VRUs in the future. Why, you may ask? The property, though, although designated residential, is within the River Road Satellite District, which already permits bed and breakfast as of right. Secondly, as noted by the region, the property is within the Provincial Gateway Economic Zone. Not the Provincial Gateway Residential Zone, but the Provincial Gateway Economic Zone. So although the property is designated residential, this is not a dwelling in an established subdivision or a street such as McMillan Drive with a picket fence, which council may wish to steer away from approving as VRUs in the future. Respectfully, I submit that this is a quasi tourist commercial area, a perfect place for your first VRU under the criteria that you've established. If LPAT approves OPA 27 and the 2019 bylaw, 
And I've been following the case, and my understanding is uh, it would be complete shock to everyone if LPAT doesn't approve it. It will apply retroactively back to the date in which you made those uh, decisions. So the OPA will go back three years, and these bylaw will go back two years. So to summarize, it's our position that the application in its current form does represent good land use planning. It only increases the number of rooms associated with the Grandview Inn by four on the abutting Eastwood property, four which already would exist on the Eastwood property. We're not adding any rooms. Secondly, the approval of a VRU at 5411 River Road meets all of the applicable policies. It's consistent with what you have been asking LPAT to approve for VRUs in the city and represents a great first VRU approved in the city in what can be described as a quasi-commercial area as recognized by the province of Ontario. And you'll recall that Mr. Herlovich's report does recommend approval of the uh, VRU application for River Road. Now, I can't, I can't speak about the past. I don't know anything about the past, what may or may not have taken place at that property. You've heard different opinions from neighbors tonight. And as expected, you have the black side and you have the white side. You have those who have experienced no negative impact and you have those who say that this is the worst thing that's ever been created in the city of Niagara Falls. I don't know how you deal with that, um, but all I can say to you is you have to deal with planning. You have to deal with the tests under the Planning Act. You have a staff report from Mr. Herlovich who recommends the VRU, VRU application be approved. To say that we're not gonna approve VRUs in residential areas goes against everything you've been fighting for in front of LPAT. In relation to Grandview Inn and Eastwood, Mr. Herlovich alleges that there's two reasons why he can't support it. There's no common ownership. Well, that's gone by the wayside. There will be common ownership. Otherwise, a bylaw will never be passed allowing this. His second point is that it's no longer an inn because now we're at 21 rooms as opposed to 16 plus one innkeeper's room. I've given you my reasons why I think that's a fallacy. Not true. You do not treat a suite with two bedrooms as two separate guest rooms. Never been done in the city of Niagara Falls. And heaven forbid if that's the interpretation you make because there's gonna be a lot of hotel owners scrambling to get variances or you're gonna charge them under the bylaw. That's the reality of that position. Now, I would like to respond to some of the allegations regarding Mr. Pinter. If this wasn't a virtual meeting, I could take him aside and have me give him his side of the story, um, but I can't. So for those reasons, if you still believe that this application should not be approved, even though I have given you strong arguments why Mr. Herlovich's position no longer uh, is applicable on the issue of common ownership and the number of rooms. Um, if you're still having doubts about this and you wanna hear more in regards to the allegations that have been made against Mr. Pinter, then I would suggest to you, I need to regroup with Mr. Pinter I need to hear his side of the story. There's been some statements tonight that are on the verge of slander, quite frankly. Um, so uh, I don't take that lightly on behalf of a client. I'm sure Mr. Pinter doesn't either. And I think he deserves the right to respond to those statements, but we can't do that tonight. I just don't have the information. And in all fairness, um, I think this matter should be deferred until we have the chance to regroup and, uh, and be able to respond to those allegations. And you may wanna have further uh, discussion or further opinion from Mr. Herlovich 
based on what I just said, um, because I don't think his re his reasons to not approve the application are valid with all due respect. Those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaca. Do we have any questions for Mr. Va Mr. Vaca? I've got Councilor Iannone. Wow. So we are to not heed our staff who Jim, you just gave accolades to for their professionalism and the way they do their job. And they, there's been a lot of critical mistakes made tonight and Mr. Herlovich, and I, I'm taking notes as Mr. Vaca speaks, and Mr. Herlovich's arguments are no longer applicable. Well, I'm going to tell Mr. Vaca that I, I agree with you. There are a lot of critical mistakes that have been made, but it's not been by the city. It's been by your client. And quite frankly, until you said who your client was right now, I thought your client was Mr. Zhu, because that's how your, your letter to us reads. So can... I, I'm now confused on what we're even dealing with. So Mr. Pinter has permission from Mr. Hugh to put this application forward. He doesn't own the land, the, the property anymore, but he's going to run the inn. And, and I'd like to ask Mr. Vaca that and then continue my questions. Hey, okay, Mr. Vaca. Through you, uh, Mayor Diodati. Um, if I could address the first part of it, um, all I've done is I've addressed the two reasons why Mr. Herlovich does not support the application. Neither reason appears in his February staff report. I have the utmost of respect for Mr. Herlovich. He knows that. That, that goes without saying. I've been working uh, with the city for 24 years now. And Mr. Herlovich knows I have the utmost respect for him. All I've done tonight is criticize the two reasons why he's not in support of the application. And I think I've given very, very valid reasons, quite frankly. Um, yes, I'm here. My client is Mr. Pinter's company. I have an application that was signed by the owners authorizing Mr. Pinter to be the applicant. When I sent an email on Friday, I specifically said, I'll be here on behalf of the applicant. And then I stated who the other owners were. Um, is Mr. Pinter going to operate these properties? My understanding is he will under a lease, which is permitted under your licensing bylaw, um, which is which is the way most businesses are operated. And that's the person who gets a business license is the tenant. Every single tenant in Stanford Green Plaza does not own their unit. They are a tenant. The zoning allows them to operate their restaurant or retail store and they get a business license under their name. That's what's gonna happen here. Is it gonna happen forever? I don't think so. I think once Mr. Zhu, Mr. Zhu closes on the Eastwood property, I suspect at some point in time, he's gonna run the operations himself. I don't know, I'm not privy to that. Um, I can tell you that I, I have full confidence that these applications have been approved. I have emails from Mr. Zhu's lawyer confirming that he understands what's been applied for and he authorizes the application. So I'm not sure what else I can tell you other than that uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, were mistakes made in the past? Absolutely, sounds like it. I wasn't involved up until three weeks ago. So I can't reply to that. And if you wanna reply, then I suggest we defer. Let me regroup, let me get your questions answered and then you can make your final decision. But during that time, I think you should be um, asking Mr. Herlovich his opinion on what I just said on those two points, with all due respect. Well, I, Mr. I Herlovich, can we get your comment on those oh. two points, Mr. Herlovich? I thought I had the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. The, um, <clears throat> so, so I'm just reporting on the number of bedrooms, but my report actually says that there are nine individual bedrooms and four suites with two bedrooms. So I'm not counting those four suites. In fact, I described for council how there's a door that enters into a vestibule that has two doors to the um, bedrooms. So how those are rented, I have no idea. 
what our inspectors looked at was that there are four suites with two rooms and there are nine other rooms, which actually adds up to 13, not 12, plus the room for the manager and then the meeting rooms. And I'm just suggesting that we recognize all those. Um, with respect to um, ownership, um, I am concerned that the uh, ownership uh, be the same if council is uh, of the mind that they should be the same. The, the lawyer for the applicant has suggested deferring passing of the bylaw until such a time as the properties have come under the same uh, ownership. Um, I think those were the two questions or the two comments. Thank you for that, Mr. Levitch. So do I still have the floor? Thank yes, you. Yes, you do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is Mr. Bathba our last speaker? I don't think so. I thought, do we have a Corey, Corey Armfeld? Is that who we have next? Yeah, so we have okay. a uh, another a planner, I think. Mr. Mayor, Corey, uh, I don't believe we'll need Corey to speak unless you have any direct questions relating to planning. Okay. So I, I will be the last speaker. Okay, okay, great. Okay, uh, Okay. so w once you close this meeting, I'd be happy to make a, a motion, but I don't believe a motion to defer this again is what any resident wants. I think with the information before us, and, and congratulations, Mr. Pinter found himself a great lawyer now, but he's a little bit late in the game. And to say that we need to defer it to get more updated information, the information isn't going to change. It might be presented to us in a different manner, but the information doesn't change. And granted, Mr. Vapo wasn't part of that. And I understand that it doesn't change how this application came before us. It doesn't change the past, Mr. Vaca. It just gives a great indicator on what the future is going to be on planning issues. So I'd be happy when this when the meeting closes to make a to make a motion. Hey, we've got some more speakers here. Uh, we've got uh, I've got Councillor Lacoco, uh, Councillor uh, Campbell. And then I've got Councillor Strange and Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure who could answer this, but I want to go to the suites. So if the whole inn was full and there was one suite that was not, and I come in to rent a room, could I be rented one of those rooms in the suite and have a separate key to get into one room? And then later on in the day, someone else comes to rent a room, there's only one room, which is part of that two bedroom suite, could they rent it separately? That is my question. And who are we asking the question of? Whoever can answer it, whether it be Mr. Pinter, Mr. Vaca, a planner. So, so you're saying of the four suites, each suite has two bedrooms, could the two bedrooms be rented separately by different people? Correct. Yes. Okay. Because to me, if, if they could be rented separately, they would be two separate bedrooms. I understand the purpose of a suite. Um, as Mr. Herlovich said, there's a vestibule and two doors. If, if the whole inn was rented except for one suite, I came in to rent a room. I was given a key to go to the vestibule, to go to a room that's now rented, which leaves one other bedroom in the suite. Could somebody else rent that suite? That's my question. Okay, so Mr. Vaca or Mr. Pinter, could someone answer that? Well, I, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I mean, legally, well, legally, the Grandview Inn is allowed to operate with 12 rooms. Um, if you define a guest room or a suite with two bedrooms as one room, then it's 12 bedrooms. Um, does that mean that you can sever off half a suite and rent it to family A and the other half to family B? I don't know the answer. And that's another reason why we need to regroup because I don't know how your definitions fall into that scenario, quite frankly. And if Mr. Herlovich knew definitively, I assume he would have told us already. So all I can tell you is legally, there's 12 rooms that are allowed to be to be rented out uh, as guest rooms. 
Thank you, Mr. Vaca. Could Mr. Pinter answer that? What I'd like to know is if there's separate keys that two separate people could go into those two bedrooms of one suite. Mr. Two Pinter, are you available? People. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we hear you. The OBC uh, Ontario Building Code requires that we have doors between those two rooms. So they're fire rated doors. So the intention while we built the building as per the drawing that was submitted to the building department, there was absolutely no deviation whatsoever from that drawing that how the building was built. We are required to put on fire rated doors between those two sides of the suite. So in the event that there's a fire, it cannot, you have to give a one hour fire rating from jump from one side to the other side. So to answer Councillor Lococo's question, no, the intention is not to write one half. We only have four rooms with two beds. We fully anticipate to have lots of families having those rooms. There's no reason to believe that one couple is gonna be on one side and another couple, which is totally unrelated to the first couple is gonna be on the other side. Any given hotel probably has at least 50 to 60% of their rooms with two to three beds in there. We're doing the exact same thing. We're just giving those families, those two couples that know each other a little bit more privacy. And yes, we have to confirm to the OBC, the Ontario Building Code, by putting in those fire rated doors. I hope that answer satisfies you. Good answer. What's Councilor that? Councillor LeCoco. Through, through the mayor, um, no, Mr. Pinter, that didn't exactly answer my question. All I want to know is, can two separate people have two different keys to go into those two different rooms? No, maybe they that cannot. wasn't that maybe wasn't the intention. And no, they I, cannot. Okay, There's your answer. No, they, no, they cannot. Thank you. Because they have to have a key to get into the front door. There's a door before those two separate doors, another fire rated door. They cannot do that. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Vaca's statement that proof of common ownership of the two parties will be provided in the very near future. This lacks, in my mind, all credibility. The party he represents has a long history of false promises. For example, on the 11th of September, 2019, John Pinder said he would provide counsel with his OPA ZBA application by the 30th of September, 2019. It arrived in October, 2020. <clears throat> Lots of things can go wrong between an agreement to sell the property and the closing date. Some deals never close. I'm hoping counsel will take the advice that we simply refuse the application. Then Richard Zhu the new owner of the inn can get on with finishing construction and establishing his business. And if he chooses to make a new, clear, honest rezoning application at some later date, we'll investigate it. Similarly, the owners at 5411 River Road can, if they choose to make a new, clear, honest zoning application for a vacation renter, we can deal with that. No <clears throat> need to involve Mr. Pinter since he is not an owner. Mr. Mayor, can I, can I address those comments, please? Yes, yes, go ahead, Mr. Becker. So what I've suggested on the issue of common ownership um, is not subject to interpretation. Either you get copies of deeds for each of the properties showing the same owner, or this bylaw never gets approved. Even if you give a positive recommendation tonight or at the next meeting, it'll be subject to evidence that these two properties are owned by the same party. Um, you can't fudge that. I'm so, not trying to fudge so, anything, Mr. Vak. I'm simply saying that past history is usually a good indication of future expectations. And we, we don't have that information tonight. And this is not the first time that we haven't had information that we require to make a good decision. Mr. Mayor, can I speak to that point? No, that we're point. right. Well, Councillor uh, Campbell's got the floor, and he's speaking right now with with uh, Mr. Vaca. So, Councillor Campbell, are you still? I don't see you on the screen. No, I didn't. Uh, either. I'm finished. I'm sorry. Yes. So, can I speak to that point? Exactly that point. Just to that point. 
Okay, so Mr. Vac and Mr. Pinter are telling us that there's 12 rooms. I am reading you the advertisement from Grandview's website. Completely renovated in 2020, Niagara Grandview Manor now features a total of 17 luxury rooms and suite which can sleep between <coughs> two and six persons. Our spectacular rooftop suites, ceiling heights of 12 to 16 feet. That is from their website. I'm not fudging anything. I'm not exaggerating anything. That's their website. So Mr. Vack, if you don't like the fact that our staff is saying 17 rooms, maybe your client shouldn't be advertising 17 rooms. Okay. Um, I think Mr. Vack has addressed that already. He's not denying that there's not rooms. He's saying they're part of a suite. I think that's what he's been saying. Okay, um, I've got uh, Councillor Strange and then Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think this whole thing's been really confusing uh, for everyone. Um, you know, we don't have common ownership. Um, it seems like the recommendation from staff is to actually allow the Grandview with the VRU and not have Eastwood. And, you know, even if we voted against that, they might be able to to take it to LPAT because his recommendation from staff to, to have that in. Um, I'm a little confused about the rooms. Um, you know, some are saying 17, <clears throat> some are saying 12. I just want more clarification. And, and if they can get a common ownership and come back, like Rocky Vaca says, and, um, and regroup. So I, you know, once, once the meeting's closed, I'm, I'm willing to make the motion to defer. Hey, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yes, I, I think you better send somebody down and look at that uh, uh, in tomorrow and see if there's a, a lock and key in the units for the two um, ones. I would suspect that that one, you just, there's no key there and you go in, you got two rooms. And that's why you got 17 rooms. And, uh, you know, the council um, has to realize that when this construction uh, happened, I was driving up River Road and I saw this big expansion on the end. And I checked and they said, oh, that never came to council that went to the Committee of Adjustment for approval. And, but I just want to know from Mr. Herlovich, um, um, as uh, the provincial government has said, uh, bed and breakfast are okay um, anywhere. And you th is that three bedrooms? And uh, the owner, not a manager, the owner has to live in there. Is that not true, Mr. Hermovich? Yeah, to you, your worship, to the councillor. So LPAT did approve the city's zoning bylaw for bed and breakfast. No idea it's three about. bedrooms in an owner-occupied unit in every R1, R2, and R3 sure. zone of the city. My dad is Except in the Folks, we can hear somebody in the background. Somebody in the background should mute their their uh, their uh, computer, please. Okay, so... so it, sorry, I'm bed, sorry, Mr. Hulovich. Go ahead, Mr. Hulovich. Three bedrooms and the owner occupied. That's yeah. what uh, the uh, Eastwood and the River Road should be, period. And what about the other three that uh, were in the original application? Are they bacon uh, vacation rentals also? And where's the approval for those? I'd like to know that too. Well, the application or the, when the applicant amended the application, he said those three properties would be operated in accordance with the zoning bylaw. <clears throat> so
excuse me, which would allow an owner occupied bed and breakfast. Okay, but the, the one on Eastwood has four bedrooms and not owner occupied. Well, <clears throat> that's how it would have to be occupied. It's never been licensed as a bed and breakfast. So if it's how come, operated as how a come bed and breakfast, it did so illegally. How come it's illegal? Yeah. Okay, folks. Are there any other questions for Mr. Vaca? Okay, seeing none. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Strange. Wow. Yeah, yeah thank get you, Mr. Get his hand up, Councillor. You can't just yell in front of everyone and get to the front of the line. Come on. Mr. Mayor, I need... I Councillor said Strange that I, has the floor. Yeah, Councillor Strange has the floor. Where are you... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and like I, I previously um, stated, I just, it's a little bit confusing, um, especially with the staff recommendation that they pass the VRU on River Road and the Grandview, but not Eastwood. Um, Eastwood could become a bed and breakfast um, if it's owner occupied. So it could be three rooms plus the owner would be occupying one room, I believe, if, that was, if, they, if that's what they want to do in the future. The VRU in, on River Road would, is probably going to be a no-brainer once it goes to LPAD and it gets uh, approved there for uh, VRUs in, in Niagara Falls, especially on River Road. Um, like Rocky Vaca states, I think he just wants to regroup and, and bring this back. And hopefully we can have a common ownership at that time as well. And um, whatever happens, if, if it's all three or just the two, I think they'll be uh, a lot more organized and uh, yeah. So I just want to make the motion to uh, defer. Do we have a second? Councilor Dabrowski. Recorded vote. Recorded vote, Mr. Clerk. Okay, Council's heard the motion. Motion for deferral. Uh, that is non debatable. Councillor Campbell. Opposed. Councillor Dabrowski. In favor. Councillor Iannone. Opposed. Councillor Curio. In favor. Councillor Lococo. Opposed. Councillor Peter Angelo. Yes. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson? No. Mayor Diodati? Four. And that carries. Mr. Mayor, can I make a comment? I'm going to ask Councillor uh, Strange first to give us a deferral to when, if we can get a uh, deferral to when, Councillor. Uh, I don't know the meeting schedule, but I would say uh, end of July, beginning of August. I don't have the schedule in front of me. Let's make it the end of September. Sure. Uh, or maybe next August. So 2022, August? Sure, we'll get them the whole we'll, tour season. We'll, we'll just uh, make, make it a really strong uh, issue in the election. But I, I, I think by, like I said, I don't know the, if, if uh, the city clerk can bring up the council meetings end of July beginning of August. I'm not sure. I don't have it in front of me. I can give you the uh, next few meetings. Uh, the next one would be June 22nd. There's oh. another meeting July 13, August 10, September 14. Okay. Those August next 10? four. Is that okay? So, Mr. Mayor, through that time, can those can those operation can those be uh, Airbnbs or vacation rentals operate? I, uh, Mr. Uh, Herlovich, can you help us out with that, with that answer? So Mr. Mayor, the buildings would have to be licensed to operate. Council just passed the license bylaw last meeting. So they would have to be licensed, uh, 5411 is not zoned 
for VRU, so it could not operate, it could not get a license. Um, if the owner lived there, they could come in for a bed and breakfast license and operate. As for Grandview, Grandview Inn, that was licensed as a tourist establishment under the motel section of our licensing last in 2015. That would be the same license they would require. I would like, they, they in order to get the license, they need to have the building inspector sign off that the rooms are all meet code and the fire inspector sign off that they all meet code. So far, the last I heard, they were not ready for habitation. So those inspections would have to occur before the license. Um, so the building would have to basically be finished. And, um, and since I count 13 rooms, that is nine individuals and four suites, uh, one of those rooms would have to be other than a guest room. So, um, anyway, so that, that would have to change. So they would need to meet all, if they can meet all those conditions, then I suppose the short answer is, could they operate between now and when council called this to come back? I would say, yes. Can they meet all that? I'm not sure. Okay, does that answer the question? So River Road cannot operate and Eastwood Crescent cannot operate. But Grandview, if they pass all of those hurdles, can get a light, can operate. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, yes, because as long as it's a 12 room in. Only, grand, only the Grandview site. Yes, but they still need their license. I understand that, Alex. But I, I just want the residents to understand that those other two cannot operate. And Grandview can only operate once it's cleared those hurdles and got the license. Right. Now, I don't know, Mr. D'Souza could move to Niagara Falls and come in and get a license for bed and breakfast at 5411. And have I don't to know whether he, he wishes there. to leave Markham or all. Yeah. Yes. So I, so I guess when that, that would be a driver's comes, license and, yeah. and. Oh. Okay. Mr. Mayor, can I make one more comment? Well, I don't know. Did you finish answering Mr. Hilovich? Uh You mentioned about Eastwood, yeah, or, sorry, River Road, uh, but Eastwood, what was the status of Eastwood? Well, the owner would have to live there and operate it as a bed and breakfast okay. and get a license. Okay, Councilor Ianoni. Mr. Mike, I'd just like to make the point that when Mr. When I was speaking, and I, I asked if Mr. Vacker was the last speaker and he said yes. And I said, okay, when you close the meeting, I'd like to make a motion. So you can reprimand me, but I did two times say that. And I did have my hand up before Councilor Strange. So that is what I was trying to interrupt. I wasn't trying to speak over him. I had made, I thought I had made that abundantly clear. Well, I appreciate that. And I was looking because you both made your intentions clear. You can't reserve a spot when the meeting closes by saying it. And I was going to watch to see who put their hand up. And I saw his hand if I saw it wrong. I heard you, but I saw his hand because it was disappearing in and out of his background. So that's how I saw it. But regardless, it would have been the same outcome because obviously more people wanted to see more information so we could make an informed decision. So is there any other, so we're done with this then, right, Mr. Clerk, this issue? Yeah, okay. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Yes, through you to uh, Mr. Hurlovich, uh, proof of uh, living in the, uh, and owning the house would require him to change his driver's license and car, car ownership and everything? That's how I would view proving that you live in the in the building thank you if you move to a building you're supposed to change your license within seven days in the province of ontario in any event thank you okay thank you uh, to everyone for their patience uh moving on to item 8.1 
uh, monthly tax receivable report looking to receive it. So moved, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, 8.2 overnight parking permit application amendment. There are two new recommendations. Councillor Thompson, are you moving it? Yes, I would move this and uh, thank uh, Mr. Brown for bringing this forward. There was uh, a difficulty with uh, a young lady living with her mother and their family, and she had a car that was licensed to the father, and she couldn't get an application for parking on because of that difficulty. So I think he's trying to straighten this out. So um, it's not restrictive for um, people for parking um, in unusual legal situations. I would so move. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, sec Councilor Campbell, are you seconding? It? Yes, I, I, I second it and I'd like to make a comment. Sure. I suggested, uh, uh, and I had dealt with the same uh, citizen, um, I suggested that they leave the cars in the uh, overnight parking because the father who refuses to allow a uh, change of ownership, uh, he'd have to pay the bills. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> did, I, did we vote on that? Or, so you got me all no. thrown off. No? <laughs> no? Well, you seconded it, right? Okay, all those I in did, favor. I seconded. I okay, seconded. and all those in favor? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, unanimous. Uh, 8.3 gateway feature policy. Uh, we've got three recommendations by staff. Councillor Peter Angelo, you move no, the recommendation. I'm recommendation, Your Worship, but I, I wanted to ask as well if I could include one more recommendation. Last time I did talk about condo developments and, and we got an email today as well, just in regards to them. Um, <clears throat> the writer of the email did make a good point in the sense that, you know, some of the condo developments have um, more units in them than homes on a street yet we're gonna cover uh, subdivision markers, you know, that are there for homes, but we won't cover them for condos. So I, I guess I'm happy to approve uh, the motion, but I also wanted to add in there that, you know, um, staff come back with a future report that looks at including condos. Okay. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Campbell. Uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's I have, a, I have a conflict. Mayor? Okay, sorry, with a conflict with uh, Councillor Strange. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 8.4, Park Street Parking Review. We've got two recommendations. Councillor Thompson makes the motion. Oh, Se oh, second thank you. Councillor, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Councillor Inoni, were you with that? Were you for that? Yep, thank you. Um, 8.5. Brownfield Rehabilitation Grant Application for 4261 Fourth Avenue. We have three applications. Will of Council, Councilor Dabrowski, make the motion. Do we have a three. Yep. Okay. Do we have a seconder, Councilor Strange? And yes, um, Mr. Madsen. I just want to point out to the mayor that we do have one resident uh, that had requested to speak to that item. Uh, I'm not sure if Ms. Peebles is with us on the line. Yes, she is. So Ms. Peebles, are you there? Hi there. Oh, hello, you've uh, welcome to the meeting. You've got five minutes to speak to the Brownfield Rehabilitation Grant application on the agenda. Thank you. Um, actually, before I start, um, if you don't mind through you, Mr. Mayor, if Bill Matson could let me know how I actually get my correspondence on the agenda when I speak, because this is the second time that I've sent correspondence in and it hasn't been included in the uh, agenda. And I know Mike Cushman sent in correspondence and wanted to speak, but wasn't allowed. So maybe you could clarify how that works. Sure, Madsen, are you able to? Yeah, uh, through your, your worship to the speaker. Uh, in your case, uh, Ms. Peoples, you did make your request uh, prior to the 24-hour 
uh, deadline that we asked for requests for items that are listed on the agenda. Uh, so I did reply to you that yes, we could uh, have you listed and send you that Zoom link. <clears throat> Your correspondence then came in after the fact, and by then we had already published uh, the agenda for one last time. Uh, I, I did see that your correspondence was emailed to all of council, uh, but it did not make uh, the published version of the agenda. We do have your correspondence for the public record uh, listed in hard copy form. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted that clarified and um, now I understand. So um, before I, uh, well, I'll start now, um, but I just wanted to start, I see Councillor Strange um, maybe has gone offline, but I wanted to mention, I was actually on at the beginning of the Zoom meeting and I heard him mention that one of his young friends has been diagnosed with, I think, stage three cancer. And I just wanted to offer my sympathy to him and his young friend. I know childhood cancer is devastating. Um, <clears throat> so now I'll go on to share some of my experiences. I was going to tell you about my personal experience um, on the cyanamid property, but I thought maybe it might be uh, an interesting thing for all of us to imagine um, what, say, a 10-year-old child would do in a situation um, what I experienced. So imagine if you're a 10-year-old child sort of riding your bike around in on the street in front of the old YMCA property, and you're with your friends, and you noticed... Uh, off to the side, a big rusty piece of steel, something or other. And you ride your bikes on over there to check out what it is. And the next thing you know, you're on a road. So you follow this road and this road has a curve to it. And you know, kids, they're super curious. This is their backyard, they follow the road. When you get around the corner, there's this opening. And the first thing you see is this massive pile of sort of golden, sparkling debris, something that you don't usually see. You also see um, some water and which happens to be uh, the um, cooling pond. And there is a fence around the cooling pond on the uh, east side, but the water has seeped out. And so it's a couple of inches deep. And I'm 48 years old and I love to ride my bike through water I love it when it splashes up on my face. And I imagine every child that uh, would find that water would wanna do the exact same thing. And so after these kids or us as children are finished playing in that water, we ride along to this massive pile of golden debris. What kid is not gonna to wanna to climb to the, to the top and be king of the castle up there? Also, that debris has seeped down every time it rains and it's across the pathway and it glimmers and it, it when you ride through it on your bike it it leaves this crazy pathway so once you're finished playing with the um massive debris uh pile you make your way on through and now you go up the trail and you come to the west side of the cooling ponds and it is black water it is surrounded by dead trees and um, rushes at the edge. Uh, most kids would probably throw rocks in there, play around there. If you look to your left, there is a massive sludge run is the only thing I could describe it as. It is the same color as that massive uh, pile of debris, um, but it is mucky, like super mucky. And I thought it was solid and I accidentally stepped in it. And underneath it is black. So there's this yellow surface uh, and then black underneath, perfect mud pie material. So once you finish making mud pies, you're probably gonna rinse your hands off in the cooling ponds and then you're gonna hop back on your bike and you're gonna head north and not for, far north of there, probably five minutes from uh, the proposed new development. Um, you're going to find black goo oozing out of the ground and it's flowing in the direction of the gorge. And again, I'm 48 years old. My first natural instinct was to poke it with a stick. Every single child that would come across that would have the exact same instinct. So once you're done poking the black goo, 
you hop back on your bike and you ride through some soil that is completely saturated in oil. And then you come to standing water on both sides of the trail that has not a single living critter in it. Um, it uh, has this crazy oil slick on top. And I should also note that there are quad tracks and dirt bike tracks that have gone through that body of water. Um, so children, people, nobody should be coming up here. If you continue um, north, um, that end of the road used to be sealed off and somebody has taken the fence down. So it's completely accessible from the, the north side as well. Um, uh, this is this is the the back the backyard and the playground of the children that will be living in this 100 unit uh, stacked townhouse development that is proposed to be built on toxic land, and um, I'm not sure how in 2012 I believe um, the bylaw zoning got changed from not having any uh, housing development to being allowed to have housing development, but whoever made that change without cleaning up the site and the surrounding area has to give their head a shake. So I'm proposing that tonight, um, council uh, puts a moratorium on any housing development in that whole entire area until the whole entire area is cleaned up. I would not have my children playing there and I'm sure none of you would. So why should anyone else? And that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I've got Councillor Iannone, then Cario. Mr. Mayor, I had been emailing back and forth to Mr. Herlovich in regards to the application that was approved in Committee of Adjustment that took it from, I think, a multi, and, and please correct me where I'm wrong, whether it's Councillor Peter Angelo or Mr. Herlovich. Um, it went from a multifamily, I think, apartment building to the stacked townhouses. And my back and forth with Mr. Herlovich was because I couldn't for the life of me remember that application coming to council. And I don't remember it because it was 12 years ago. So I had to go back through paperwork and, and try to bring my memory up. And I can honestly say I voted against any development anywhere on that property when it came to council a couple months ago when it was the arena, Councillor Wing and I voted in step against any development on that property from start to finish. And we did so because the information provided to council was that no, nothing should ever be developed on that property that was residential and having people live on it. So it bothered me that we'd have staff work on it. Now that's neither here or there, that arena's there. It's, it, you, you're, you've, you've built it. But the property beside it, the YMCA, had as much contamination from leaching as the rest of the property. So before this application came to Committee of Adjustment in 2020, from an approval 12 years ago that none, I, I don't know if anybody else remembers it. How did it, or did it become environmentally cleared? When was that land remediated and determined safe for people to live on? Because I can assure you as sure as I'm speaking, we were told never to build houses on that property that people would live on commercial only but never residential so when did it get cleaned up because i don't remember any remediation coming to us okay so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do two things um i'm gonna first i i just need to take a little break so i'm just gonna pass the chair over to Councillor cario well i do this but before i do i'm gonna ask mr herlovich if you could weigh in <clears throat> And then we've got councillors uh, Lococo, Peter Angelo, uh, uh, and then Cario uh, to speak. And by then I should be back. So I'm gonna pass this over to councillor Cario and ask Mr. Hilovich if you could address the concerns councillor Iannone brought forward, please. To um, councillor Cario then, the, uh, to councillor uh, Iannone, the lands are not cleaned up. In fact, this application 
is to provide a program funding grant to clean up. On page two of the report, it says there are approximately 3,800 tons of soil that are to be excavated and disposed of in a licensed facility. So that's what the oh, yeah. is about is to clean clean the property and to uh, hey. provide funding to make sure that it is remediated. Councillor Terry, I still have the floor. You were, you were muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Do I still have the floor? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Okay, so so this is what bothers me, Alex. This is the cart after the horse. So it's gone to committee of adjustment. Committee adjustment has given it a minor variance to build 100 stacked townhouses. And now with that approval, now they have to clean up the land. Wouldn't you have to clean up the force the land to be cleaned up, then provide an app, then have an applicant come through? This is kind of ridiculous that somebody has been given approval on contaminated land. So can they start to build? What steps do they have to take before they can start to build? They need a record of site condition registered against the property to say that it's uh, at a level that is safe for houses. Excuse me? Excuse me? Um, what about the area surrounding? Who, who suggest, who's talking? Um, me, Angela. Me? Oh, Angela. Angela. Yeah, you don't have the floor, I'm sorry. Um, Councillor Penelope has the floor. So, so Mr. Hulevich, for, for the people who are asking us, how could you approve or how could that staff townhouses get approval? There is no ability for them to put a shovel in the ground and build their development until they have a record of site condition and that property is cleaned up, correct? That's correct. So when they went to committee of adjustment, do they not have to do they committee of adjustment and say they had to have a record of site condition? Do they, were they asked any questions? Is that land clean? What plans do you have? Because when, when you and I were emailing back and forth and you said, I, I don't, I, I think you're not understanding me. I really wasn't because I could not pull the, the 12 year old approval out of my head. Because people kept asking me, how did this get approved and you didn't know? Well, 12 years. But how can it go? Would they not have to commit to remediate remediate it, then apply for a minor adjustment? And <clears throat> given our lack of enforcement issues that we just discussed, how can we make the public comfortable that there will be nothing built on that land until it is 100% remediated with no contamination. And given Miss Peebles' scenario, which all we all have kids that do those things, how do you how do you guarantee when that's built that the land, the land surrounding it won't be accessed by the families living in that stack condo? Counselor, I have no way of guaranteeing the way that the kids who attend the Gale Center don't walk through that muck and sludge that she describes. Um, anybody can walk walk through the mud and sludge. Sludge apparently she walks through it, so it, it must be open to anybody. I can't prevent that. Um, the record of site condition is a requirement. They will not get it uh, with you know unless the building permit is filed with that record of site condition. In 2009, the zoning was passed for an R5B zone for an apartment building. The site is large enough to support 100 apartment units. And so what they went to the Committee of Adjustment for was to change the form of housing from an apartment building to stacked townhouse buildings. So it's the same number of units, it's just a different form of housing. Do I still have the floor, Council Cario? Of course. Thank you. So the land that you we have no con the land we have no control over with the goo. Do we know whether that open land that any of the residents can go on is contaminated? And if it is contaminated, 
can it not be fenced off? So the areas that they're posting pictures about on Facebook and talking about contamination, if they're accessible by the public, can they not be fenced off so that kids or grown kids cannot get into them? I would have to look into that and get an answer for you. I would think that would be a Ministry of the Environment issue. I can tell you that the YMCA site has a fence, although I probably could have squished through the gate uh, when I was out there the other day. Okay, so can we look into whether that potentially contaminated land, because I can't say whether it is or it isn't, but the potentially contaminated land can be fenced off so the average person can't get into it? Can we have you look into that? Do I need to make a motion for that? Um, probably a good idea to make a motion yeah. that's on record. Yeah. To make a motion, Councillor, to have staff investigate on, maybe go to yeah. the uh, Ministry of Environment. So I will make that motion and that it be done ASAP, Councillor Cario, because oh, driving, oh, past, yeah, driving past that the other day, there were teenagers, they were socially distancing, but they were all on that land. Okay, well, we have a motion by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Grange, that we have staff investigate. Uh, any questions to the motion? Councillor Peter Angelo and Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks your Acting Worship. Uh, just a couple of questions through you uh, to Mr. Herlovich, just because Committee of Adjustments was mentioned a bunch of times. So without the Committee of Adjustment application, would the landowner still be allowed to build 100 units on that property? He could build 100 units in an apartment building <clears throat> if he had a record of site condition that it was clean. Okay. And, and who placed the zoning on that land to allow residential development? <clears throat> was it the Committee of Adjustment? No, it was a council decision. It was a council decision, yeah. And, and it, it, <clears throat> It's too bad that Councillor Iannone has left the meeting right now because I wanted to tell her that although she continues to say that she voted against development, oh, she's coming back right now, good. Uh, Councillor Iannone, I just wanted to make one thing clear because as you continue to say that you have voted against development on that land, um, that's not true. If you go back and you look at the bylaw, which gave authority to that property to build 100 units back in 2009, in you actually voted for it. I didn't, but you did. Uh, Councilor so, Angelo, I didn't. Now I don't. I'll go back and look at those minutes. Yeah. But yeah, I'll go back and look because you're telling me something I don't remember. But okay. I know that Councilor uh, Wing and I voted against every single application that was surrounding that land, and it mm -hmm. was really contentious at the time. You should go back and check the bylaw that Mr. Herlovich has identified back in August of 2009, I believe it was. Um, you supported it. I, yeah, I, I, I know. Don't I don't believe I, I did. I, I, but the, but the, point I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is that the Committee of Adjustment does not deal with the zoning of the land. The zoning of the land is put there by council. And the Committee of Adjustment... All they did was they, they, they took one single apartment building and allowed it to be split up into smaller buildings. Now, from a built form perspective, planning will tell you that they will always prefer to break up one large massive building into smaller buildings. So, I mean, you continue to mention Committee of Adjustment uh, as, as though Committee of Adjustment is the one that gave approval to this property to build 100 units of residential development, but that's not true. It was city council back in 2009, and I wanted you to know who voted for it. Well, I, I did say that, but I, just so that you, your, your concern is you're worried that committee of adjustment looks bad and that it's not, not that it's contaminated. No, I mean, that was your comments was that committee of adjustment application, committee of adjustment application, and that was your emails to us, uh, you know, last week. So I wanted to and, make that. And that was clear. the residents complaints that I clarified with them. But thank you yeah. for pointing that, that out. Okay, so we have a more and the other point I wanted to make, uh, your acting worship, now that yep. I have the floor, is it's very difficult for a municipality to actually um, we can't force the cleanup of toxic land. And I'd like Mr. Herlovich to comment on this. So um, back in back in two thousand and I believe nine it was, um, 
the city and uh, I can't remember the consultant's name. I think it was Mr. Piccioni. Um, uh, Niagara Falls was a leader in the province because I believe we were the first municipality <coughs> to pass a municipal CIP that dealt with brownfields. And the CIP that we passed was to allow different incentives to landowners to clean up toxic sites. If you take a look at even what's going on in St. Catharines right now with the old GM plant, they can't force cleanup. So you have to find some creative way to get landowners to clean up their property. And that's what we did through a CIP. <laughs> and that's the only way that this property here could be developed is if the landowner agrees to clean it up first. So um, it, it's a good tool to use your worship, the CIP. I, 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 I can't think of anyone who wouldn't want a toxic site cleaned up. I mean, I don't even understand why we're arguing over cleaning up a toxic site. I mean, I would think that if you would ask a hundred people, would they want a toxic site cleaned up? A hundred would say yes. So, I mean, it's really a good news story in the sense that you're going to take a toxic site and you're going to clean it up so that it's no longer toxic. So yeah. those are my comments, Your Worship. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thompson on this issue. Yeah, I want to let you know that I've dealt with this stuff for years. And uh, this is the Provincial Ministry of Environment that is very strict with this. And you wouldn't believe the little properties that the ministry gets involved in and they go through the first testing and no, you got to go to the second testing and they are responsible to make sure this site is totally safe before any construction and for us to assist in financially finally get this, this approved and it's going to be um, taxes for us to get money back. So I think there's no problem with this at all. So, so we have a list of speakers. Does anyone want to speak to the motion or can we call this motion and then go back to the list? If not, um, we have a motion by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Strange, that staff um, in conjunction with the Ministry of the Environment uh, check out the, um, the condition and whether or not that property is safe uh, and report back to us. Is that the motion, Councillor? Yes, you're muted, but yes, I assume you're saying yes. Yes, yes. because anybody can wander onto that property. Right. Yeah, so yeah. the environment industry, I'm sure. And, and, and I have no problem with that because you're going to find out what the ministry is going to do to make sure uh, and their requirements. Unbelievable. Councillor, uh, you were Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, oh, you're sorry. acting worse. I was just going to ask, like, are we going to deal with the recommendation in the report? Because if not, then we're really not going to force cleanup of the property. And to me, yeah, I think we are, uh, but this motion came up, so I thought it might not be bad to okay. uh, all right. you know, we get this out of the way. Um, okay. well, all in favor okay. of the Anyone opposed? Opposed? Councillor Campbell? No. No. Okay. Everyone's um, in favor. Excuse me, Chair. There was already actually a, when the when it first came up, there was already a motion that Chris put in, and I second it. Well, oh, and, then, the, uh, and then and then Miss Peoples came and, yeah. and, and talked uh, and talked as well. So that motion is still on the floor, really. Oh, okay, sorry. So the I motion there was a motion to approve the report. Yes. Oh, and who who made that motion? That was Councilor, uh, Councilor Dabrowski and myself for second. Okay. I would speak. We, have, but speaker, I, I, we have speakers to that motion. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we have uh, Councilor Lococo, Vic, Mike, and Wayne. Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, firstly, I'm a huge proponent of build, uh, supplying more houses in our city, and I think this would be a great development. Secondly, in normal, normal circumstances, I would say that this property would be perfect, but I do have some major concerns regarding this. The cyanamide in the building of, of the Gale Center were very controversial because of the contamination. There were public meetings to inform the residents and document their concerns. 
This is not a planning application with a public meeting. This is a brownfield rehabilitation grant with no public meeting. And I, I like what Councillor Peter Angelo said about you have to be creative to get parcels of land cleaned up. Now that's, that's good for that particular piece. However, there's still the cyanamide other side that is still contaminated and we would have people living in it. Um, normally there's a buffer between a contaminated site and where people would live. That was the buffer. That piece of property had the YMCA, which was donated from the cyanamide. That was the recreational building. So that buffer is now going to be housing. Um, I wasn't on, on council at the time, but I've gone through um, all of the information regarding the Gale Center and I found some of the reports and here are some of my concerns. Um, through this report, I understand that there's going to be the remediation proposed to remove the contaminated soil. I also understand that the proper procedures have been followed to get to this point through the Committee of Adjustments. Some of the things that were in the April 11, 2007 report for the cyanamide is, are concerning to me regarding property right beside where people are going to be living. In those reports, it said that it was not to be used for daycare, which is the most sensitive use that you can look at. When we look at stacked townhouses, some of the stacked townhouses have people living in the basement, which is a lot closer to the contaminated ground. Um, it also states that it was never intended to be used for daycare and the Minister of Environment agreed. Um, they encouraged the reuse of the land for community facilities. There are hazardous wastes, this is all from the report, there are hazardous wastes or contaminant materials on the 15 acres being offered to the city. It is suitable for an arena complex and it kept saying arena complex. It's not for people living, it's not for residential. Operations of an arena represents no risk to human health. The Minister of Environment approved the site for arena use, which is the only proposed use. In the fall of 1996, soil tests were done and they did not identify any evidence that coal tar waste were present within the proposed arena site. The environmental and human health risk assessment committed to the MOE for acceptance and then the city would move on. So that's sort of different on this one is that they're getting the right of site condition and then going to the ministry. The way the arena worked from my understanding and maybe I'm, I'm incorrect was that the Ministry of Environment were consulted first and then the record of site condition was done. So it's reversed in this case. Um, the, the proposed arena site, the record of site conditions must be filed with the Ministry of Environment and City. If acceptable, then it will be acknowledged by the Minister of Environment. Then and only then will the city consider to the proposed site acceptable for arena complex. That's where it, it's reversed in this. The letter to the MOE to SciTech said the site is intended for future use of commercial, industrial, and community use only. This is the, the site that is going to be literally feet from this new site where the hundred stacked townhouses are. Soil and groundwater assessed for future commercial land use scenarios. No human health risk is identified. The risk management plan states that the proposed use for the study area is site for a four pad arena and associated parking. It outlines how the deep rooted vegetables, shrubs, vegetation and shrubs and trees should be planted. You can only dig down so deep on the Gale Center property in order to plant a tree or shrub because if you go down any deeper, that's where the contaminants are. And these houses are going to be right beside, even though we're trying to re remediate that piece of property, this is beside the cyanamide property. At the time, daycare facilities were being proposed. Uh, at no time were the daycare facilities being proposed. As part of the risk assessment process, um, daycare scenario is the assessment to evaluate the risk and to meet the most sensitive receptors, a young child. And it said that it was not supposed to be daycare on that property. Um, what I'm really concerned about is our residents. I would like some sort of um, 
awareness for the residents that this land is going to be remediated. There's going to be contaminated soil coming out of that property. It's going to be put into trucks. It's going to be driven down 4th Avenue or Thoroldstone Road or Stanley Avenue, whichever way they go. There's going to be dust. There's going to be contaminants. And our residents don't even know about it. This is not a public meeting for a contaminated site. This is an application for a grant. So I'm really concerned that our residents have no ability to <clears throat> find out about this or be aware about this or give us input on it. So I, I would really like us to move towards something towards that. I think it's great it's getting cleaned up, but I'm still concerned there's going to be people living right next door to the Gale Center. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill would like to answer. Bill? Thank you. Uh, well, if I had the answer, I would, but the reason I'm interrupting is uh, I just want to remind council that their procedural bylaw uh, requires a motion to go past curfew of 10 o'clock if council so wishes. Okay. I'll put and that we, motion it, forward. By Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Iannone, that we go past 10 o'clock. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, Lord. So, uh, yes, yes. Um, so, Acting Mayor, uh, is there something that we can do? Maybe we can ask um, the clerk or Mr. Hurlovich that we have an awareness campaign, public meeting that what is going on on that property so people are aware and have an opportunity to find out what's going on, be educated. I, I do understand that the zoning is where it's supposed to be. The Committee of Adjustments just changed the, um, the types of, but I'm really concerned about the contamination and I'm concerned about the, the property next door. So I'm, I'm not going to vote to accept this based on the contaminated site beside it. But if we do go through, I would like to see some some sort of awareness for our residents. Um, who would like to address Lori's question? Uh, Alex? So, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor, so to the councillor's point, <clears throat> so should the um, uh, council grant this uh, application for a remediation grant, uh, we could uh, send out literature to uh, to the property owners on the route that would be taken for the cleanup and alert them to that cleanup. At this point, um, you know, I don't actually have a um, an outline of what how they would be cleaning that up. So, you know. Yeah, and there are various levels of cleanup as Councillor Lococo has outlined. The cleanup that was necessary for the Gale Center to be, operate safely is different than the level of cleanup that would be necessary for a residential development. That would be different than a cleanup for another industrial manufacturer to be located on those sites. They're all different levels of cleanup. And do you, Alex, do you know if the ministry is involved at all in monitoring the cleanup or is that just something that's done and they come back to us after it's clean. Do you know whether the ministry monitors, monitors that? I think the, the, the report really comes from the engineer to the ministry and um, it's monitored in that way. So, they, so maybe Alex, maybe I know you, uh, you're, the staff was gonna ask about the area, um, uh, about the safety of the area from the previous motion maybe when you're having that conversation or someone's having that conversation, you could ask if the ministry or if the, yeah, the ministry of the environment uh, monitors that cleanup and maybe get back to us on that. I yes. think that would probably like to know if the ministry monitors that cleanup operation. And there probably is some procedure if there's any danger from anything leaching out of the trucks or flying out of the trucks. And the ministry, like Councillor Thompson said, Anytime I've ever had any dealings with them, um, they're very careful and they're they're all over the contractors that are doing the cleanup. So I'm assuming it's like that, but uh, I like your idea too of, of notifying the neighbors as well. So is that okay, Councillor Lococo? Will let the staff get back to us on that? Yes, and, that's fine. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Okay, so then we still have uh, uh, Vic. Are you finished? Is that? Uh, do you have any other comments, Vic? You were on the list to you talk. I. I was, but I already gave my comments, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor. I mean, I, 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 I still can't understand how anyone would be opposed to cleaning up a, tops, uh, a toxic site. 
I think it's something that we should be moving forward with. Um, I mean, any chance that we have, any chance that we have to remediate a site, we should. Uh, Can we, I call the vote? Uh, well, no, we have a couple more speakers on the motion. We have Mike. Mike, you had your hand up on the motion. Yeah, uh, I, I I agree with, um, you know, it, it is, Brownsfields have been going on in Ontario for I don't know how long, and maybe Alex Rovich can update us on this, but they clean up industrial sites, um, gas stations, uh, so many different uh, industrial places to uh, accommodate people and build houses on. It's been going on forever. And I think what you would want with this site is to clean it up, not defer this, not uh, delay this. This is something that's a very positive thing. And they have to go through so, so much phases and, and site conditions and testing. This is not an overnight thing and it's a, it's, a, it's a long process. So for something like this to get this fixed up or we don't and just leave it how it is right now, which is not safe, obviously. So let's clean it up as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay, I have Wayne, Chris and Carolyn. Wayne Thompson, did you have no, another no. comment? No, you're good. I'm okay. okay, Chris, did you yeah, have a comment? Quick, I, I mean, yeah, we we've already gone through the phase one and the oh, phase two. There's I, contaminants I, in the ground. They're they're going to remove 3,800 tons of soil. It's I, I think uh, the grants providing over two million dollars. Um, I I don't see any bad news or, or negative aspects to what's being proposed here. So yeah, I'm I'm ready to to call the vote. Okay, Carolyn. Uh, you know, I, I keep hearing, I don't know why anybody would be opposed to cleaning this up. We aren't opposed to cleaning it up. We want to make sure that the, the residents know, because once you start cleaning it up, you're going to have airborne stuff lying down that street. And we want to make sure that the surrounding area, because you're going to put families in those space in, in the lower level or the middle level or the top level. We want to make sure that families can allow their kids out to play on clean property too. So it's not that we're opposed to cleaning it up. We just want to make sure that it's done right and that the residents know what's going on. Okay. Can we call it, Lori? Thank you, Acting Mayor. I just want to make one more comment. I'm not opposed to the cleanup of where that is. The Gale Center is still not cleaned up to human standards it's only cleaned up to commercial standards and they are going to be feet away that is going to leach into that property so even though this this property um where the y the ymca was is going to get cleaned up it is still right beside a contaminated site so i just wanted to put that out there okay thank you okay, we have a motion on the floor can, uh, can i can uh, we reread uh, the motion family? please the motion is the recommendation counselor it is the recommendation uh, three recommendations. The three recommendations. Um, do you have it in front of you? Yeah, I, have, I can read them. Do you want me to read them off, Councillor Campbell? Uh, please. Or, or they're in the report. They're basically the the motion is to um, to move the three recommendations in the report. And is that council approve the Brownfield Rehab Grant for forty two sixty one Fourth Avenue, subject to the applicant meeting the program requirement, including entering into a, an agreement with the city number two that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign the rehab agreement and grant. Number three, that the rehab grant request be forwarded to the Niagara region for support under the Smarter Niagara Incentive Program. Those are the recommendations. Thank you. I'll call the question, all in favor? A anyone opposed? Councillor uh, Lococo and Carolyn opposed or for? Councillor Lococo was opposed. I, I think that's the only opposed. I think Carolyn's frozen. Yeah, I, yeah, Carolyn, you're frozen. Okay, uh, is the is the mayor back? From his <laughs> vacation. Go ahead. Uh, you got a clean slate. Going to the next unit. Okay. Next Good. item. Good job, thank you very much, Acting uh, acting Mayor, appreciate it. So we're on to um, item 8.6. We're on 8.6 now, right? Niagara Military Museum? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Niagara Military Museum, we've got uh, three recommendations here. Uh, Councillor Thompson, are you moving the recommendations? Yeah, I read this and I've talked to Jim Doherty, 
on numerous occasions, and uh, he is has to have five years lease without any um, concerns, and he can deal directly with council because if they don't have, if they're one year at a time, they won't get the trillium um, the grants that they need to keep their operation going. This is uh, for veterans. Um, yesterday was Memorial Day in the States. Uh, these are the people who uh, put up their lives for our country and they're doing a great job because we save the armory there and now they want to continue on with that. So I would make a motion that we give them a five year lease. Uh, to, to give them the opportunity to get the Trillium Awards. I'll okay, so what, okay, motion uh, by uh, Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor uh, Peter Angelo. Now I understand speaking with Ms. Moldenhauer that this is a five-year lease and that this will allow them to get their uh, Trillium uh, grant. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Moldenhauer if she could jump on please and help us uh, help clarify this. I think it was, uh, a year at a time, and uh, that doesn't help their cause, so. Okay, okay. Ms. Moldenhauer? Yes, yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Staff did check with the Ontario Trillium Foundation today, and at this point, actually, they're not even accepting any capital grant requests because they are focusing on operating due to COVID. And with the recommendation that we're proposing tonight, with the, the one-year lease agreement and the um, four renewals, it does equal a five-year lease. So this is, in fact, a five-year lease, and, and it would qualify. And with any capital projects at the armories, it also, the proposal does have to go to staff for approval, and we will also bring it to council. And when the Niagara Military Museum does apply for a Trillium grant, they also have to prove that there's matching funds. So that's why the approval from staff and council is also needed. So with this report that we're bringing forward tonight, we did remove the condition of having the Niagara Military Museum to pay for the utilities. They did say that it would cause hardship. So what we negotiated was the, the minor changes to the um, lease term, but also we added conditions to help them just to adhere to Ontario ministry standards for, for um, community museums. So the conditions include updating their, their business plan to look at additional revenue sources, which will help them down the road and also looking at developing collection standards, conservation standards, governor and finance, and education and research. And with these standards, city staff from our Niagara Falls History Museum will, will, will work closely with them to develop the standards, and it will help them to become a well-respected military museum in Ontario. Okay, thank you uh, for that. So maybe we stick around, Ms. Moldenhauer, so if we have some more questions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, did you want to speak to this at all, or did you have any questions? No? I'm fine Councilor. seconding the motion. Well, okay. well if uh, um, I wanted to uh, confirm that you have talked to Mr. Doherty and he is okay with what you're suggesting, we did have a meeting via uh, Teams with Mr. Doherty, and he was fine with the um, terms of the lease. And we also shared with them the um, memorandum of understanding that is attached to the agreement. Now, that has not been signed off yet, so I can't guarantee that he's fine with that. We're still working on the MOU, but with the terms of the lease, he's fine. And in but this you're, lease, Kevin is holding her in this. You're, just, you're okay with uh, you check with the uh, um, people who 
the Trillium grant and they're okay with this? Yes, because it is in, fi in fact like a five-year agreement. We've just broken it down with conditions. Okay, well, we made the motion anyway, so that's fine. So, uh, well, two questions. So, Councillor Thompson, are we? Are you moving the recommendation that's in the report, the staff report? Because um, that is, it is a five-year. It's just broken mm -hmm. into five one years. Yeah, but uh, I, he was after me last night, calling me. And I said, get on the line for the council and you can speak to it. But uh, anyway, um, I'll let the motion go through. And uh, if there's any concern, bring it back to us to make sure yes. they have the opportunity to get their trillion grant. Okay. So, Mr. Yes, Oldenhart, of course. what are your. Okay. Your it will, so this is different though. We're not, this is not a motion moving the five equal parts. This is a, Councilor Thompson's put a different motion. So I need to make sure that you understand. But they can, they can still have the d discussion and the talking annually. That's not a problem, but uh, I just want to make sure they get the trillion grant. That's all. Okay. Uh, Okay, so is Mr. Doherty available? Uh, he's available. Okay, Mr. Can can Mr. Doherty? Can you hear us? I understand you're available. You're on the line. Yes, I can. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So we hear you too. Can we get you to weigh in on this? Because a little bit of confusion here. Um, are you yeah. not supportive of the the staff report? Are you suggesting something otherwise? Well, we we really wanted to be clear and unequivocal when we're talking to Trillium that it's a five year term. So it, it comes out when we put our applications in, when we go on their site, it says five years. It's not five years renewed annually, it's five years. So that there's no question when we put in for grants, that's what we're looking at. And really all we're redoing is renewing the old lease, which ran for a five year term. Okay. I'll let my motion go through with That's the five year and the discussions and the cooperation yeah. between the city and the uh, military museum is going to be fine no problem okay i've got and i'll still Iannone. second that your worship councillor iannone and councillor campbell um mr mayor i will talk after this has passed. I was wanted to speak on the last application because I got kicked out. So I'll just, I'll raise it after. Okay. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Can you hear me, Jim? Yes. Yep. Uh, I just lost my uh, meeting on my iPad and now I just switched to my iPhone. Um, I, I, I'm not prepared to say anything. I, I, I'm happy it works out for them and uh, I'm going to support the motion. Okay. Is there any other discussion or comments? Okay. We'll call the vote. All those in favor. Okay. And that's approved. Okay. Thank you. May I speak okay, we're now? Oh yeah. You wanted to speak to the. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I got kicked out of the, I, just as <laughs> Councillor Carrier was speaking, I totally got kicked out of the meeting. Um, so I, I'm in favor of the recommendations that were passed. Five years. Is somebody coughing, you guys? No, somebody was still speaking. Yeah, uh, yeah Mr. Doherty, I think you're still. Uh, I think you're still online. You got him. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I am in favor of the uh, the recommendations. Um, but did Councillor Cario, when he was acting as mayor, did you call the vote on um, my motion seconded by Mike to have the surrounding land investigated? Because you did call them both. Okay, thank you. And I didn't get to vote on that one either. So I was in you're favor of- Vince, you're muted. You're muted, Vince. We put you down as a yes, because I assumed you said yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on to communications. Um, first item, City of Niagara Falls Integrity Commissioner Annual Report. Uh, receive and file, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Cario to receive and file. Second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Resolution by the Town of Pelham 
recommendation is council endorse and support the resolution, uh, which is in regard to accessibility for seniors. So Councillor, uh, okay, I'm sorry, Councillor Thompson moved. Yeah, so moved. Second, yeah. Sure. second, by, no. second by Councillor. Do it. Okay, uh, second by Councillor uh, Cario. I can't see Council. I just see Councillor Campbell's finger every time he uh, touches the screen. Okay, all right, seconded by Councillor Campbell, our, our senior representative. All those in favor? <laughs> okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, item 9.3, Township of Terrace Bay. Uh, this is a recommendation that Council support the resolution and it's support for advocacy for reform of, uh, of the Ministry of Consumer Government Consumer Services. Help me out, Mr. Clerk. I can't remember now. Yeah, so your worship, this is uh, the council support the resolution of the township of Terrence Bay. Uh, this is advocacy, advocacy for reform of what we short short term call, uh, short form call MFIPA. This is the Municipal Freedom of Information and Privacy Protection Act. So uh, in layman's terms, this is the freedom of information or the FOI requests that come into various municipalities. Uh, basically, they're resolution there is they're stating that the the legislation be reviewed and updated they've got concerns with not only the abundance of applications and the staff time that it takes but also just the fact that that legislation is uh, grossly outdated at about 30 years since it's last been been updated so uh, this is something that uh, we experience in the clerk's office as well and throughout the municipality uh, so my suggestion is to recommend that council support that resolution move so okay. move Okay, okay Councillor Kerry moves okay. it. Councillor Thompson seconds it. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, 9.4 City of Kingston post secondary education resolution. Uh, recommendation, recommendation is that we receive and file. So moved to receive and file. Moved by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor uh, uh, Dabrowski. Sorry, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.5, note of appreciation from Niagara Children's Receive Water Style. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange that we receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. 9.6, Niagara Falls International Marathon is being postponed. Motion to receive. Receive, receive for information. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson that we receive. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Item 9.7, proclamation request, National Accessibility Awareness Week, May 30th to June the 5th. Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you for that. <clears throat> Item 9.8, uh, Home Depot is requesting a tourist exemption. Oh, no. yeah. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Proclamation request, longest day of smiles. Move the recommendation, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, that council approve and proclaim longest day of smiles initiative to help raise awareness to help children with cleft lip and cleft palate on Sunday, June yes. 20th. All those in favor? Yeah. That's unanimous, thank you. Very I'll well. move the recommendation for Paris Board as well, Your Worship. Okay, item 9.10, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that City Council proclaim Monday, June 7th as a Million Minutes Activity Challenge. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, ratification of in camera, Mr. Clark. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, way back, long ago, earlier this afternoon, Council met in camera, and there was direction to staff to proceed with a proposed plan with respect to the marketing of the Chippewa Town Hall. Uh, uh, that's at uh, Cummington Square. Also, that the city agrees to the purchase of part township lot 209 Stamford, designated as parts 4, 5, and 6 of reference plan 59R 16783 for the sum of $47,949 plus HST. And lastly, that there be direction to staff, uh, direction to staff be given to report back on the city's code of conduct on 
options to include or not include uh, criteria related to the gift registry, uh, also to whistleblower protection, to uh, place of residence for applicants, also for fees for filing complaints, indemnification, and possible time limit requirements for filing complaints. That's okay. all. Looking for a motion. Move the recommendations, Move. Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're under um, notices of motion. So we have a resolution. Is that from uh, for Councillor Campbell? Yes, Councillor Campbell. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, um, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Stephen Seuss for moving this forward to the uh, federal government. And uh, I do believe that I would like to add, and unfortunately I was using my phone as my information background and my iPad for the meeting. So there was at the end of the uh, Pelham resolution, uh, uh, part of the resolution was to send specifically this information back to all the region, uh, all the communities in the Niagara region, as well as certain individuals in the federal and provincial government. If uh, I could add that, I'd appreciate it very much. Okay, Mr. Clerk, do you have that uh, added in? Uh, yes, okay, great. I'll second um, that. Okay, so it's moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Lacoco. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, and it goes along with uh, the town of Pelham and the city of Thorold uh, resolutions. So that's great. Well done, Councillor Campbell. And I do believe the uh, city of St. Catharines last night, it was a unanimous vote to support it. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. They couldn't call it a, an emergency at the region, so you guys come back at it. That's, <laughs> right. that's good. That's good. Okay, Mr. Councillor Peter Angelo, we're at the bylaws. Any updates to them? No. Usually you ask the clerk if there's any changes to the Mr. number. Mr. Clerk, are there any updates to the bylaws? No updates, Your Worship. First, second, Thank and third, you, Your Mr. Clerk. Motion by <laughs> Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson that the bylaws be given a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? Unanimous. Good work. Okay, we're on to new business. Councillor Iannone and then Strange. Animal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got I have two items. One is I I've got a complaint from residents on Atlantic oh, no. Avenue. Somebody else is talking. Yeah, uh, Councillor Campbell, you should. There we go. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, from residents on Atlantis Avenue in regards to the property sixty seven ten Atlantis. It's an empty lot. The house was torn down, but the grass is five feet high now, and there are people living in the grass. Um, the adjacent neighbor is a senior. She is very worried. Um, they so they've contacted the city a couple times. They've got no response about having the grass cut. So I'd like to make a motion that our staff take a look at 6710 Atlantis in regards to either enforcing grass cutting or us doing it and charging them. Okay, motion by Councillor Iononi, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Yeah, that's a job Thank for you. a bylaw. Or by law for tomorrow. Yep. And the other item is um, I, I I'm trying to remember. I think at the last meeting we talked about there was a report or something about um, traffic being investigated in the Angie um, Forest View Gardner Road area. I, I I think we passed something that talked about a traffic report, but nevertheless, um, I have a complaint from a number of the residents over there that they said speed at the corner of Angie and Ernest is horrible. And they're looking for a stop sign. And they contacted me the day, a couple days after those two children were um, sadly killed in Vaughn by the young man speeding through the, the neighborhood and said that almost happened there. And it was very lucky that the kids in the, in the, driveway did not get injured and they would really like council to look at putting a stop sign at the corner of Angie and Ernest. And they said, if they need a petition, 
They will also bring a petition of all the neighborhood to council should we need it. But I'd like staff, um, I'd like to make a motion that staff investigate putting a stop sign at the corner of Angie and Ernest. Sure. Did you want to add in as well as any traffic calming measures? Um, some just I'll throw this out there. I always said yes, my speed kids, bumps, speed pumps, yes, whatever. Because I yes. always said to my kids, stop signs don't stop cars. And unfortunately, no, and, you know, it's 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 yeah. a false sense of security. Uh, but speed humps actually force them to slow down. So sometimes it's a combination of things. So um, if you, um, I just just a suggestion. No, and Mr. Mayor, the, the the a bunch of the neighbors, I think about twelve or fifteen neighbors, invited me to a Zoom meeting with them, and I did explain that the common consensus of our city staff is that stop signs do not stop speed. Um, the parents are actually moving their their chairs into the street so that the kids can play safely on the driveway and the sidewalks to slow down the speeders. And that's not a solution either. But given COVID and the lockdown and them not in school, they said anytime they're outside is is something that they need and that it's not safe in that neighborhood. So if we could take a look at those measures also, that would be great. Okay, so motion by Councillor Inoni, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, Thank and that's you. unanimous. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor um, Strange and then the Coco. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just want uh, to say sorry. a big thank you out to um, uh, Dale Morton and Kathy Moldenhauer. Um, a couple of meetings ago, talked about putting up uh, tick signs and awareness and education at the parks. And um, that night, Dale Morton, after the council meeting, sent me a, a sign and, and uh, the turnaround was unbelievable. So they're coming up with, oh, here it is right here. <laughs> so we got 200 signs going up uh, this week, which is which is amazing going into some of our parks and trails. And um, so I think it's so important. And um, I believe Kathy Molnar even talked to someone from the region and said, you know, we are one of the only municipalities probably in the Niagara, Niagara region that have this. And, and some people might not think it's important because, you know, it's a waste of money and that. But you know what? I know people who have, um, who have Lyme disease and it's not a pretty illness. Um, we know a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Janet Ferrante, who went through it, um, had to have two fundraisers to raise money over $60,000 to go to Germany to uh to go through treatments and which is not offered here in in canada which i think is ridiculous where you get bit by ticks um right here in in niagara especially on the bruce trail and some of our parks so i just want to thank staff for coming out so fast and turn around and and you know what if we save one child or an adult or you know taking ticks off dogs or pets bring them home and saving you know one person from getting lyme it's really worth purchasing these 200 signs. So I want to thank um, um, Dale and Kathy and all senior staff and the parks and the city committee and, and Councillor uh, Peter Angelo as well. And I don't know if Kathy, if you can chime in. Um, I know you were talking, I think it was someone from the region and just talking about how awesome it was that we were taking this initiative. Kathy, did you? Uh, yes, you yeah, were... I'm here. Hi, everybody. And it was actually the um, Conservation Authority I was on a regional meeting and they were asking municipalities if anybody had any signage regarding ticks and we were the only community developing it. So I did share our signs with the um, other municipalities for their information and hopefully they'll also be posting some in the future. Thanks, Kathy. And you can see you have the little QR uh, code at the bottom so that goes hmm. directly to the website and takes pictures and, and, and uh, recognizes what type of ticks um, if you were bitten, that bullet red mark to actually go and uh, go to the emergency and, and get the antibiotic. And uh, I think it's just a great initiative from uh, from our city to doing this. So thank you so much. No, it, it's important, uh, Councillor um, Strange. And I know with my dog, too, uh, we've picked him up at the park. And I, I remember one day pulling something like 16 or 17 off of him and all under his ears and under his neck in the crotch. And that's why I started using Brevec Brevecta. It's the best thing ever. You give them two pills every three months and it instantly kills the ticks and the fleas because the problem is uh, when the dog comes in the house, the ticks jump off the dog and they jump onto you. 
and uh, it's not deadly for a dog, but it's deadly for people. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I tell people now's the time you should have your dogs on that now because it works better than all the other stuff. Oil, all these other things don't work. The Brevecta actually works. It's the best. Uh, it's not cheap, but it works. So, uh, and it's quicker than trying to check a big fuzzy dog or a dark dog looking for all the black ticks. Not easy to find. So um, anyway, thank you for that. Um, we've got Councillor Lococo, then Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the beginning of the pandemic, the provincial um, provincial government passed legislation that we could meet electronically for our council meetings. And at that time, I requested to have more information to come back. We were looking at in-camera meetings. There's some um, councils that are meeting in camera online. And I don't think we've ever got that information back. That was March 20th of 2020. If we could look into that, please. Mr. Clerk, did you want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, I can certainly look back at that. Uh, but I do know that council, uh, when they passed the motion to meet electronically, it was specifically stated in the motion that it would only be for open meetings and not for closed meetings. So yes, the uh, legislation does allow for virtual meetings in camera, uh, but that is what they refer to as enabling legislation. In other words, it's up to council's discretion. It doesn't just uh, automatically be imposed. Through the mayor, yeah, yes, that is correct. That is what we passed, but at the same time, we, we um, the report was supposed to bring back more information about in-camera meetings for us to discuss it not to automatically pass it, but bring more information. Okay, all right, we've got that. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Direction to staff. Thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you. Um, I have uh, heard you uh, uh, trying to do some work with the art at the uh, Still the Place Hub that we're building and you're going to have some art that you're talking to people about there to put in that area where yes. there's going to be tourists, there's going to be uh, locals and people going there. And I've been working with a guy for a couple of years um, out at the Niagara Art out on Oakwood uh, Road out near the Queenie, and I've been out there many times for years uh, with the original owners, and they have a Carolic um, art um, um, just uh, all over the place, and these are world famous um, Carolic art. Um, uh, out there. And I would think if even if we could get a small section of that to go in that uh, uh, development uh, behind the museum up there, I think this would be a real draw for people. The, people don't go out there and they don't realize the importance of some of that art out there from Curlock. So I would just refer to the staff, staff and see if they could uh, come up with some opportunities to uh, see if that would work. Uh, so I'll, I'll second that, Your Worship. Um, I mean, I've been out, I've seen the Curlock collection as well. Uh, it is yeah. quite extensive, uh, as Councillor Thompson has mentioned. Um, it would be nice to even have some rotating pieces go into the new, uh, go into the new building. So you could have a display and then, you know, every few months kind of change it out for other pieces because, uh, as I mentioned, it is quite an extensive collection, but uh, it's a good call, Councillor Thompson. So I'm happy yeah. to second the motion to refer it over to staff. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that staff um, meet with the Curlick uh, people to see about the idea of rotating some of the art in the new uh, culture center and farmer's market. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? 
Okay, that's unanimous. Any other new business? Motion for adjournment. Councillor Thompson, right. Councillor Strange, all those in favor? All right, that one's unanimous for sure. All right, everybody, we'll see you at the next meeting. Have a good night. Thank you.